Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, great to have you with us for um, this pharma symposium uh, from Novo Nordisk entitled GLP-1 Receptor Agonist and Treatment Paradigm for Type 2 Diabetes. I'm uh, Dr. Osama Al-Alami. I'm the Regional Medical Advisor for Novo Nordisk in uh, Qatar. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome our uh, speakers for a speaker for this pharma symposium, Professor Rayaz Malik, who's a professor of medicine at Wale Cornell Medicine in uh, Qatar. He's also a senior consultant physician at Hamad Medical Corporation. Uh, professor uh, Malik graduated from the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, where then he went on to continue to do his PhD at the University of Manchester in England and was elected to become a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians in 2007. His research interests extend into the pathogenesis assessment and treatment of diabetic neuropathy and neurodegenerative diseases, included MS, dementia. And with that, I'd like to um, welcome onto the virtual stage, Professor Raz Malik. Professor Malik, welcome and great to have you with us. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Um, Osama. So uh, I'd like to thank Novo as well for asking me to uh, present a really, I guess, new data on GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, what I call a truly new era for type 2 diabetes management. So um, start the next. Okay. So my disclosures are that this, I have received honoraria for lectures from Nova Nordics, Pfizer and Sanofi, and we'll get started. So first and foremost, um, even to this date, we have a problem. And that problem is that if you have diabetes, and this is a large analysis, shows very clearly that you're you have an increased risk of coronary heart disease, coronary death, non-fatal myocardial infarction and stroke and other vascular deaths. So two to 2.27 fold increased risk. Next. And even in 2015, life expectancy in patients with diabetes is markedly reduced. So compared to people without diabetes, those with diabetes have on average six years less life and people who've had diabetes and a myocardial infarction, you can see next, they have a reduction in life of 12 years. So we have to ask the question, what is it that we're doing right? And what is it that we're doing wrong in terms of these major differences in outcomes between people with and without diabetes? Next. And what I want to put up is a quote actually from Albert Einstein, because I think he encapsulates exactly what I think is going on. And that is insanity, which is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. What is that same thing? Well, it's actually, you know, that attitude of, well, I've always used metformin, I've always used sulfonylureas and I'll continue to use them because they lower glucose. But we forget the bigger picture, which is, we're not just here to lower glucose, but we're here to try to save lives. And that's, I think, where GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors, the new GLP-1 GIP agonists are gonna make a real difference. Next. Why are they gonna make a difference? Well, it simply is because if we just focus on glucose control, and we forget about the problems associated with improving blood glucose with the old medications, such as weight gain, such as hypos, and actually increased cardiovascular risk, then we really are not treating the patient. We are treating numbers. Next. And somehow we have to change that balance. So many years ago, actually, when I was in Manchester, um, so Jacob Jabronowski actually said, ask an impertinent question and you are on the way to the pertinent answer. And I asked actually, probably was Andrew Bolton, I, 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 but it might've been Mike Davis. And I said, 
what if you could lower glucose with less hypos and weight loss? And the simple answer I got was, don't be stupid. It simply can't happen. And that was okay in 2003. But I think if you look in history, those excuses now are no longer. Because if you look, there was insulin, then next. Of course, we had biogranides and sulfonylureas. And then we had nothing. But now, next, what we have is a profusion of new therapies, which include, of course, it started really with the GLP-1 receptor agonists back in 2003, when we had the short acting ones, SGLT2 inhibitors. And now what you have is the long acting GLP-1 agonists. And of course, the GLP-1 GIP agonists. And these Newer therapies, I think, make a big difference. Why do they make a difference? Well, because they address not only the glucose, but also a major, major uh, abnormality in patients with type 2 diabetes. And of course, Jocelyn said, from an excess of fat, diabetes begins, and from an excess of fat, diabetic patients die. So if we have therapies going forward that are going to address not only the glucose, oh, but also know. the f overweight individuals, I think we can make a difference. Next. And we can make a difference, not in the way that the trials like UKPDS did. So if you look, you have to have some context. If you look, UKPDS rightly claims that if we lower glucose, we can have an impact on outcomes, diabetes related endpoints, microvascular endpoints, diabetes related deaths. But you, the context you have to provide is this. How long did it take for this outcome to be reached? Well, on average, around 12 years. So really, we have to do something. We have to treat our patients with something that is going to have a more rapid impact. Next. And so you see here different time points. So what do we have? We have the GLP-1 receptor agonists. And, you know, of course, We've all read about what GLP-1 receptor agonists can do, but I think the key, key thing, it really is that they, yes, they work to lower glucose through not just promoting insulin, but having an effect on glucagon, but they also have an effect in the liver, but also the brain and GI tract. And it's the weight loss, I think, that is really key in terms of the beneficial outcomes that we're going to see in people uh, with diabetes. So what are these outcomes? Well, unlike previous studies where we had no benefits, we now have a large body of data from the likes of Elixir, particularly LIDA, which was where the game changer, I think, in terms of the study that showed us that GLP-1 agonists really have a benefit. So if you look at, on the left panel, the three component MACE, you now see, begin to see that there is a benefit in terms of cardiovascular outcomes of about 12% in people who are treated with these newer therapies as opposed to conventional therapy. And similarly, all-cause mortality. Actually, again, there's a 12% benefit, but one particularly striking thing was actually Pioneer 6, and we can come back to that because Pioneer 6, of course, is, is oral semaglutide. You can see a hugely reduced all-cause mortality. Hospital admissions for heart failure as well benefit and also not only cardiovascular benefits but renal benefits so again with GLP-1 agonists you're getting a 16 to 13 percent benefit in terms of renal outcomes not as impressive as the SGLT2 inhibitors but nevertheless there so next and again to give you that context that's the key thing here we're not going to wait 12 years to see a benefit with these GLP-1 agonists what you see here are benefits in leader, sustain, harmony, and rewind within six to 12 months. Next. So you see, within six to 12 months, you're starting to see this. So what is it that's new that goes beyond what we already have? Well, what we have now is a new, well, it's not so new actually, semaglutide, of course, injected once a week subcutaneously. Um, you can see this is uh, an engineered 
GLP-1 agonist, which has an amino acid substitution, has a spacer, um, but also has this change amino acid substitution uh, at position 34. Now, what does this do? Well, it essentially represents a molecule which has 94% homology to human GLP-1, but has a half-life of approximately one week. And arguably it is the most powerful GLP-1 agonist to date. So next. And there is a massive uh, clinical trial program that underpins the benefits of semaglutide. And these are um, phase 3A, 3B studies. And I'll go through actually really what effect it has in terms of HbA1c and weight. So next. In terms of efficacy, change in HbA1c from baseline, multiple uh, different trials, but what you have essentially is a reduction of about 1.5% with semaglutide. Compare that to citagliptin, you can see in the first panel here, you can see 0.5% with citagliptin, much more with um, uh, semaglutide. Canagliflozin, better. Exenatide, better. Dulaglutide, better. Liraglutide, better. Um, so, and even if you compare against insulin, actually it's better. If you focus on the GLP-1 agonists alone, what you see again is clearly semaglutide is superior compared to exenatide, dulaglutide, and liraglutide. So that's for HbA1c reduction. Weight, again, consistently, clearly there is a weight loss of anything approximately five kilograms with uh, semaglutide one milligram. And you can compare that to uh, obviously placebo, but particularly to other therapies like citagliptin, canagliflozin, and if you focus on the uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, next, what you see, no back, what you see is again, benefit which is much greater with semaglutide once weekly compared to exenatide, dulaglutide and liraglutide. Next. And so can you translate this into cardiovascular outcomes? Well, we have a trial, which was a large uh, trial comparing semaglutide 0.5 milligrams and one milligram uh, against placebo. Or pl when we say placebo, actually, it's not really placebo because this is against other active therapy. And this was in people who had established cardiovascular disease um, or uh, CHF or CKD stage three. So next, what did it show? Well, in terms of the primary composite MACE outcomes, which is the traditional endpoint that is used by the FDA, what you actually see is uh, really quite amazing in that there was non-inferiority, highly significant, but there was superiority for semaglutide for MACE outcomes. Um, Non-fatal MI, again, was better, but didn't reach significance. CV death, again, better, but, but actually did not reach significance, but non-fatal stroke. So the three point MACE and non-fatal stroke was significantly better um, in those on semaglutide compared to uh, standard therapy. Next. In terms of safety, I think it's important to understand that our patients will get side effects. And for me, honestly, if they get diarrhea or nausea, I try to reassure them because the clinical trial data and the reality is that it will get better. So most of the side effects tend to be mild. You can see the great proportion, you know, 90% almost are mild. Very few are severe enough to stop therapy uh, in the semaglutide arm. And they get better after 10 to 12 weeks, maximum, okay? And the proportion of subjects who report GI adverse events, you can see again, again, comparing across the trials, whether it's comparing to citagliptin or to the other GLP-1 agonists, you can see actually quite comparable. So for exenatide, for example, you can see 42%, 33%, and again, around 44% across the trials, but compared to the other GLP-1 agonists, very comparable in terms of uh, subjects who report GI adverse events. Next. So we now have 
a new era, which is oral semaglutide. What is oral semaglutide? Well, it's a GLP-1 agonist as a pill. Um, and the clever thing about this is that the original molecule hasn't been changed, but it's been combined, co-formulated with something called SNAP, which is sodium n 2 hydroxybenzoyl amino caprolate. In short, what is SNAP? Well, it causes a local increase of pH, um, which is, makes it more alkaline in terms of the stomach. And so therefore it actually has a higher solubility and protects the GLP-1 molecule from proteolytic degradation. So you can take it as a tablet. Um, and what do we find? Well, Pioneer actually um, has efficacy data in terms of HbA1c and weight, but he also Pioneer 6, I showed you the data, is published, has cardiovascular safety as well. So Pioneer 1 to 5 and 78, which is oral semaglutide. What does oral semaglutide come in? Well, is a three milligram tablet, seven milligram tablet, and 14 milligram tablet. And what you see is progressively increasing reduction in HbA1c with increasing dose. It is better, significantly better than empagliflozin in 25 milligrams. And again, significantly better for both the seven and the 14 milligram dose compared to citagliptin in 100 milligrams. And in fact, surprisingly, it is actually comparable, if not significantly better than liraglutide 1.8 milligrams. Um, and again, compared to, uh, this is a fl flexible kind of dose titration, you can see 1.3 reduction compared to 0.8. And in combination with insulin, you can see again, there's a reduction. So that's the HbA1c, so clearly, oral semaglutide works. And what about body weight? Well, the body weight is not as impressive as the subcutaneous um, once weekly injection, but there is nevertheless significant body weight loss in the, particularly the 14 milligram semaglutide dose. So you're getting on average 3.7 kilograms weight loss, clearly better than placebo, comparable to empagliflozin, better than citagliptin, better than liraglutide 1.8 milligrams. And again, if you look across the trial program, you can see in with insulin, it, it, there is this loss of weight. So next, in terms of safety, there are clearly again side effects because you are putting a GLP-1 agonist into the system. But again, what you see is actually, you might say, well, there's not much of a dose dependent effect, but you can see clearly the highest dose has the highest number of side effects. But um, clearly, empagliflozin, you wouldn't expect GI side effects. So therefore, that is much lower compared to the semaglutide. But citagliptin, pretty comparable in the lower doses, actually, compared to um, citagliptin 100 milligrams, 3 and 7 milligrams, pretty comparable. And only 14 milligram goes slightly higher. Uh, liraglutide, 1.8 milligrams. Semaglutide, 14 milligrams is higher. So all in all, yes, you will get side effects, GI side effects, but pretty comparable, particularly to uh, the liraglutide and citagliptin. So next. So in summary, semaglutide was associated with consistent reductions in HbA1c and body weight. I didn't share with you the data, but there obviously there are glycemic targets where you have patients who get less than 7% and particularly less than 6.5% with weight loss of greater than 5% and 10%. Again, semaglutide was superior. Semaglutide once weekly, subcutaneous, significantly reduces MACE in patients with type 2 diabetes and high cardiovascular risk. Um, oral semaglutide, which is due to be launched very soon in this region, demonstrated significantly greater HbA1c and weight reductions compared to citagliptin and liraglutide, and significantly greater HbA1c reduction compared to empagliflozin. In terms of side effects, these are definitely there, but my takeaway message is that really, if the patient can tolerate um, this GI side effects in the first two to four weeks, then they really can get over that, and you will then start to see the benefit of oral semaglutide. 
And you can see the overall incidence of adverse events and serious adverse events actually for oral somatotide is comparable to <coughs> empagliflozin, citagliflozin and liraglutide. Next, thank you. Professor Malik, uh, thank you very much for this um, very elaborate talk and um, amazing highlight of the science and the data behind the data behind GLP ones. Uh, clearly, an interesting class of um, of drugs there. Uh, I think we might have uh, I think we might have time maybe for uh, just a couple of questions, if that's okay with you. Sure. Wonderful. So one of the one of the questions, of course, that came came out to us was, or through the questions, is um, what kind of um, renal license would you expect with something like semaglutide, for example, to prescribe it to patients up to what EGFR? So the standard, of course, is sixty, um, but that you know you have to look at the whichever country it is and whatever the approvals are for but it's the standard um i think it goes as low as 30 um egfr but there are data I was, yeah i think it's down to if i'm not mistaken i, I need to check my cmpc i think it's down to an egfr of 15 one five if i'm not okay. mistaken for for, for for the subcut semaphore for ozempic at least um and then you know they're asking about another question that came uh, through the questions and answers was about switching patients. So um, if you had a patient who was, say, on a GLP-1, a, a weekly GLP-1, for example, how would you um, switch them practice-wise? Well, first, like first of all, I ask the question, why would I want to switch them? If they're, all, yeah. if they're already on, uh, say, for example, semaglutide, um, mm -hmm. why would I want to switch them if it's working and it's working well uh, to oral yeah. semaglutide? Um, if they're on, say, for example, dulaglutide and you're not happy with the weight response or the HbA1c response, of course, you can then switch them to, you know, semaglutide, um, which is has superior data, you know, or if you're already on a GLP-1 agonist, and I've shown that, you know, if, whether it's exenatide, dulaglutide, um, or even liraglutide, um, right. clearly it, it is more beneficial. And, you know, it's a once a weekly. Ooh, I mean... To move away from the efficacy and the weight side of things, and I think this is one of our last questions here. There's a, there's a question about you, you highlighted some of the baseline characteristics for the sustained six trial for the uh, cardiovascular for subcutaneous semaglutide ozempic. And in there, I think you clearly mentioned that most of the patients were ones with established CVD. Uh, and there's one of the questions saying, okay, so. Is the reduction in mace, which we saw, the 26% that you clearly highlighted, is that specific to a certain population or does it spread across the various risk um, factors for, for populations who are included in that trial, i.e. the ones with established and the ones with risk factors? I think you can only speak to the data. And the data says that if you take a cohort of people who are, and 85% of them actually had established cardiovascular disease, and you give them semaglutide, subcutaneously, or if you do, you know, you take uh, Pioneer 6, which was oral semaglutide, again, high risk, you will get a benefit. You can't then open that up to, you know, people who aren't at risk, and I can't endorse that. Just checking my questions just to see if there's any more. I, th I think, yeah, I mean, I think that's it. You know, you're absolutely right. I mean, regarding this da the data, yeah, you, you, you speak with the data itself. Um, you know, there are a there's a few postdoc analyses that have showed a, a benefit for a mace and for the different parts of the mace being, you know, um, I mean, uh, let's you can say it any way, way you want. But, you know, to me, the impressive, impressive data kind of outcomes are the short term uh, rapid effect that you see. Um, mm -hmm. Particularly even with the oral, you know, I mean, Pioneer 6, it was like amazing. It's like uh, 
you know, 15 month trial. And of course, mm -hmm. it was done initially for just uh, safety, but you're mm -hmm. seeing some, some benefits. So, true, you know, true. Unlike the UK PDS that took us like 12 years to get a benefit. <laughs> that is true. That is, that, yeah, very well said. And I guess with that, and for the sake of time, I uh, just wanted to um, say a huge thank you, Professor Malik, for this very interesting, uh, very elaborate. Uh, you know, talk about the data and the molecule itself and um, enjoy the rest of the Congress. Thank you very much for all the attendees as well. Thank you. Good afternoon, dear colleagues and friends. I am Nisreen Al Sayed, President of Gulf Association of Endocrinology and Diabetes. On behalf of our Board of Directors, it is my proud privilege to welcome you all to the Gulf Association of Endocrinology and Diabetes Annual Congress. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic situation, and hopefully which is almost over, we had to be virtual this year. The Congress this year is a special one, as it is the first Congress for the Gulf Association of Endocrinology and Diabetes, also known as GATE since its inception in 2020. GATE is a non-for-profit organization which was established in 2020 and constituted by a group of physicians in the field of endocrinology and diabetes who are practicing in the GCC countries and are interested in building a medical society that deals with all aspects of the speciality of endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism. With great enthusiasm and passion for knowledge and education, GAID welcomes you to join this community that represents you. You can now join and enjoy our membership benefits. For more information, you can visit our website, gate.info. It is my immense pleasure to state that this will be a world-class Congress aiming at covering the subjects of emerging trends and recent advancements in the field of endocrinology and diabetes through a top selection from the regional and international key expert, experts from around the world. The Congress is designed to provide a rich blend of plenary sessions, specialized parallel sessions, as well as state-of-the-art lectures. We will be having three parallel tracks on the first two days of the Congress, a track for diabetes and metabolism, another for thyroid, and we are excited this year to have a third track for pediatric and adolescent endocrinology, for which we are grateful for our pediatric endocrinologist colleagues for sharing their expertise. On the third day, we will be having a parallel track for lipids, bone health, and women's health, in addition to our gate medal and plenary lectures. Please note that CME will be awarded by the Dubai Health Authority within two to three weeks and will be shared to your registered emails. I would like to thank the researchers who submitted their work to be presented during the GATE Congress. Please make sure to attend their amazing abstract presentations on the final day and pay a visit to the abstract exhibition hall. Don't forget to attend the closing remarks on the final day, which will be preceded by announcement of the winners of our prestigious Ibn Sina Distinguished Service Award, as well as research abstract winners. I would also like to thank the top pharmaceutical companies participating in the Congress that are sharing their updates in the exhibition area for which you can take a tour through our virtual pharma exhibition hall. To put a conference of this magnitude together is not a small task. To that end, I want to thank the scientific committee led by Dr. Nasser al johani 
And a special thanks to Dr. Asma Deep, our dear colleague, pediatric endocrinologist, who shared with the scientific committee their efforts and dedications and meticulous work as well as the abstract committee led by Dr. Khalid al-Dahmani, and a special thanks to Amber, our event organizer, for their endless efforts. Lastly, I would like to thank all the Congress participants, our eminent speakers and chairs, for their contributions, which are the foundation of this conference. We are anticipating your participation and interaction to join us in all sessions as we work together to improve our understanding of endocrine disorders and to enhance the care of patients with endocrine disorders and diabetes. To that end, I would like to welcome you all and wish you an enjoyable and fruitful Congress. God bless you all. And now we're going to move to our next session. Thank you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the keynote address uh, talk. Um, and many thanks to the president of GATE, the Gulf Association of Endocrinology and Diabetes, Dr. Nasrina Sayed. Many thanks to the scientific committee and the board of director of the GATE. And, uh, I'm sure over the coming three days, uh, you're going to enjoy a rich uh, scientific uh, learning and uh, welcome to the first talk. Our speaker uh, today is Professor Jay Schuyler. He is a professor of medicine, uh, pediatric and psychology at the University of Miami. Uh, professor Schuyler is currently the professor of medicine, pediatric and psychology in the Division of Endocrinology and Diabetes and Metabolism, Department of Medicine, University of Miami, Miller School of Medicine in Florida. He served as a director of that division from the year 2000 to the year 2004. He is the deputy director of the clinical research and academic programs at the Diabetes Research Institute, University of Miami. He is also adjunct professor of pediatrics at Barbara Davis Center, Childhood Diabetes, University of Colorado at Denver. For 22 years, from the year 1993 to the year 2015, he was a study chairman for the NIH Diabetes Prevention Trial for Taiwan Diabetes, and his successor of the Taiwan Trial Net, an international network uh, conducting clinical trials to interdict type 1 diabetes. Professor Schuyler is currently the chair of the strategy advisory group, uh, a European consortium of academic and industry group developing innovative approaches towards understanding and arresting type 1 diabetes. Professor Schuyler, he was the president of the American Diabetes Association and the former vice president of the International Diabetes Federation. He was the founding editor in chief for the Diabetes Care Journal, the clinical research journal of the American Diabetes Association. Welcome Professor Schuyler and the talk today going to focus on the update on the, on the cardiovascular outcome trials for type two diabetes. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, what I'm going to do is give an update on the recent outcome trials for, for type 2 diabetes. And we'll start with showing you my disclosures. And there are a lot of them. The first uh, group of, of drugs that uh, were submitted for outcome trials were the DPP4s. And the... Uh, there are four DPP-4s that have been studied, allagliptin, saxagliptin, cytogliptin, and linagliptin and fi in five studies. And uh, what you can see here is that uh, uh, if one looks at uh, MACE, which is uh, the primary endpoint for most studies, 
that's uh, myocardial infarction, uh, stroke, or cardiovascular death, you can see that for virtually all of them, it's just around unity. 0 0.96, 1.0, 0.99, 1.02, 0 0.98. No impact on MACE and no real impact on heart failure. Suggestion of perhaps a slight increase with saxagliptin and in the Carolina study, uh, but, but nothing um, uh, consistent. What about SGLTs? They've been more exciting. Uh, this is a, a meta-analysis of the first five SGLT2 studies that were done looking at cardiovascular outcomes. So this is their effect on MACE, which is, as I said, cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke. Uh, and what one sees is that there is a, a, a treatment benefit uh, that is seen in, uh, in, in at least three and, and nearly four of them. And certainly if one looks at the pool estimate, it's 0.90. This was a meta-analysis published in 2021. Subsequently, um, the SCORED study was included using sodagliflozin and SGLT1, uh, and that contributed to that. And, and here the overall MACE benefit then drops to 0.88. If we go back to the original meta-analysis and we look at the breakdown of MACE by whether or not there was a previous evidence of cardiovascular disease, you can see that there is a reduction in that case, but if there's no previous cardiovascular disease, it does not reach statistical significance. If one looks at cardiovascular mortality, the group as a whole has a 15% risk reduction in favor of uh, using SGLTs. And if one looks at hospitalization for heart failure, I'll get into that a bit later when we have some specific heart failure studies to examine. But here you can see a 32% reduction in heart failure uniformly seen across all of these original five May studies uh, looking at, at these five cardiovascular outcome studies uh, when one looks at hospitalization for heart failure. Renal endpoints, again, are all favorable and it shows a 38% reduction in the renal endpoints. They differed among studies, but I'll get into more renal studies uh, later. What about GLP-1 receptor uh, agonists? Well, there's a new one that was reported this year, and I'll go into that one in detail, and then I'll look at a summary of all of them. But the one this year was Amplitude O using FPEG-glenotide, uh, and the primary outcome, again, CV death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke. And what one sees is a a 27% risk reduction, the hazard ratio is 0.73, which is statistically significant in reduction of risk uh, with the use of the GLP-1. Here we look at MACE, coronary revascularization or unstable angina, a secondary outcome. And again, a 31%, excuse me, a 21% risk reduction, uh, the hazard ratio is 0.79. And again, this is statistically significant. If one goes to another secondary outcome, the composite of kidney worsening, kidney outcome, newer worsening nephropathy, 32% risk reduction, statistically significant. And if one looks at uh, MACE or non-CVD death, uh, one gets a 27% risk reduction, which is statistically significant. If we look at a recent meta-analysis that was also presented at ADA during the same time that uh, the Amplitude O was presented, uh, that uh, but this is now published in the October issue of Lancet Diabetes Endocrinology, uh, what one sees is that if you, if you look at the um, eight studies uh, that have examined um, the effect of GLP-1s on cardiovascular outcomes on MACE, Statistically significant for the group as a whole, 0.86 is the hazard ratio, 14% risk reduction. Um, that was seen in, in most, but not all of the studies. The big exception up here is Alexa, uh, which had no effect at all, not even a suggestion of one. Um, and um, the reason for that is that they enrolled people who were just recently uh, admitted to the hospital for acute coronary syndrome, and they have a high likelihood of another event coming up during the period of follow-up. So when we uh, look at the, uh, the, the meta-analysis and you compare MACE uh, 
with or without Elixa. Here is the main analysis of, of this study. Um, and if you drop Elixa, you see that there's an improvement in the um, um, differential, but one, may, one maintains the beneficial effect for CV death, um, MI, stroke, and, and total MACE. This was a previous meta-analysis before Amplitude O, so showing that you know, it's the same basic thing. And if one looks here at other outcomes, all-cause mortality, um, less variability, again, when, um, um, when one looks at the current study, but one sees that with or without uh, Elixir, all-cause mortality is beneficial. Um, incidence of uh, uh, hospitalization for heart failure is better. The renal composite is, 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 is better. And the worsening of renal function by GFR is better. So there is complete benefit from the GLP-1 receptor uh, agonists. What about trials in chronic kidney disease per se? Well, we, go, we can go back to, the, to 2001 when the renal study with losartan and the IDNT study with herbisartan showed beneficial effect, risk reduction of 16% with losartan, 20% uh, uh, with uh, herbisartan in patients with type 2 diabetes on, uh, in terms of renal protection. It's on top of that that the new studies have been done because they've, they've generally all enrolled people who are on maximum doses of ACEs or ARBs. And here you can see the Creedon study, the first one reported in 2019. Uh, this used canagliflozin, and the primary endpoint was uh, either the development of end-stage kidney disease, the doubling of serum creatinine, or renal death. And you can see there's a 34% risk reduction hazard ratio is 0.66. A dramatic improvement. If you if you looked at uh, MACE during that particular study, uh, one also saw a beneficial effect of 20% reduction in MACE, uh, statistically significant. If one looked at uh, cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure, again, 31% risk reduction. Hazard ratio is 0 0.69 and uh, uh, statistically significant. We can go on to the next study to be reported uh, with um, uh, renal outcomes. This is DAPA CKD using DAPA uh, in in patients with uh, with kidney disease risk, and the primary outcome is a sustained at least fifty percent uh, decline in eGFR, the appearance of end stage kidney disease, renal or cardiovascular death. This was reported in twenty twenty, and you can see there was a um, a 39% risk reduction. Hazard ratio is 0.61. There are seven zeros in that p-value before the 28, and the number needed to treat is only 19 uh, to be treated for two years to, to see the, the beneficial effect. Uh, if one looks at the primary outcome and divides it by uh, subgroups, uh, all patients we just saw was that um, um, uh, 39% risk reduction. If you look at whether with or without diabetes, it's still seen. In fact, it's a 50% risk reduction in the patients without diabetes. If you look at whether the baseline a urinary albumin creatinine ratio was greater than or less than 1,000 milligrams per gram, still show a beneficial effect in both. And whether the EGFR was greater than or less than 45, still showing beneficial effects in both. Here is the, the graphs of those uh, with diabetes on the left, without diabetes on the right, and you can see dramatic reduction in the primary outcome, statistically significant. Uh, if you look at the secondary outcome of sustained 50% EGFR decline, end-stage kidney disease, or renal death, this leaves out cardiovascular death. Again, you, you still have seven zeros before uh, in, in the p-value before you get to a number, and it's a a uh, 44% uh, risk reduction. The, the hazard ratio is 0.56. So dramatic reduction uh, in the secondary outcome measure. If you look at chronic dialysis, kidney transplantation, or renal death, um, just the, the real end-stage renal disease uh, outcomes, it's a 34% risk reduction. Again, statistically significant. 
if you look at CV death or, or heart failure hospitalization, it's a 29% risk reduction. Hazard ratio is 0.71, again, statistically significant. And if you look at all cause mortality, again, a 31% risk reduction, uh, statistically significant. What about scored CKD? This looked at the SGLT1 inhibitor sotagliflozin uh, for patients with kidney disease. The primary outcome measure was total cardiovascular death, hospitalization for heart failure, or urgent heart failure visit. And you can see it is statistically significant, a 26% uh, risk reduction. If one looks at uh, total cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI or non-fatal stroke, it's again a 23% risk reduction, statistically significant. And if one then adds this to the total, um, uh, the, you know, we're adding credence, DAPA, CKD, uh, and SCORED, uh, and um, uh, Emperor reduced uh, which I'll get to in a minute, as additional uh, kidney outcome measures, SGLTs, you can see that, you know, overall, it's a huge 39% risk reduction uh, when one looks at these compo compositely. Now, here's Fidelio. This is a, a different kind of drug. Venerinone is a mineralocorticoid uh, receptor agonist. It's non-steroidal, unlike the uh, existing ones in the marketplace. Uh, and it has a tremendous effect on reducing inflammation and fibrosis uh, in the kidney. And here you can see the first study with uh, fenerinone was the Fidelio study reported last year. Um, uh, and it showed an 18% risk reduction. P-value is 0.0014. Hazard ratio is 0.82. For kidney failure, sustained GFR decrease of at least 40% or renal death, the primary uh, outcome measure. These are kidney studies, as I mentioned. If you look at a key secondary endpoint, which is CV death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, or hospitalization for heart failure, looking on the heart side of it, it's a 14% risk reduction. Hazard ratio is 0.86, still statistically significant. And if you look at uh, death from any cause, it did not reach statistical significance in Fidelio. If you look at change in urinary albumin creatinine ratio, you can see that that was markedly reduced, a 31% uh, reduction uh, in, in terms of, uh, of that with uh, uh, fenerinone versus placebo. Uh, and, but if, and if you look at a secondary kidney composite outcome, in this case, not only kidney failure, but a sustained 57% decrease in EGFR from baseline or renal death. This is a common way of 57% of, of, of looking at these rather than 40%. You can see there's a 32% risk reduction, which is statistically significant. Now, Figaro is another study with venerinone that was just reported at the European Society of Cardiology meetings. And what I'm gonna do is show you the entry criteria for Figaro uh, which had, was much broader than the entry criteria for Fidelio. So for Fidelio, the, this is the, um, uh, the entry criteria when one looks at uh, albumin creatinine ratio, it had to either be moderately increased or severely increased. And it had to have, you had to have a GFR, if it was moderately in, increased between uh, above 15, but below 60, uh, but you could go uh, higher to, uh, uh, to 75 if it was severely increased. Um, so, and, and recall that this significantly, in, in Fidelio, venerinone significantly slowed CKD by 18% versus placebo. And this was advanced kidney disease. Um, now, Figaro, you can show here, actually allowed people with higher GFRs to get it. So in the moderately uh, increased albuminuria group, it went from above 15 all the way up to 90. And if you had severely increased albuminuria, you could go uh, uh, as to whatever GFR you had, uh, provided it was uh, above 45. So um, uh, it, it, it takes 
a, a more moderate view of things. And uh, I'm gonna show you the outcome measures. First, I'll show you the overlap. That's this little group down here. Uh, the, the, the dotted, the, uh, the, the hashed lines, you can see Fidelio only in this group and Figaro only up here in blue, uh, but the overlap is in the, in the hashed lines. Okay, so here presented at the ESC uh, on August 28th, online that day in the New England Journal um, is Figaro. This is on top of optimized RAS blockade. There was a 13% uh, reduction in the primary cardiovascular outcome of CV death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, or hospitalization for heart failure. And the number needed to treat after three and a half years is 47. Now, it was primarily driven by a reduction in hospitalization for heart failure, in spite of the fact that the study excluded from enrollment people with symptomatic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. You still got the, uh, uh, the improvement being principally driven uh, by hospitalization for heart failure. Now, here is the kidney outcomes. If you used the uh, at least 40% decline in EGFR as the kidney outcome, it turns out that it was not statistically significant goes up to 1.01, um, hazard ratio is only 0.87, 13% reduction, and the p-value is 0.069. But if you use the 57% decrease in GFR from baseline or renal death, what you have is a 23% reduction. That is statistically significant, uh, 0.041. And you'll notice less people getting to that in both groups, but the difference between the two groups uh, is 23% um, uh, and uh, statistically significant um, uh, there. Uh, an end-stage renal disease alone occurred in 0.9% of those uh, on finerenone, 1.3% in placebo. And if so, if you insisted on just end-stage renal disease, it's a 36% it's a, uh, risk reduction, 0.64 hazard ratio, and the p-value is statistically significant. So it really does work in kidney disease. Here's the combined cohorts. This was presented also at the ESC meeting. Uh, it was called Fidelity to look at the combined outcome. The co both cohorts from Fidelio and Figaro, so you get a larger number. Now there's 13,000 people uh, total that are, that are studied. And um, what one sees is a 14% reduction in time to CV death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, or hospitalization for heart failure. And that is statistically significant. Uh, number needed to treat for three years is 46. Here, if you look for time to kidney failure, sustained at least 50% decrease in EGFR from baseline or renal death, it's a 23% risk reduction, highly statistically significant. Number needed to treat is 60. So um, the composite renal outcome really shows dramatic effect when one put, has a bigger numbers and puts them together. Uh, as uh, one can do with Fidelio and Figaro in this fidelity analysis. Here, if you looked at the combined cohorts from Fidelio and Figaro, and you looked at the components of the uh, uh, kidney outcome, the greater than 57% decline is statistically significant, kidney failure statistically significant, end-stage renal disease, uh, statistically significant, EGFR less than 15, statistically significant, or a 57% a decrease uh, from baseline um, is statistically significant. So all the components reach that. Renal death is shown down here. There's only four and two people. And so that was not subjected to statistical analysis. Okay. What about trials in heart failure per se? Well, DAPA heart failure was uh, the first one reported in 2019. That uh, The primary endpoint was time to cardiovascular death, hospitalization for heart failure, or urgent heart failure visit. There was a 26% risk reduction, p-value of quadruple zero one, and number needed to treat is 21. So really dramatic effect. This is with DAPA glufosin in heart failure. Um, here you can look at cardiovascular death 
which is one of the components of the primary outcome, it's an 18% risk reduction that is statistically significant. So if you look at the total primary outcome, this enrolled people not only with diabetes, but without diabetes. And you can see the effects on all patients and on patients with and without diabetes were basically the same in terms of dapagliflozin being better. And, and these had a significant proportion. In fact, a larger number of people did not have diabetes at baseline than did. Here's emperor reduced. This is empagliflozin in patients who had a uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction at the time of enrollment. Uh, the primary endpoint is time to cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure. And you can see it's a 25% risk reduction. Uh, uh, hazard ratio is 0.75 and the p-value is triple zero one. Here is the uh, primary outcome with or without um, type two diabetes. With type two diabetes, it's a 28% uh, risk reduction, 0.72 is the hazard ratio. Without diabetes, it's a 22%, 0.78 is the hazard ratio. But again, remarkably similar type of outcome in both. And again, you can see there were more people enrolled uh, without diabetes than with diabetes because they were enrolled here on the basis of um, uh, reduced ejection fraction. So uh, here is hierarchical endpoint number two, total hospitalizations for heart failure. That's first and recurrent, put them together. It's a 30% risk reduction, 0.70 is the hazard ratio, statistically significant. And here, if you look at a, 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 the next hierarchical endpoint, this is the slope of the decline of the glomerular filtration rate. And uh, the, uh, you can see that initially, when you start them on an SGLT, you get an acute decline in GFR that then recovers. And then from that point on, the empagliflozin, and this has been true with all the SGLTs, maintain a better uh, uh, EGFR than placebo, which shows a progressive decline. And they crossed at about 76 weeks. Uh, so that when you get to 124 weeks, two years, um, what one sees um, is a little more than two years, uh, what one sees is a dramatic difference between them. By then, the placebo group has declined uh, 4.2 mLs per minute, and the uh, empagliflozin group has declined 0.9, and this is a statistically significant uh, difference. If you look at uh, emperor reduced the composite renal outcome, remember these were people enrolled for for uh, heart failure, but there is a composite renal outcome. And here it was chronic dialysis, transplantation, sustained 40% reduction in GFR, or a sustained eGFR less than 15 if their baseline GFR was above 30, or if it was below 30, a sustained eGFR less than 10. So pretty significant renal disease occurring. And you can see, look at those curves and the difference between them. It's a 50% risk reduction, 50%, 0.50. And that clearly is statistically significant. Here's all cause mortality. And just as we saw previously, in this case, there's no reduction in all, all cause mortality, not statistically anyway. Okay, now, just reported at the European Society of Cardiology in August, August 27th, online New England Journal of Medicine the same day is the Emperor Preserve study. Here people were enrolled with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And the primary endpoint was time to cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure. And you can see again, a 21% risk reduction hazard ratio is 0.79 p-value is triple zero three. So again, even in preserved ejection fraction, we're seeing beneficial effect. Here is the a secondary, first secondary endpoint. This is total hospitalizations for heart failure, first and recurrent, just as we were looking at before in emperor um, reduced. And here you can see it's a 23% risk reduction, 
p-value is a triple zero nine, hazard ratio is 0.73. Here is the slope of decline of the glomerular filtration rate. Again, we see the initial decline and then stabilization. And you go out to uh, weeks uh, after randomization, this uh, should read 172. The, uh, the last numbers here got um, underneath. But what one sees is that it's a point of, it's a 5.7 decline in placebo, 3.3 on empagliflozin, uh, and the p-value is statistically significant. The other thing they measured is a Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire, uh, which looks at a mean change. This is basically patient reported outcomes and the adjusted mean difference. Better outcome is a higher number, and you can see that was seen uh, with uh, empagliflozin either the adjusted mean difference for when one looked at the patients on treatment or all data with no imputation for patients who were off treatment. Uh, and again, it's uh, an, a, the mean difference is about a score of 1.50. These are dramatic changes in score. And again, emperor preserved, all cause mortality, no effect at all. 1.00 is the hazard ratio, no impact whatsoever. So now let's look on the heart failure outcomes and compare emperor reduced with a heart with an ejection fraction less than 40% to emperor preserve with an ejection fraction of greater than 40%. So this is looking at empagliflozin across the spectrum of heart failure. And you'll notice very similar numbers, a 25% risk reduction hazard ratio is 0.75. These are the 95% confidence intervals. And here, 21% uh, risk reduction, 0 0.79. So 0 0.75, 0 0.79, pretty close. Here for time to first hosp heart failure hospitalization, 31% risk reduction, 0 0.69. Here it's a 29% um, risk reduction, 0 0.71. Again, the numbers are very close. Here, uh, time to cardiovascular death, 8%, uh, 9%, but not statistically significant. The upper confidence uh, limit goes above one. But again, when looks at the two of them, they're, they're trending in the same way. And if you look at time for first and recurrent hospitalizations for heart failure, as I showed you a couple of moments ago, 0 0.70 for emperor reduced, 30% risk reduction, 27% for emperor preserved. Again, more or less the same general directions. Uh, whether you were looking at uh, reduced or preserved uh, uh, ejection fraction. And here, if you look at the two studies pooled, uh, emperor reduced, emperor preserved, um, the uh, pre-specified major renal outcomes, 50% um, reduction with emperor reduced, Whoops, but no statistically significant change in emperor preserved. And if you change the definition of a renal outcome, that alters the findings regarding the influence of ejection fraction. Uh, this is uh, uh, emperor preserved. If you see that if you're looking at a 40% decrease in EGFR, no impact, whether it be 40, to 50%, 50 to 60 or greater than 60%. But if you look, if you change it to a 50% reduction in EGFR plus renal death, you can see that for 40 to 50, you get a benefit that is statistically significant. It's a 59% risk reduction. You get a non-significant uh, reduction at 50 to 60 and no reduction at greater than 60. So the, uh, the, the heart failure in fact, the ejection fraction impacts the likelihood of developing a renal outcome. And if you look at um, total hospitalizations for heart failure uh, on the top or a 50% reduction in renal outcome on the bottom, I just showed you that. There's this trend toward less effect with the higher ejection fraction for the renal outcome. But you also see that for total hospitalizations for heart failure uh, with 
uh, uh, the, the higher ejection fraction of greater than 60, uh, one isn't seeing the beneficial effect. What about soloist with heart failure? Soloist the WHF. Um, this is a study again with sodoglifosin, but uh, again, enrolling for heart failure. Primary efficacy outcome is total cardiovascular death, hospitalization for heart failure, or urgent heart failure visit. You can see a 33% risk reduction, three zeros and a nine in the p-value, 0.67 here. Uh, and one uh, can, can look at the pooled data of sololess and scored, which I showed you before. And now one sees with a larger number of patients, there's five zeros before the p-value and it's 28% risk reduction in the combined studies of the two of them. Now, here's the interesting thing about sololess and scored when we look at that, that combined analysis. There were 1,758 of those patients who, had, who were enrolled with a re, uh, reduced ejection fraction of less than 40%. They had a 22% uh, beneficial effect from soda glucosa. If you go to those with moderate reduction in ejection fraction, 40 to 50%, there were 456 such patients. They had a 39% risk reduction. And if you go to those with preserved ejection fraction, more than 50%, they had a 37% risk reduction. All of them, all three groups, statistically significant. And so if we look at SGLT inhibitors two and one, they exhibit similar benefit when patients with re reduced or preserved ejection fraction in this group of studies but this group of studies does not even include Emperor Preserve, which I already showed you it, it, where it was, because this, this uh, analysis was published before Emperor Preserve was presented. But you will notice that either in preserved or in reduced, or the group as a whole, there is this beneficial effect in patients with heart failure. Now, here's another study. This is a small study of only 600 patients studied for only 12 weeks. Uh, in, in, and led by the Kansas City group, uh, Mikhail Kosoborod reported it at, uh, in September at the Heart Failure Society of America meeting. And what he showed is using that, that Kansas City cardiomyopathy score that I mentioned earlier, there's a 5.8 point increase on dapagliflozin versus placebo, which is statistically significant. And this is really a very dramatic increase uh, in this clinical score. Okay, so in summary, we've had now multitude of outcome trials initially done for cardiovascular safety, but then done in heart failure and in kidney disease as well. And the outcome trials, they, as I said, they were initiated to show safety and they have done so. There's been no real uh, adverse benefits that have come up with this group of uh, studies that I've showed you. The SGLT inhibitors, the GLP-1 receptor outcomes, and finerenone have shown remarkable cardiovascular heart failure and renal benefits. And the outcome trials have therefore been a valuable addition to our knowledge base. But now that we've completed multiple studies, the real question that we need to face in the future is how do we ethically modify trials looking at outcomes in order to maintain equipoise and not deprive people of potentially beneficial drugs. So that's the real question for the future. And I thank you for your time and your interest. And I'll stop there. Uh, many thanks, Professor Skyler. Uh, <clears throat> such an interesting and clear talk. Um, we learn a lot and there are promising number of medication to lower the cardiovascular risk in patients with type 2 diabetes. Um, usually the keynote address speech, uh, there's no questions or Q&A sessions on this. Um, and we are, we are doing very well for time. Um, so uh, uh, there will be more session coming on the way. You could always write your questions and there will be um, a response to that, either immediate uh, at the same session or later on you'll get the answer to your questions. 
uh, during the coming uh, over the Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, usually the session will start at 4 p.m. and they will be finishing at uh, 10 30 p.m. Dubai time. Uh, don't forget to visit the abstracts uh, and the exhibition uh, hall or area. And uh, there will be a number of in industry symposia as well to attend. And uh, there will be a room for uh, networking during this uh, Congress meeting. Uh, thank you so much once again, uh, Professor Schuyler. And we're going to move to the next sessions um, where there will be th three parallel uh, sessions going on at the same time, starting shortly. Uh, there will be one focusing on the adult clinical practice symposia, many diabetes, and the another one on the adult clinical practice symposia on the thyroid, and the third one on the pediatric and adolescent clinical practice symposia in technology. And uh, I wish you enjoyable time where we're all going to learn a lot. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I would like uh, you know to thank the organizing committee for inviting me and my colleague, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Zarai, to chair uh, this session. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud Zarai, my colleague, is a consultant endocrinologist from Doha. Uh, I am consultant endocrinologist from Dubai United Arab Emirates. Uh, I will start with the presenting our first speaker of today, uh, Dr. Tamar Al Issa. He's consultant in the pharmacology, diabetes, and metabolism at Jabir Al Ahmed Hospital in Kuwait. Uh, Dr. Tamar Al Issa topic will be choosing first injectable therapy. Dr. Tamar. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, I was speaking to you about choosing the first injectable therapy in patients with type 2 diabetes. Uh, these are my disclosures. So uh, uh, it's well understood that we're facing a global pandemic, uh, actually, also with diabetes. Uh, we're expected to increase in the level uh, on the prevalence uh, of type 2 diabetes significantly in the next 30 to 40 years. In the Middle East um, and North Africa region, we're with the second largest uh, um, increase prevalence around the world uh, and expected in the next 30 to 40 years, we're expected almost 100% increase in the prevalence of diabetes. That creates a lot of burden in the management uh, of such condition. In the MENA region, expected from the IDF, uh, from the ninth edition atlas, um, uh, that the prevalence of diabetes is, is expanding. And um, in, in the region of the North Africa, especially on the east side, Middle East, uh, in, the, um, in the Gulf region, um, um, and uh, also the surrounding area, showing its prevalence uh, of diabetes is more than 13%. And in some local data also, in, in the, in the, especially in the Gulf regions, uh, they are the leading uh, prevalence of diabetes up to 25% uh, of the country. Uh, we understand definitely with this large population of diabetics, we, we kind of face an issue with trying to control diabetes. These are all data about the, uh, the average HbA1c control in type 1 and type 2 diabetes um, in the Middle East, uh, we're not really much different from other regions in the world. Uh, the mean of HbA1c uh, is 9.6%. Uh, that's all data probably has some changed, uh, but still, we still have a problem in trying to control our patients and get them into the right appropriate levels uh, of diabetes control. We understand from the PQ, UK PDS is that as, the, as years progress, when patients having type 2 diabetes, the beta cell function, and this is an estimation percentage by HOMA, is that the percentage of uh, beta cell function actually declines. So six years um, after the diagnosis of diabetes, more than 50% uh, of patients required to be on insulin therapy to reach the target uh, of fasting plasma glucose of equal or more than six millimoles. Um, that creates a lot of burden in terms of management. Uh, in, injectable therapies has to be introduced in the right time and, uh, and to get the patients to prevent their complications. Uh, starting injectable therapy for type 2 diabetes is very important to decide to add on uh, or uh, to decide or when to do the switch from an oral to injectable therapy, and we need to do it at an appropriate time. To, the decision to start injectable therapy can be made in case of suboptimal control or if there is one or more oral anti-diabetic in case with uh, one or more oral anti-diabetic medications, that's the right time to, to think of doing uh, injectable therapies. 
But we have to be careful is that we should not really delay when we intensify the therapy to injectable therapies. There's a lot of in, uh, uh, clinical inertia uh, that pushes therapy forward. This is a uh, uh, data from uh, uh, Professor Conti and his group uh, looking at a number of years it took uh, patients uh, from having an uncontrolled diabetes HbA1c value uh, and how many years it required them to progress to additional therapy. Um, for a patient on the single oral therapy, it requires about all, between two to three years until adding a second agent, oral agent. A patient on two oral agents requires up to seven years until adding a third agent. And also the first injectable therapy as an insulin, uh, it's required about six to seven years from three oral therapies therapies with uncontrolled diabetes. So it actually, it can um, uh, control their, uh, their diabetes. So, and even uh, uh, pre-mixed insulin or any additional therapies will also require uh, further years uh, to control, uh, to, to introduce these kind of therapies. So it's a, a very significant delay with that. Also, uh, time to treatment intensification is very important. We need to do it also early. Uh, this is data from the uh, UK clinical practice research data link is that when there is actually a delay in the um, uh, in introducing appropriate therapy and an intensification of therapy to, can, to get uh, diabetes under control, um, the, actually we can increase the risk of developing microvascular complications of diabetes. Here they looked at the um, several of the cardiovascular risk or complications related to diabetes, looking at the maze here um, uh, as an outcome. And uh, looking at the red uh, bar, which is the delay in intensifying therapy beyond 24 to 36 years, um, it increases significantly uh, the prevalence of uh, incidence of developing of MACE in, in diabetic population. So what can we choose as an injectable therapy for type 2 diabetes? Uh, definitely, there's the basal insulin, GLB-1 receptor agonist. Premixed insulin and co-formulation insulin, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Fixed ratio combination. Uh, between basal insulin and GLP-1, which is a new molecule has been used uh, recently, and also the typical basal bolus insulin therapy. Factors to decide on when to start injectable therapy could be because of presence of comorbidities and complications related to diabetes, the glycemic control, contraindications to certain use of some injections, the BMI of the patient, the tolerance of the therapies that we can use, the risk of hypoglycemia is important also, especially with the insulin therapies, and the cost definitely is how to afford all these injections. Of course, the GLP-1 receptor agonist comes uh, very well uh, understandable that they have shown significantly improvement or uh, reduction of the cardiovascular outcomes in the, several of the trials. Uh, so this is the meta-analysis looking at the MACE outcome and all the known or the published so far the cardiovascular outcome trials. Uh, this is le led by the, uh, the first uh, uh, trial that was published, which was the LEADER trial showing significant reduction in MACE outcome, followed by the SUSTAIN and also the, uh, the, the, the new, uh, sorry, the, the HARMONY and then the, the newly uh, presented um, uh, study, which was the AMPLITUDE. There are other uh, trials that have not shown a clinical significance in reducing cardiovascular uh, effect, but um, as, a, as a meta-analysis, there's an odd ratio of uh, all these therapies together can help in reducing base outcome is 0.86, that's about 14% reduction. Uh, how GLP-1 could be helpful in that? Um, in, the, in the myocardial effect, GLP-1 receptor agonists can cause vasodilation in the vessels, um, uh, in the myocardial arteries itself. They can reduce um, inflammatory, inflammation in the myocardium itself by reducing inflammatory cells, cytokines, uh, cytokines and chemotaxis, and also can improve myocardial handling of glucose, improve glu uh, energy efficiency, and both that can improve the cardiac function. In the systemic effect, it can reduce adipose tissue because it can help with weight loss. It reduces gluconeogenesis, so it improves glucose metabolism and can cause vasodilation, or, or sorry, reduce blood pressure and reduce atherosclerotic lesions um, in, the, um, in the blood flow. That's why we see the effect mainly on strokes and ischemias. So with that, we can actually improve and prevent or improve the, uh, the cardiac function. So no wonder now with the newer guidelines being developed is that where there is a dedicated part for patients who have type 2 diabetes uh, or diabetes generally and develop atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or very high risk to develop such complication is that the main recommendation for therapy, even they, if they have a normal glycemia and normal uh, diabetes control, it's still it's recommended to start them on a GLP-1 or SGL-2 as an oral therapy. But this is very understandable because of the cardiovascular outcome trials that show significant benefits. 
Also important to mention is that in terms of choosing a therapy, an injectable therapy to improve diabetes, the injectable forms of diabetic therapies have a significant ability to reduce HbA1c and get patients under control. GLP-1 on an average can reduce A1c somewhere about 0.9 to 1.3%. Insulin is different because, on the, because of the diff, different types of insulin being used, whether it's basal, inject. Uh, uh, rabbit acting or uh, uh, a combination of the two. So their levels of A1C reduction is kind of doesn't really have a maximum level, but it depends on what's in the studies have been shown. It can, the A1C reduction could be up to 2.5%. But we understand since this is a, an insulin injection, there is actually no significant, there is no limit of how much A1C you can reduce with insulin. This is a nice study was uh, published in 2019 in New England, looking at the uh, what would be a good choice to start in terms of insulin in patients who are type 2 diabetic, insulin naive, and they have an uncontrolled diabetes with an A1C of between 7 to 10% on a maximum oral doses of oral therapies. So here there was three choices that were patients were randomized to, either to give them biphasic insulin, so a combined um, intermediate acting with a short acting, rapid acting insulin, brandial insulin only without a basal, or give them only basal insulin. So this is the amount of A1C reduced in this uh, trial. So the, the, uh, the, uh, the lowest A1C reduction was with the biphasic and the brandial insulin, the least uh, A1C got, uh, control or the level of A1C was with basal insulin. So there's, you can see how much with bivasic, especially you can actually, uh, since it's a standard therapy, you can actually get patients into uh, or improve their diabetes control. But the problem is that with the side effects of these therapies, this is the rate of hypoglycemia. There is a significant high levels of, of, uh, of um, hypoglycemia that happens with biphasic insulin and also with brandial insulin, but very minimal with basal insulin therapy. So even though you might get a slightly less effect on reducing A1C, but you're actually having less hypoglycemias. Also in terms of effect of body weight, patients who received either brandial or biphasic, which also included a, bi uh, a brandial insulin, they have the highest levels of weight gain compared to basal insulin, which has the lowest amount of weight gain. So this is mainly was also uh, one of the reasons why the initial injectable therapy in the 2000s uh, was starting insulin therapy. And um, insulin therapy, generally the basal, like especially glargin, been used as, a, as a, a, one of the most important therapies uh, for many, many years worldwide. Uh, and, to, and that's because of its effectiveness in getting patients into target fasting plasma glucose. Um, in terms of consistency and the A1C reduction, uh, regardless of what's the background therapy of the patient and what's the other therapies he's using. And, um, um, and also patients uh, reaching target it shows a significant uh, levels. This uh, this uh, uh, also data showing at the uh, how much the percentage of patients reaching the target of less than seven percent as they go progress from twelve weeks to up to twenty four weeks. Almost a little bit more than half of patients get into the target of less than seven percent. And on insulin dose also definitely increases um, with that as you increases the dose to get patients under the control. Uh, definitely because it's the insulin anyways, you will face the trouble of developing some um, hypoglycemias. And this is also was observed um, uh, throughout the use of uh, glargin therapy, whether it's an overall um, uh, hypoglycemia or even nocturnal hypoglycemia, but very minimal severe hypoglycemias were noted. Um, Glygen also looked at cardiovascular outcome in terms of safety, the origin trial, and it's shown compared to standard therapy that insulin glargin is safe and does not really increase the risk of developing cardiovascular disease. Uh, newer agents of therapy of basal insulin have been shown uh, to be effective as a first injectable therapy in patients with type 2 diabetes not controlled on oral therapy. Uh, this is uh, a trials of glargin U300, which is a uh, um, a newer generation of uh, glargin therapy. Uh, this is compared to glargin U100, which is the standard glargin therapy. In the addition three, they compared both those, those two agents, glargin U300 versus glargin U100, in patients who are insulin naive, uh, uncontrolled diabetics uh, on oral therapies on low, only. So they tried to choose which would be the, the uh, best option to start patients uh, as a first injectable therapy. In terms of A1C reduction, it was similar in terms of effect. There was no difference between, um, uh, between, the, the, between the two agents. They both had improved the, uh, the A1C significantly at the same level. 
But what's the difference between those two agents is that with glycogen U300, there was less risk of developing hypoglycemia because of the longer duration of glycogen U300. Um, um, and that's probably was one of the reasons to help reduce the events of hypoglycemia. So nocturnal hypoglycemia was 30% less and anytime hypoglycemia was 14% less and that was significant in both groups. Um, also newer generations of basal insulin was the degludec. Uh, and was also tested in patients who are insulin naive patients uh, on oral therapy, and they are not on the right control. And they tested that against the standard therapy, which is glycogen U100. And um, in the first, in this trial, looking at the uh, uh, at the core trial up to 52 weeks, there was no difference in A1C reduction. Both of them, uh, both of these agents have controlled diabetes well and reduced A1C at the same time, uh, at the same level. And even uh, on an extension period, there was no difference in the, uh, in the amount of A1C reduction. So both agents uh, behave the same in terms of uh, uh, efficacy and reducing and controlling diabetes. Uh, similar here, what we saw before, because um, Deglodec is a much longer duration of, uh, uh, of, the, of insulin therapy, comparing uh, Deglodec versus Glycogen U100, it showed only in the extension period uh, there is a numerical lowering of the events of hypoglycemia, of the confirmed hypoglycemia, 16%, but did not reach statistical significance. But was was significant is the nocturnal confirmed hypoglycemia. So patients on uh, the like, uh, 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 insulin therapy, deglodec insulin therapy, compared to glycogen U100, uh, in the in the core study and also in the extension study, both have showed significant reduction in the events of hypoglycemia, about 36% and then 43%, and both were statistically significant. Uh, also, the insulin deglodec, uh, deglodec looked at cardiovascular safety in the DEVO trial, and it showed that it's cardiovascular safe. This is the three-point mace. Uh, of all these lines cross the, uh, the hazard ratio of one, showing not significant. Even if they extended up to four-point uh, mace uh, as in stable angina, there was no difference, uh, so it's cardiovascular safe. Another um, interesting item in insulin therapy that also can be used as a first injectable therapy in type 2 diabetics is a core formulation of Deglodec, a basal insulin with the rabbit acting insulin as an S part. So this would be the first time we actually mix together a basal insulin, which lasts for more than 24 hours, instead of doing intermediate insulin, just like the previous pre-mixed insulins. So this is a core formulation because they are not really mixed together. Each form of insulin, Deglodec and Aspart, they are, they're, they're, uh, they're in the, in the needle in, or the solution um, in the, its own uh, standing uh, uh, setting. Um, Deglodec is formed as, in, as a dihexamers and the Aspart is formed as a hexamers. And when they are both injecting into in the underlying skin, uh, the Deglodec forms this, uh, this long chain of dihexamers and starts slowing, uh, releases uh, uh, slow release, so it can actually give the effect uh, within 24 hours. And the S part does its effect in rabbit dissociation and giving the effect uh, to control post meal levels. Um, I, I think S part, which is the uh, co formulation of uh, Deglodec and S part, uh, uh, has been tested against the Glargen. Uh, U100 in patients who are insulin naive, type 2 diabetic, not controlled. What showed in these patients, so these patients either given one in dose of IDIC S part uh, as a core formulation or the glycogen U100. So there's a slight difference in terms of A1C reduction uh, in, in favor of the IDIC S part, only about almost 0.3%. It was statistically significant reduction, but the amount was very minimal. But what it was interesting to see is that with insulin co-formulation, Deglodec plus the S part, it helped more patients to be under control with A1C of less than 7% compared to glycogen U100. So about almost 60% compared to 40% with glycogen U100. Um, and also in patients uh, with less than 7% without hypoglycemias, also it was, it was more significant with um, IDIG S part as a core formulation compared to uh, basal uh, insulin alone uh, with odds ratio of 2.2. So the minimal differences in A1C, but large difference in patients getting them into, under control and getting them under control with no hypoglycemia. Also, this is the confirmed hypoglycemia. Generally, it was um, uh, not significant in the confirmed hypoglycemias uh, the, compared in both, uh, in both the groups. And there was also no difference in the, con in the confirmed nocturnal hypoglycemia in those two, even though it, the graphs kind of separate but did not reach statistical significance. Also, uh, comparing this uh, core formulation 
uh, versus glycogen uh, in terms of weight gain, uh, they were both the same in terms of weight gain. Uh, there was no difference between them, even though the, uh, the, the core formulation also included uh, a brand deal, uh, insulin, but it did not change uh, the, the, the weight. And the mean daily insulin doses was also similar between uh, those two agents or the molecule at the end of the trial. So you get more patients under control. You don't raise the, high, the hypoglycemia even more. When, when you do this core formulation, you don't cause more weight gain and you don't uh, cause much more insulin uh, therapy, uh, insulin uh, doses. Um, in terms of using GLP-1 for patients who are, are not controlled as a type 2 diabetics, uh, these are uh, the known uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, dilaglutide, delbiglutide, xenotide, uraglutide, and lexinotide. So these are the ones and plus other ones. So they have their ability to reduce A1C and they, they have these variation differences as you see between them. And that's basically based on the doses that are being used. The higher the doses that's being used, like 1.5 of dilaglutide can reduce A1C about 1.2. Exenatide, the ones weekly, the two milligram, 1.5%. Diraglutide, the full dose, 1.8, 1.5% reduction. Um, the, there is a difference between GLP-1 and basal insulin. So if you compare those two agents, if you give the patient a GLP-1 or give the patient a basal insulin, what you see is that in terms of A1C reduction, they will have the world's same uh, reduction of HbA1c. So diabetes control will be the same between those two agents. But what's the, uh, the important thing to mention is that with GLP-1, you can actually um, have much lower weight loss or improved weight loss. So this is a meta-analysis of all the trials that, uh, uh, that tested or uh, did a look in terms of, of, of GLP-1 versus basal insulin. And with this meta-analysis, there was a significant favoring of GLP-1 in terms of weight loss. But in terms of diabetes control and A1C, as we mentioned, there was uh, no much difference in terms of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of differences. There is a very slight, if you just compare certain types of GLP-1, there is a slight difference in favoring the uh, GLP-1. But these, these, um, these agents or these studies have very mixed uh, results. And there's a lot of other studies have shown no differences in terms of A1C reduction. So you can have basal insulin GLP-1 doing the same degree of controlling diabetes, but with GLP-1, you get less uh, weight, uh, you get more weight loss, and definitely you will get less hypoglycemia with GLP-1. Uh, this is uh, also comparative studies between uh, the, uh, the, uh, the known uh, the GLP-1s against each other. So which GLP-1 then you want to use? Uh, these are the, the studies looking at uh, liraglutide um, as, a, as the one main component compared to other uh, GLP-1. So uh, liraglutide compared to exenatide, the two milligram, the duration six um, uh, trial. Um, and also a harmony trial and a war trial compared to, to lactotide um, and compared to lexilotide. Um, so these, the, these agents, some of them showed uh, differences in, in terms of, uh, uh, of effect favoring one GLP-1 against another, uh, for example, with lexinotide. And this is a, probably a classical difference because liraglutide is considered a long-acting GLP-1 while lexinotide is considered as a short-acting GLP-1. So, so maybe this is something that you can see the differences when you're using or choosing uh, the, the GLP-1. In terms of the uh, comparing to dilaglutide or albiglutide, uh, there was no inferiority between them. They had a similar A1C reduction in terms of how you will, you will choose the therapy. With the duration six, comparing liraglutide 1.8 to exenatide 2 milligram, there is more reduction of A1C with the liraglutide. A little bit difference, only about 0.2%, but it was statistical significance. In terms of body weight, it's, this is also showing uh, the, the liraglutide is probably a leading in terms of improving uh, uh, weight loss with the use compared to the other GLP-1s. Also important to mention is the semaglutide, which is a newer agent uh, we're starting to use here in the Gulf and showing it's a clear effect in improving diabetes control as when used in patients who are uh, 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 not on injectable therapy, on oral therapy only with type 2 diabetes. This is a semaglutide compared to dilaglutide. So if you look at the full dose of semaglutide, one milligram, 
compared to dulactotide of 1.5 milligram, you will see an odds ratio of three, meaning the significant reduction of body weight of, or having patients, uh, uh, proportion of patients more than 5% weight loss, it was significantly higher with semaglutide one milligram compared to dulactotide. And getting patients into more than 10% weight loss, it was also uh, more uh, seen in patients with semaglutide one milligram uh, compared to dulaglutide with odd ratio 4.5. Also was the signal significant even on the smaller dose of semaglutide, which was the 0.5 milligram. Uh, adverse events with the semaglutide and the uh, the and dilaglutide were kind of compatible between them. Uh, with the higher doses, you can see more GI, uh, GI side effects, but they are very almost similar between them. So this is all general uh, GI side effects. They're all kind of similar between them. As you increase the dose, definitely you can increase the, the risk of these side effects. This is in terms of uh, reduction of uh, HbA1c. This is sustained uh, trials, also looking at uh, semaglutide in terms of controlling HbA1c. Um, in the sustained four, they compared semaglutide, the 0.5 milligram dose, and the one milligram, uh, milligram dose compared to basal insulin as glargin. And with A1c reduction, these are patients who are also insulin naive, uh, injection naive, on, only on oral therapies. You can see the big difference in A1c reduction as the first injectable therapy, which is 1.6 with one milligram, 1.2% with 0.5, and only 0.8% with uh, glargin. This is uh, definitely with weight loss, uh, you would appreciate that GLP-1 can cause significant weight loss, and this can be seen here compared to basal insulin, which has a weight gain. Uh, also, combination co uh, combination therapy between basal insulin and GLP-1 is bit, would be very interesting uh, because you could have mixed effects complementing each other. Basal insulin can reduce your HbA1c by working on fasting plasma glucose, but it has its own issue with weight gain and hypoglycemia. Whereas GLP-1 GLP receptor agonists can have also reduction of A1c while with reducing fasting and postprandial glucose, uh, but also you get the benefit of weight loss. Uh, but you can have the issue with GI side effects. If you combine both together, you can have a powerful tool in reducing HbA1c uh, with fasting and postprandial, and you have also less hypoglycemia compared to basal insulin, um, uh, maybe even a better uh, GI tolerability, and you can have also some net effect on reducing weight. These are, I'm going to show you two studies which had looked at this combination between uh, basal insulin and GLP-1. This is iglar uh, blixinotide, and glargin uh, as a combination. These are patients type 2 diabetic, not on injectable therapy. Um, they, they're, these patients were randomized to three groups, either receiving the combination of the two together, glargin and lexinotide as one injection, or giving them only lexinotide as a GLP-1, or giving them only glargin as a basal insulin. Uh, these patients show that with combination therapy, they can actually have much lower A1C reduction compared to either, uh, either arm alone. It could have even better postprandial glucose reduction uh, compared to either uh, ther a separate therapy alone. And you can have more patients at target up to 74% in patients less than 7% uh, target compared to the other agents. And also with weight changes, uh, you will find it almost weight neutral. And for hypoglycemia, you get the same level of hypoglycemia as basal insulin, but you don't have the weight gain that comes with basal insulin. And you get less um, GI side effects if you use it as a combination compared if you just do GLP-1 alone. The reason why is that when you do a combination, you don't give the full doses of the GLP-1, you give less doses, and that's helpful in reducing GI side effects. The other study is the IDEGLIRA. It's a combination of liraglutide and degludec together uh, as a combination therapy. Similar scenario, patients type 2 diabetic, not on injections, uncontrolled. They randomize them to three groups, either receiving the combination together, which is degludec and liraglutide together is one injection, or degludec insulin as basal insulin or liraglutide as a GLP-1. After 26 weeks, there was an extension phase of another 26 weeks. What they saw in this trial is that similarly, larger drop in HbA1c 1.8% compared to the other single agents, um, weight neutrality compared definitely with GLP-1 that reduces the weight and basal insulin that raises the weight, and less even hypoglycemia than basal insulin. Uh, and and, um, and the, the amount of A1c reduction, as you see, is the largest in terms of the combination.
Those two studies uh, with combination therapies, they showed us is that A1C reduction is a powerful tool in those two combination therapies. They can do that significantly, 1.6 to 1.8 to A1C reduction. Insulin dose is slight, significantly lower with Degludec uh, uh, and, uh, and Deglutide together, but it was similar insulin dose uh, when using uh, Igelar Lixi. Uh, in terms of weight loss, both of them showed significant weight loss, even though it was minimal. And in terms of hypoglycemia, there was less hypoglycemia with Degludec versus, uh, sorry, Idiglera compared to Degludec, but similar hypoglycemia when comparing the Agralixi versus Glygeny 100. So what the guidelines tells us about injectable therapy? It tells us, this is from the ADA ASD guidelines, is that if patients on oral therapy are not controlled yet, then the first choice of therapy would be GLP-1 because of what the data showed comparing basal insulin to GLP-1. You can consider starting insulin if your patient is very uncontrolled, A1C more than 11%, has osmotic symptoms, or more likely is a type 1 diabetes. If the patient is not controlled on a GLP-1, then, then you can add a basal insulin together, or even switch the patient on a fixed ratio combination between the GLP-1 and basal insulin together as a single injection. And if the HbA1c is not controlled yet with these two agents together, then you actually start adding, sorry, you start adding the, uh, the brand deal doses to control their diabetes. So in conclusion, failure of oral hypoglycemic agents is common in type 2 diabetes and progression to injectable therapies is required with further decline in beta cell function. The choice of between insulin, GLP-1 receptor agonists, or combination of both for management of type 2 diabetes depends on patient's related factors, availability, cost, and experience. Insulin depleted type 2 diabetes patients would benefit from insulin-based therapy, and GLP-1 receptor agonist is reasonable in type 2 diabetes with high cardiovascular risk and BMI, and consider intensive insulin therapy or fixed-dose combination between basal insulin and GLP-1 receptor agonist in type 2 diabetic patients who have HbA1c more than 2% out of the target so you can get a better control. So with that, I end my presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tamer, for this great and scientific presentations. Uh, there will be a question and answer sessions at the end of this uh, session. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, next speaker, uh, Dr. Nasir Al-Johani, consultant, internist, endocrinologist, and president of ELECT for the Gulf Association of Endocrinology and Diabetes, a head of uh, medical department East Jeddah Hospital at uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, Dr. Nasser will talk about a new generation insulins. Dr. Nasser. Assalamu alaikum. First of all, I want to thank Mr. Chairman for this uh, nice introduction. And I want to thank the organizing and scientific uh, for, uh, committee for kind invitation. My presentation today will be about the new generation insulin. Uh, I, I disclose none for this presentation, and this is uh, my agenda, uh, we'll talk briefly about the recent insulin analog, then ultra fast acting insulin, then ultra long weekly basal insulin. I will talk actually briefly about the inhaled insulin and oral insulin. As we know, insulin is life saving in type one diabetes, and it is the most effective glucose lowering agent. Uh, adding second oral agent or GLP receptor agonist to initial monotherapy in type two diabetes, generally lower hemoglobin A1C by 1 to 1.5%. So actually most patients with a prolonged duration of diabetes, they eventually they will need insulin for glycemic control. This is the different types of the approved insulin in different countries, like basal insulin, like Glargent uh, 100, 300, insulin Ditimer, insulin Degludec, or brandial insulin, like regular insulin, and insulin like Afriza, Insulin Lispro, Ultra Rapid Lispro, Insulin Glorizin, Insulin Aspart or Fast Acting Insulin Aspart, or Premixed Insulin Biphasic Insulin 3070, Biphasic Insulin Aspart 3070, Biphasic Insulin Lispro 25 over 75 or 50 over 50, or Insulin Degladic Aspart 3070. Uh, there is limitation of the current basal insulin. Actually, current basal insulin is not truly beakless. So there is variability 
in the absorption. So this is maybe predisposed to hypoglycemia. The other thing regarding the current basal insulin larger and detimer, the duration is not actually sometimes in some patient does not extend to 24 hours. So there is lead, lead lack of flexibility in dosing regimen. The other thing, there is risk of hypoglycemia with the current basal insulin because they don't have completely flat profile. So the challenge with the current new generation basal insulin that they reduce nocturnal hypoglycemia and actually also they, uh, there is a flexibility in the dosing. So the first of this long acting insulin analog is insulin larger than 300. It is approved by FDA 2015. Uh, duration of action extend to more than 30 uh, hours. And if you compare it to larger than 100, there is similar reduction of hemoglobin A1C, but decrease the variability. And also there is a reduction of the nocturnal hypoglycemia by 20 to 30%, depending on the study and the type of the patient, whether it is type one or type two diabetic patient. Also there is a slight uh, weight uh, gain, 0.2 to 0.7, uh, least, uh, sorry, slight least weight gain from 0.2 to 0.7 compared to glargin 100. And also there is flexibility in the dosing of six hour window. The other important uh, long acting approved basal insulin is Dublodec, either 200 units or 100 units per ml. There is no difference in pharmacokinetic. It also approved by FDA in 2015, and the duration of action is more than glycogen 300, extend up to 42 hours. If you compare it to Ditimer or glycogen, there is similar uh, reduction of hemoglobin A1C, but decrease variability within the individual day or subject variability also decrease the risk of hypoglycemia, especially nocturnal hypoglycemia, and also there is uh, flexibility of the dosing. For example, in this, in Wednesday and Thursday, they give it in the morning, in the Friday, they give it in the evening, because of the length of duration, it allows for flexibility of the dosing. Uh, uh, if, if you look for the study that compared Glargin 300 versus Diglodic, there is more similarity than difference between uh, both incident. So, for example, in a bright study, uh, the hypoglycemia risk is at most the same. Although insulin glycogen 300 showed uh, bitter reduction of hemoglobin A1C in advanced renal impairment or in elderly patient above the 70, but really the risk of hypoglycemia is the same. Also, if you look for head to head comparison and conclude the study, that compare glycogen 300 to Diglodic. Although they mention in this study that there is hypoglycemia less with Diglodic, but unfortunately there is was an accuracy of the glucometers that detect hypoglycemia. So in conclusion, there is inconclusive evidence uh, in reduction of hypoglycemia if you compare Diglodic to glycogen 300. Uh, the ideal patient for low folium insulin, basal insulin, or uh, concentrated insulin like a glargin 300 or diglodic, patient with recurrent nocturnal hypoglycemia, those patients who require flexibility in the dosing, or those patients who require high basal insulin dose. So in this patient, you can shift to glargin U300 or diglodic uh, U100 or U200. Uh, the other fixed combination of the new insulin analog approved in new insulin analog is insulin diglytic plus insulin aspart, 70 over 30, given once daily or twice daily. If you compare it, the study compared it with insulin aspart 70 30, they found similar reduction of hemoglobin A1C. There is no difference between it and uh, nofolop or nofomex, but there is a reduction of the hypoglycemia, especially nocturnal hypoglycemia, but there is no difference in the rate of severe hypoglycemia. Uh, the other important combination of GLB-1 receptor agonists with basal insulin, uh, almost all the GLB-1 receptor agonists is approved for combination of basal insulin, especially basal insulin, and there is fixed combination approved in 2016, insulin diglytic plus liraglutide, showed reduction of hemoglobin A1C up to 2%, and there is reduction of the weight almost 3 kg, and there is lower risk of uh, with hypoglycemia if we compare it with diabetic alone. Also, the other combination or fixed combination is this larger lexinitide. So this combination is promising, may improve adherence, and may reduce the side effect that like the weight gain or the hypoglycemia of compared to insulin alone. 
The other important insulin is ultra fast acting insulin, faster acting aspart or ultra rapid insulin lispro. Uh, we know there is unmet needs with the current basal, uh, sorry, with the current meal insulin analog. Limiting postprandial glucose excursion is important. Aspect of overall glycemic control. Uh, postprandial hyperglycemia is associated with diabetic complication, especially cardiovascular disease. And the current rapid acting insulin analog, actually they have delayed onset of action and longer duration. So actually they are not physiological like the normal insulin secretion. If you look here in the black here, this is the uh, physiological insulin secretion. If you look here, the regular insulin should be given usually 30 minutes before the meal. And even the peak is not acute, there is no rapid absorption. So the peak of the regular insulin does not coincide with the normal insulin or like insulin secretion. With the insulin analog also, if you look for insulin analog, this is in the brown. Uh, also they start late and also uh, the peak is not match the postprandial blood glucose excursion. So what's the solution? What's the ideal uh, bolus insulin uh, uh, meal, sorry, or uh, meal insulin? Uh, the ideal meal insulin is there is rapid absorption, rapid onset of action, and shorter duration. Once the meal finish, okay, this is will limit the postprandial hypoglycemia and it improves postprandial hypo, hypo, uh, sorry blood glucose and lower risk of hypoglycemia. If you look here for the ultra fast lispro here and you compare it here with insulin lispo before the meal type 1 diabetes, you can see ultra fast insulin lispo, the action, there is rapid absorption and started before the meal. And also the peak is acute. There is higher peak. So this peak match the postprandial blood glucose rise after the meal, not like the actual lispo insulin. And the duration of the lispo insulin is higher compared to the ultra fast lispo. So the first of these faster active insulin analog is FIASIP or FDA approved in adult 2017 and 2020 is approved in children more than two years. Uh, the first study in diabetes care in 2017, the fasting acting insulin aspart and proof of glycemic control in type two diabetes or INSIT uh, one study. In this study, they compared the insulin aspart meal time. This is okay. Uh, in the brown, okay, with the faster aspart meal time with the blue. If you can see here, the faster insulin aspart meal time decreases blood glucose at one and two hour more compared with insulin aspart. Here they compare the fast insulin aspart if given post meal or given with meal. So if you give faster insulin aspart with meal, it's better than post meal because it reduces postprandial hyperglycemia. Here this is the meta analysis. Uh, there is a slight reduction of nocturnal hypoglycemia in onset 1, onset 8, and bold study of onset 1 and 8, almost 16% with uh, ultra rapid insulin aspart compared with insulin lispo. Uh, so, it is FDA approved, can be given two minutes before the meal or 20 minutes after the meal, error onset of action, 2.5 minutes, improved post branded hypoglycemia. Uh, the reduction of hemoglobin is the same like insulin as part, may lower postprandial hypoglycemia four hours after the meal. The other ultra rapid insulin lispro or the Lumigef is approved in 2020. Okay, uh, this study based in this study, ultra rapid insulin lispro improved postprandial glucose control compared with the lispro in type 1 diabetes or boron to type 1 study. Here they look for uh, uh, ultra uh, rapid lispro insulin. They give it meal time and they give it post meal. They compare it with lispro insulin at meal time. If you can see here in the bold uh, line, the red line, that the ultra rapid lispro insulin, if given with meal time, this will reduce hemoglobin A1C more if compared with the bliss pro, or if the if you give ultra rapid bliss pro with me in type one diabetic patient. Also here, if you give ultra rapid bliss pro uh, at the meal time, two minutes or zero time before uh, 
uh, the meal time it will be severer to lispo so reduce the postprandial blood glucose at one hour and two hour also here if you look for the hypoglycemia between meal time ultra ultra rapid lispo and meal time lispo in the first four hour uh, post meal there is similar uh, hypoglycemia incidence but more than four hour there is a trend for mild reduction of hypoglycemia with ultra rapid lispo insulin given at meal time so in conclusion in bronto uh, type 1 diabetes meal time ultra lispo demonstrated non inferior hemoglobin uh, reduction compared to lispo severe postprandial blood glucose uh, both at one hour and two hours uh, regarding the post meal ultra lispo uh, demonstrated non inferiority although there is less reduction of hemoglobin A1C. The safety almost the same. There is almost a trend for lower hypoglycemia with ultra rapid lispro. The other thing, there is more uh, side reactions with ultra rapid lispro, but it usually is mild compared with lispro. This is a concentrated insulin or a humorin R. It is very concentrated. The main indication we use it in the severely insulin resistant patient. If the total insulin dose more than 200 uh, units per day, it is available in BIN now and approved in 2016. The other innovation, innovation in insulin therapy is ultra long weekly basal insulin, ICODIC. This is still investigation. Uh, weekly basal insulin is important advancement in insulin therapy. It will improve compliance and adherence. The other thing, if uh, if has flat insulin profile, could reduce within day glucose variability, and this is could result in more consistent and predictable glycemic control. Uh, this is study of once weekly insulin, ICODIC, okay, acylated uh, insulin attached to albumin in type two diabetic patient. Okay, published in a New England Journal of Medicine 2020. It is a double blind uh, phase two trial. They compare the safety and efficacy of once weekly with basal insulin analog ICODIC given once weekly, 70 units, or with basal insulin, uh, Glargine 100 given as 10 units daily, and the dose adjusted in the weekly insulin by adding uh, 28 units if the blood glucose more than 100. 10 milligram in the week, and also the insulin larger 100 adjusted weekly once if the blood glucose more than 100 or if the fasting blood glucose more than 130 milligram uh, per deciliter. So this is the group, I could take a group 125 patient, glargine group 122 patient. The hemoglobin A1C is almost eight comparable. Both insulin, once weekly basal insulin and insulin larger 100, they reduce hemoglobin A1C similarly. Although in ICODIC, there is slight reduction of hemoglobin A1C more compared with daily insulin. The main advantage of this, we can give ICODIC, for example, weekly, so 52 times per year, but we give a glargine 365 times per year. The other thing, they achieve almost similar uh, patients that they achieve the target. So if you take the target, at least uh, seven, almost 70% of the patient, they achieve the glycemic target. Uh, also, there is less, low, uh, less insulin dose in insulin uh, icodic or weekly insulin compared with the glargine. Here, 30 units per day. Here in glargine, 41 units per day. The other thing, there is slight increase of the hypoglycemia with the insulin icodic. The main reason, because they go to treatment and target, they go to lower glycemic control from 70 to 110 milligram. And they advance the weekly dose of ICODIC by 28. So probably if we keep the target 80 to 130 milligram per deciliter, the target of fasting blood glucose, we keep it 80 to 130 milligram per deciliter. Or if we uh, increase the dose of weekly insulin by 21, probably the hypoglycemia risk is the same. Uh, this is another study. They switch from once weekly insulin. They switch to once weekly uh, icodic insulin versus continuation of the uh, daily insulin glargine. Okay, uh, uh, phase two trial. So in this study, when they switch to uh, once weekly basal insulin, they found similar glycemic control, and actually there is no increase the risk of hypoglycemia. 
This is another molecule of weekly insulin, insulin FC fusion, uh, studied here in type 2 diabetic patient using continuous glucose monitoring. This is the patient, 132 in three arms. Uh, the first uh, basal insulin is tar they keep uh, target blood glucose 140. In the second arm, they keep target blood glucose 120. And the patient in dubledic, they compare it with dubledic, uh, sorry, dubledic. They keep target 100 milligram per deciliter. So really, almost there is comparable reduction of hemoglobin A1C. Uh, and, and it is not in favor to Diglidic. So once weekly BIV insulin is comparable to Diglidic regarding the reduction of hemoglobin A1C. Also the same patient in green, they reach the glycemic target also or uh, the percentage of the time in the range is almost comparable, almost 60% in both the three arms. The other thing, there is a trend uh, toward lower hypoglycemia with insulin, uh, with basal long-acting basal insulin. So the co-formulation of once weekly basal insulin, Icodic plus once weekly gel receptor agonist, semaglutide in the same bill will be exciting if this is available. And this is study is now in, uh, in phase one trial. So regarding the oral insulin, it is investigational. And in this is study, they compare uh, long oral insulin with uh, Glargin 100 in type 2 diabetic patient. They have 50 uh, insulin naive patient with hemoglobin A1C 7 to 10%. They give oral insulin. They compare it with Glargin and they look at eight weeks for fasting blood glucose. If you can see here, this is at eight weeks. The reduction of the fasting blood glucose is comparable with long acting uh, basal oral insulin and basal insulin glargin, so almost similar. But really, unfortunately, the company discontinue the production of this molecule because we know that with the main problem with basal insulin or oral basal insulin is the bioavailability. So you require 58-fold higher dose, okay, of uh, oral insulin compared to glargin uh, sub-Q. So this is probably not cost effective and the production will, la will require large amount of insulin. There is also development of oral insulin transport because there is an awful oral insulin capsule that can deploy micro needles that release a drug into the intestinal wall for uptake into the bloodstream as shown in animal studies. So let's look for this fox. This is attached to the wall of the small intestine and release uh, uh, and release the insulin the system, still oral insulin under investigations because the problem is bioavailability, the problem in the absorption, the problem in the effect of the food, the problem is the effect of the gastric emptings. So we need uh, more improvement of the transfer for the oral insulin. The other type of insulin is inhaled insulin, dance 501 inhaled insulin. This is study they look for uh, type 2 diabetic patient, they compare dance inhaled insulin powder with sub-Q insulin Lispro. Uh, it is inhaled powder, okay, this is the inhaler, and this is how to inhale, and this is a liquid form. This look for uh, glucose infusion rate. This is, for example, they have 21 patient, type 2 diabetic patient, okay. Uh, this patient, they given six doses of the dance, inhaled insulin low dose, higher dose, and high dose and they compare it with Lispro 12 units, Lispro 24 units, and Lispro 48 units. Uh, the bioavailability of the inhaled insulin, 12% okay, of the dose of the uh, sub-Q insulin. So you need higher dose, actually. If you compare here, in the black, this is the dance, has earlier onset of action, if you can look here. And also in one hour, there is more reduction of blood glucose. And so the peak is not, so they are almost similar. This is in the red, is the list for insulin, the 12 dose. This is the 24 days of the intermediate dose, and this is the uh, higher dose, 48 dose. So almost uh, comparable, although there's error and set of action. So in conclusion, dance 501 and held insulin should faster and set of action with otherwise comparable leg dynamic properties demonstrated good tolerability, no cough after insulin inhalation. It is still under development. It is will be alternative to rapid acting insulin injection, especially with the presence 
now of the continuous glucose monitoring device. Uh, and there is also batch, uh, bolus insulin batch or basal insulin batch. This will release the insulin slower from the skin, it's still under investigation. And the animal study showed that reduce the blood glucose. Uh, and the last slide, this is the intranasal glucagon, glucagon powder. This is as alternative to intramuscular or deep sub-Q glucagon. It will be more convenient. It is used in case of treatment of severe hypoglycemia, but the major issue with it is the expense. Thank you for you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nasser. Dr. Abdel Razak, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Do you want to introduce the second speaker? Yes, uh, I would like first to thank uh, Dr. Nasser for his uh, excellent lecture. And then uh, we go to our next speaker, uh, Professor Jay Skyler. He was introduced earlier this uh, afternoon, but uh, I would like uh, to mention a few things in his uh, biography. He's a professor of medicine, pediatric, and psychology at the University of Miami. And uh, also he is uh, a chair of the strategy advisory group for Inodia. This is a European consortium of academic and industry groups developing innovative approaches towards understanding and arresting type one diabetes. Uh, he was the president of the American Diabetes Association and the vice uh, president of the International F uh, Diabetes Federation. And he was the founding editor in chief of Diabetes Care Journal. Uh, Professor Skyler uh, will talk about the immunotherapy of type 1 diabetes. Professor Kaida. I'm going to talk about immunotherapy for type 1 diabetes. My disclosures have not changed since my earlier talk. Um, and I'll remind you that type 1 diabetes is an immunologically mediated disease. One of the best ways we recognize that is from this classic photograph from um, the late Wally Gepps from, from Denmark, which shows a monotonous mononuclear infiltration in pancreatic islets. And these turn out to be uh, lymphocytes and macrophages uh, that, uh, that are there and uh, indicating that, that there is an immunological attack. And the immunopathogenesis of type 1 diabetes is that uh, antigens are presented by professional an an antigen presenting cells, uh, dendritic cells or macrophages. They're presented in the context of the uh, major histone compatibility complex. Here's a peptide in there recognized by the T cell receptor on a naive T cell. Uh, that we call signal one. And in order to activate that naive T cell, you also need signal two or co-stimulation. T cells can get some help from B cells, but once the naive tells T cell is activated, it, uh, it becomes a T effector cell, either CD4 or CD8, uh, which can either directly attack beta cells or secrete cytokines like interferon gamma, IL-1 beta, uh, TNF alpha that attack the, uh, uh, the beta cells. Alternatively, naive T cells can differentiate into T regulatory cells. They're protective. They'll try to downregulate the effector T cells. Um, and, and so we have the immunopathogenesis of disease in a nutshell. I'm greatly abbreviating that. But what we have here is the natural history of type 1 diabetes, as originally uh, graphed by uh, the late George Eisenbarth. We have at birth our beta cell function intact, and those with a genetic predisposition to the disease, or actually where the genetic predisposition outweighs genetic protection, are the ones who are prone to the disease. And an, an environmental trigger presumably initiates the immune attack. That may be a virus, it may be something else. But it, the attack is cellular T cells that are attacking and create the insulitis, the picture I showed you, and beta cell injury. And with that beta cell injury, uh, there is the production of humoral autoantibodies measurable in the circulation. Islet cell antibodies originally measured by immunofluorescence, antibodies to insulin, to glutamic acid decarboxylase or GAD, to IA2, to zinc, and the like. 
We don't think they do any damage, but they do indicate that damage has been done. During that period of time, we're losing some of our beta cell function. That can be measured by the loss of first phase insulin response to an intravenous glucose challenge or to dysglycemia on an oral glucose challenge. Uh, but dysglycemia means that it has not reached the threshold of the diagnosis of diabetes. Once it reaches that, we have the clinical onset of the disease. Now, although the slide shows this as a straight line, it really occurs in, in waves probably and, and not all progressive all the time. Uh, and in fact, we've also gone ahead and over the last several years and reclassified what these stages are. So when you have just the genetic predisposition, we call that pre-stage one. When you have two or more of the autoantibodies that I mentioned, we call that stage one. When you have evidence of dysglycemia or abnormal beta cell function, we call that stage two. And when you have the clinical onset of the disease with or without symptoms of meeting the glucose criteria, we call that stage three. And so the stages one and two are collectively called pre-symptomatic type one diabetes, and then symptomatic or hyperglycemic type one diabetes is stage three. If you were to try to intervene back here with those with just a genetic predisposition, that would be primary prevention. If you intervene in stage one or two, that would be secondary prevention. And if you intervene in stage three, that would be either tertiary prevention or um, immune intervention to, stable, to stabilize the disease. Type one diabetes, stage one, as I said, is characterized by antibodies. And the greater the number of antibodies, the greater likelihood you have the disease develop. Here are some uh, 29,000 people that we followed in DPT-1. 100% are free of the, of the disease when they were enrolled. And if they had zero or one antibodies over 10 years, very unlikely to progress, but they progressed with the appearance of diabetes of two, three, and four antibodies uh, progressively greater. And in fact, if you've, if you've screened babies at birth, and they, you follow them until they develop two antibodies and then follow them progressively over time, what you find is time zero is when they have two antibodies, the likelihood that they'll develop diabetes over the next 20 years is nearly 100%. And that was from three cohorts which were looked at together, one from Colorado in red, Germany in green, and Finland in blue. Type two, uh, stage two is characterized by dysglycemia. And here one can see from people we enrolled and followed in, uh, in DPT-1, they're 100% of free of disease at the time of enrollment. If you had normal glucose tolerance, this is your rate of development of the disease over six or seven years. But if you have either impaired glucose tolerance in blue or combined impaired and um, either uh, impaired glucose tolerance, here is uh, in green, if you have combined, of impaired fasting with either uh, impaired glucose or indeterminate, you're in, you're in green. And indeterminate here is a blood glucose above 200 milligrams per deciliter or 11.1 millimoles per liter at 30, 60, or 90 minutes on a glucose tolerance test. If it was there at 120 minutes, that would be the diagnosis of diabetes. But you can see if they have dysglycemia, they've got a 75 to 80% risk over five years and their beta cell uh, glucose sensitivity has declined as well. Here you can see people who did not progress to the disease, non-converters baseline, and then followed over time that, uh, that their beta cell glucose sensitivity was more or less intact. For those who were going to convert, they already seemed to have a decline at baseline that progressed further uh, by the time we had the last follow-up before the development of the disease. What about stage three, clinical disease? Well, there, the ideal therapeutic goals today are automated insulin delivery. In the future, it may be replacement or regeneration of beta cells. But I think in order to be successful with the latter, we really need that prevention of the immune destruction to preserve beta cell mass or function. And so we want to stop immune mediated damage and thus preserve beta cell mass or function. Uh, these are the studies I've been involved with uh, over the last numbers of years for that. I had the privilege of chairing both uh, the diabetes prevention trial uh, for type 1, which had two studies, 
uh, back here and type one diabetes trial net, which had a host of studies uh, over a period of many years until I stepped down in 2015. And these are the studies we initiated on my watch. Uh, I'm gonna talk about intervention to prevent clinical type one diabetes in stage one or two. This is the perennial insulin trial that we did in the diabetes prevention trial. We enrolled for this people who had at least a 50% likelihood of developing type one diabetes over five years. And you can see at five years, 60% had diabetes, our prediction was correct, but our intervention didn't work. This is the treated and the controls, unfortunately. At the same time, we enrolled people in an oral insulin trial, and these could have a 25 to 50% risk. So if you look at five years, here's the risk. It was 35% having the disease. Our prediction again was correct as to who we should enroll, but Again, when one looked at the impact, uh, oral insulin versus placebo, uh, no statistical difference. We did have a subgroup that suggested there might be difference. So we went ahead, and since that subgroup was identified post hoc, we went ahead in trial net and studied them again. And here in the trial net oral insulin study in the primary stratum, which was to replicate the subgroup that had a beneficial effect, we didn't see one that was statistically significant. So again, we failed to see the effect. Um, very frustrating. Nasal insulin done by the Finns in the DIP trial. Again, rate of development of the disease over time, identical in the two groups. Hazard ratio 1.14 to p-value 0.55. The Diaprevit trial with a GAD vaccine presented uh, just a couple of years ago in 2018. Um, Placebo here, uh, GAD here, no statistical difference. The p-value is 0.573. The trigger study, large study that enrolled several thousand babies, and they were treated with either a control formula or a hydrolyzed infant formula trying to remove uh, the, the cow milk protein. And what one sees is that the cumulative survival of at least two antibodies here, or at least one antibody here, were basically identical. And it turns out ultimately the development of diabetes was basically identical. Here's nicotinamide. I loved uh, the name of this study. This was the ENDED study designed to end type one diabetes, European nicotinamide diabetes intervention trial. Great acronym, great logo, the end of the rainbow. Here's the cumulative incidence of diabetes, nicotinamide, and placebo. They're both the same. Again, no effect. Very frustrating with all these prevention trials and no effect. Finally, though, the teplizumab prevention trial that we did in TrialNet, we see a beneficial effect. These were people who started in phase two. That is to say, they already had dysglycemia. And they were randomized to teplizumab or to placebo. And here's the rate of development of diabetes, remember 100% free. You go down here uh, to the time that 50% have developed the disease in the placebo group, it's back here, they reach 50%. The teplizumab group, they don't reach it till out here. Whoops, where is that? That is a 32 and a half month difference, a delay in the appearance of the disease. Statistically significant, about 53 and a half percent. 54%, and um, you can see 50% of the teplizumab group developed type one diabetes, 50% uh, were free of the disease in the placebo group, 78% developed at 22% free, and the time to the median diagnosis was 27.1 versus 59.6 months. What that means is that teplizumab given only for 14 days at the time of enrollment, a brief treatment was safe and had potential long-term benefits. And beyond five years, 18% of the plizumab treated group and only 6% of the placebo group did not have diabetes. This was the first drug to develop, to demonstrate preservation of beta cell function leading to the delay of onset of, and potentially in some patients, the prevention of clinical type one diabetes. What about intervention in new onset clinical type one diabetes, stage three? Well, 
many interventions have been tried to try to interrupt this, this sequence of events that I showed you earlier at all sorts of stages. Um, oral insulin or GAD vaccine at the antigen stage, anti-CD3 or thymoglobulin ATG to stop the presentation uh, and activation of naive T cells, abatacept to stop the co-stimulation, rituximab to stop the B cell help, alephastep to stop the effector effect, uh, a number of drugs to stop the cytokines, IL-2 to try to stimulate uh, the regulatory T cells, all sorts of things tried. I wanna show you in general what's happened transient beneficial effect, and then a decline. Transient effect, and then a decline. Here's a, an effect better than the placebo. Here's one where you actually have an increase of effect and then a decline. Let's look at that one a little bit more closely. It was a study uh, reported by Bart K. Mullen in 2005 using the anti-CD3 monoclonal antibody otolexuzumab, similar to the teplizumab that I mentioned earlier. You can see initially a rise in beta cell function and then a decline in parallel to a placebo group. But they measured beta cell function by using a hyperglycemic clamp followed by a glucagon stimulation. And they had asked patients to have those uh, done up to 18 months. And statistically significant difference versus placebo. But then they brought the patients back in at the end of four years and the, most of the patients would not have a clamp again. But if you actually looked at their insulin dose out at four years, here's the previously treated patients. They only had six days of otolipsuzumab at the time of enrollment versus placebo. You can see there's about a 30% decline of insulin dose that is maintained, even though A1Cs were identical and were really well controlled as a whole in, in both of the groups. So this shows you that you can have a long-term effect from a short-term treatment, depending on the treatment. The ABATE study with the Plizumab and new onset diabetes looked like it preserved beta cell function initially and then declined in parallel to the control group. But if they separated out drug responders from non-drug responders, the non-drug responders looked like the control group and the drug responders looked dramatically up here like they were preserving beta cell function pretty much intact for two years. And that was about 50% of the subjects, 50-50 responders, non-responders, suggesting that not everybody may respond and we need to, to look further to figure out who does. Here is another study that we did in TrialNet with uh, uh, low-dose thymoglobulin, AT, ATG. Uh, we also did a, a group where we mixed it with GCSF, but you can see here the ATG group alone in blue, compared to the placebo group in red, statistically significant, 0 0.003. Uh, and the ATG with GCSF, you had to be less than 0.025 because we divided the p-value in half to be significant. This was not significant. And it did really not work as well as the uh, ATG alone. This is the one-year data. Here's the two-year data, continuing to show beneficial effect, but there is a decline in here. And this was only two days of treatment back here at, at enrollment, but prolonged effect out here at two years versus placebo. So some drugs, depending on where they work, may have a prolonged effect. Here's an example of another study. This is anti-TNF with golimumab, the TIGER study. You can see it out at, a, at a year, it looked like it was preserving a beta cell function. But you stop the drug at a year, and that went down in parallel to the placebo group, off therapy. Important lesson, you can use anti-TNFs in people with rheumatoid arthritis for protracted period of time. Why stop? That's a question one could pose. Here's another one where that same question comes up. This is a combination study of anti-IL-21 plus liraglutide. This to preserve beta cell function, this to stop the immune attack. Here in red is the combination group. Looks like out to 54 weeks on drug, both drugs, it seems to be working um, and preserving beta cell function. Here is a placebo down here. Here is um, liraglutide alone. Here is IL, anti-IL-21 alone. They were not having the effects. But if you, if you stop the drugs and go out to uh, another half year, you can see the effect dissipates. 
Don't stop it when it's working. Certainly not something that's improving beta cell function like liraglutide. Here's imatinib. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, a drug used for leukemia. It's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It was used for six months here, and this was statistically significant between the drug and placebo, but then it declines rapidly in parallel to the placebo drug during the next uh, 18 months. Here they measured a change of beta cell function, uh, looking at glucose sensitivity, and that looked like it improved while they were on drug and then declined uh, when they went off drug. Again, suggesting you need to continue to drugs many times if you're gonna see the effects. Well, the other thing I think that we get from that com combination of anti-IL-21 and uh, liraglutide is that we may need to be using combination strategies. I propose an aggressive combination strategy. There's three components of the immune system. There's the innate immunity or inflammation. There's adaptive immunity. And there's regulatory immunity, the beneficial immunity. And I think we need to be looking at all three of those, as well as trying to improve beta cell health. So I would propose we need to be using a four drug therapy. And we have called that di diabetes islet preservation immune treatment or DIPIT trial, which we're hoping to be able to do. We've got uh, an IND from the government to do it. Uh, it would use an anti-inflammatory agent such as anti-TNF continuously. It would use short-term ATG or, an, or anti-CD3, which only need to be used short-term to stop the immune attack. We would try to, uh, the adaptive immune response. We would try to drive the regulatory T cells with IL-2 low dose and try to preserve beta cell health with a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Hopefully, we will be able to do that trial and hopefully achieve success because our goal is to prevent immune destruction to preserve beta cell mass or function. I think that's going to be an essential component, not only by itself, but in context of trying to preserve and replace, replace and regenerate beta cells. So I'll stop there and thank you for your attention. These are the people who supported my research in this field over the years. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Skylar, for this great uh, presentation. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, last uh, speaker for this session, uh, Dr. Aus uh, Al Zaid. He is diabetes consultant at Riyadh, uh, Saudi Arabia. Also visiting Professor Molecular Biology at Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden, and Barbara Davis Center for Childhood Diabetes in uh, Colorado, USA. Uh, Dr. Aus will talk about critique for the current diabetes guideline. Dr. Aus. I'm delighted, uh, honored, and thrilled to be a speaker uh, at this uh, conference. And I would like to take this opportunity to wish the Gulf Association for Diabetes and Endocrinology the very best for the future. Now, I'm grateful for the organizing committee, for obviously for the personal invitation, uh, and also for the choice of topic, diabetes guideline, a very important uh, topic. A confession uh, is that I'm not an expert in the field of guidelines. I'm trying to share with you my reading of the literature and kind of blended with my own uh, clinical experience. I have no financial or intellectual conflict of interest. Now, guidelines, and by guidelines, I mean uh, all um, includes consensus statement, expert opinions, and so on. These are key part of everyday clinical practice. And we tend to think of, we follow guidelines, and it's indicative of the academic well-being of the individual doctors. You know, you follow the guideline, you know what's going on, very important, so that you know what to offer your patients. So this presentation will aim, will attempt to offer tips and concerns regarding interpretation and uh, strengths and limitations of guidelines available in, with the idea that hopefully it'll help you make the right choice. First statement, this is not guidelines. This is a drug algorithm scheme. I say this because um, Many physicians, unfortunately, 
think guidelines are drug algorithm scheme. It's not. This is only page six of the 34 page ADA guidelines. This is only one step in a long multi step recipe. At a recent meeting, I asked the audience to raise their hands if they're following the ADA guidelines, and almost everybody raised their hand. But then I asked who actually read the 34 page a document, I think only few people um, had their hands up. So guidelines is not drug algorithm, it's much more than that. Because I believe after 30 years of experience, a clinical experience in diabetes and caring for people with diabetes, I believe diabetes treatment depends more on better care than superior drugs. All drugs start as novel therapies when first marketed. The novelty wears off with time or when the patency expires and the marketing storm subsides. The reality on the ground is that diabetes control has changed very little over the years. So to me, if there's a message, a clinical practice message, is that practice confined to drugs is like attention to the car you want to buy without proper knowledge of the rules of the road. It takes two to tango, human care and medications to achieve effective, successful diabetes care. I say this because I see the attention paid to drugs. Uh, if you have hypothyroid, all you worry about is the thyroxine. But diabetes, there's much more to diabetes, almost a way of life. And what do I mean by the human side? Of course, it's the patient-centered approach. It's the empathic care summarizing here, factors that impact the choice of treatment, shared decision-making, et cetera. The best section I've read on the subject is written in the ADA statement, um, uh, guideline, consensus statement. That is, and everybody should be familiar with that. Don't just look at the page six. Why patient-centered approach is important? Uh, because it makes a difference to clinical outcome. Scientifically speaking, it makes a difference to clinical outcome. It's prioritized in all guidelines. It's a professional obligation on everybody. And patient-centered approach, it's not about being nice to your patient or you know, small chat uh, or longer time, spending longer time with the patient. It's much more than that. It's about being interactive, effective interaction and engagement of the patient. Like I said, diabetes is not just about drugs. It's much more than that. The mechanism for that is effective communication. And in my opinion, that is missing, uh, the missing link in uh, many clinics. And uh, if I were to advise, I think we need to push with clinical emphasis uh, to enhance doctor's performance. We know drugs performance, we can estimate that, but we don't know how doctors, and that's a critical part. What goes in here is vital to the performance of the patient, the outcome. It's the small gestures, it's the language, it's the listening, it's the interaction. And so I would, uh, I would encourage researchers, people enthusiastic about diabetes, to look into this more and the future. Uh, we know that artificial intelligence, for example, is now we have programs that can read the mindset of the patient, the emotional response. It's like customer satisfaction. And that would be a nice thing to, uh, to study and uh, look into. Don't have all your eggs in one basket, drugs. The first thing I want to say, or the first thing I do when I look at a diabetes document, document, I don't look at the first page. I look at the last page first, which is the acknowledgement. Because unfortunately, guidelines often are packaged and delivered by pharma companies. And this is the type of statement you see uh, in acknowledgement. This work was funded with unrestricted grant from X Pharma, or uh, authors would like to thank pharma company, X pharma company, or Y pharma company for funding the expert panel meeting and the medical writing. So it's almost like Amazon delivery. So pharma is a business industry. 
it's not a charity organization. They have products to sell and promote. They're entitled to look after their interest, as long as they play within the legal and ethical boundaries. But guidelines are a huge professional responsibility. It's not like you know, writing an article or a, a, a small uh, study or, or something like that. This is millions of people follow. So independence must be maintained. So the first message is be aware of the invisible authors. Diabetes guidelines are meant to help not overtake or substitute your role as a physician. And I like the ADA of 2015, which, you know, the first line is metformin they give you, and then they give you a window of opportunity for you to exercise your right, your privilege as physician, your, your, your professional uh, mission. Because the doctor should know and efficacy, the risk of hypoglycemia, weight, side effect, of the, and the costs of drugs involved. No one should tell you that if your patient is rich or VIP, you should offer them expensive drugs. If they happen to be poor, just give them sulfonylurea or cheaper drugs. I am not aware of any other guideline, guidelines that say, you know, a drug for the haves and another for the have-nots. So please avoid reflex drug prescription, apply common sense, and draw from your own clinical experience. Another point to make is that consider the bigger picture. I have noticed lately that we've become a p-value culture. An article in the New England Journal of Medicine, p-value under 0.05, and everybody running for their prescription pad. That's not right. P-values tells a statistical difference, not the reproducibility. Obviously, you need your confidence interval and so on. And then not clinically, they don't necessarily, they don't give you clinically meaningful. Uh, the difference is not always relevant. Significant P-values does not mean everybody, everybody gets benefit. Because I get the impression that some doctors, whenever they see a p-value, positive, significant, that they think everybody they're going to see in the clinic is going to get um, benefit from the drug. For that, you need to do the number needed to treat, to prevent a, an, an event. And I think people should be familiar with that. Just to give you an example, if you take the declared study population, and I'm just, this is just a random, just to give you an idea, the number needed to treat is one in 107. So in other words, you know, one patient will benefit out of 107 people treated for four years. One patient gets benefit. But what do you tell the other 106 patients? Take this drug for four years and expect no benefit? You have to get that mindset. For comparison's sake, you know, number needed to treat um, uh, for statins, and they're cheap and very simple, uh, is one in 30. Cost is important. Here's a cost. I made kind of a, a crude estimate myself, you know, I, and I hope I got it right. Cost estimate in, in Saudi Arabia. Well, if we took the declared population as an example of, you know, um, three to thousand patients a year to prevent two episodes of heart failure, I think the price per month is 160 for generally for SGLT inhibitors for 12 months. 1,000 patients is almost 2 million. And that does not include the cost of DKAs, genital infections, and amputations. And these are not serious because even though they may be rare, it's, it's a, a catastrophe for the patient to lose a limb. And there's also an ethical obligation that not everybody seems to be aware of. Here's what the American Board of Internal Medicine Charter says. Physicians are required to provide healthcare based on wise, wise and cost-effective management of limited clinical resources. We can look at the local data, local costs. This is a, a table, shows you the class, and doesn't include insulins, but the, the six classes of uh, oral uh, diabetes medications, annual cost in uh, Saudi Riel, and we made metformin as a reference. And you can see a year of metformin and sulfonylurea is, is about 100 to 300. 
a year of something else is almost 10,000. In other words, what you give a patient for a whole year, supply of a whole year, is equivalent to a week of another drug. And remember, not everybody benefits. At that price, you need to be able to live forever, in my opinion. And this is the, uh, in reference to the uh, cost. Cost must be viewed as a slight, like access to medication. Cost must be viewed as a side effect. It bothers patients. So avoid open buffet ab approach. And to be honest, I don't like the ADA, um, kind of the, the way the things have been formulated. Uh, if cost is an issue, use cheaper drugs. The word cheap has almost derogatory. It, it indicates kind of a subtle, low quality drug. And there's nothing wrong with the standard drugs, uh, medications that we've used for years. I would have said, if, I, if cost is an issue, avoid expensive drugs. The, the ADA has put expensive drug as a default. And cost is an issue. Type 2 diabetes is not a rare disease. It's a national burden. It's a Gulf crisis. The other point I want to make is that there's plenty of choice you need to be familiar with. A variety of guidelines are available. The ADA is the most visible, strong emphasis on SGLT and GLP-1 analogs. But there's life beyond the ADA. And we shouldn't treat um, guidelines as a form of religion that you're committed 100%. You can't deviate for any reason. There are other guidelines, just as a sample here. And I'm familiar with the um, uh, statement from the uh, SSEM, Saudi Society of Necrology and, uh, and Metabolism, published uh, recently uh, uh, with special emphasis as well on adherence cost. So adherence is not just mentioned in the details. It's actually used as a, div as a uh, dividing uh, factor cost, culture, we have to relate things to our, our environment. The point here is that while well, the emphasis is on SGLT, other, and unless I haven't, I must make a, an admission, I haven't been familiar with uh, any recent changes or modifications, so, but in general, they recommend metformin followed by standard traditional agents. In other words, like we saw with the ADA, what I call ADA like 2015. So the question now to everybody, if the scientific evidence is the same and it's available to everyone, why the different interpretation? Do people think that the one organization has superior scientific knowledge, superior uh, analytical tests, or they care more about people with diabetes than others? It's not. It's about people behind the guidelines. It's about the jury looking at the evidence and the approach taken. And just as a comparison sake, if you take the NICE guidelines, there is zero conflict of interest, broad and independent expert opinions, like scientists, GPs, nurses, epidemiologists, health economists, lay people, broad based assessment of benefit, number needed to treat, value for money, et cetera, not, a, just, not just the p-value. Unfortunately, it has low visibility because of low marketing. How, how often do you see someone to come into your clinic with you know, the, the guidelines of NICE compared to say the guidelines of other uh, associations? Uh, if you look at the ADA guidelines, um, now I just need to make a statement here that I, I admire the ADA in so many ways. I spent three years being sponsored by the ADA at the time uh, I worked at the Mayo Clinic uh, many years ago. So, but I feel that in the drug scheme uh, situation, there's a conflict of interest. And you need to be familiar with the ethical code of the American Academy of Medicine, ethical code, co uh, conflict of interest. Intellectual, in other words, if you have a drug sponsored, if you're involved in the drug sponsored study, then you're not allowed to vote and you're not allowed to be an author on the document. 
if you have financial stocks, you sell and share in uh, diabetes company drugs, you must be banned from the committee unless you sell your shares and you have no connection anymore, no financial interest. And the third point is at least one person, one chairperson should be, um, will have, should have no conflict of interest. Unfortunately, all three rules here have been breached. So it's about, it's not just, a, it's not the issue of science here. Something that I didn't kind of realize until recently is that, because we tend to synonymously use the word consensus with guidelines, and they're not the same. If you want to develop proper guidelines and truly authentically based, evidence-based clinical guidelines, you need to apply something called GRADE. I don't know if there's other things, that methods that you use or not, to rate the quality and certainty of the scientific data and clinical recommendations behind these data, high, moderate, low. GRADE method determines the strength of recommendation, strong, weak, and ensures all interests are taken into account physician, the patient, the policy makers. And the good news, in my opinion, is that diabetes guidelines based on grade are underway. I don't know if they're published. I am aware of that efforts are being made and, you know, highly recommended. And I don't even know what the outcome. Um, unfortunately for the ADA, for example, there's no formal guidelines yet, only consistent statement based on KOLs, um, key opinion leaders, who are obviously running, many of them, uh, drug trials. So any set of guidelines, I like the statement by a colleague who is an expert in uh, evidence-based medicine. I like the, her statement here as being evidence-based. It's a buzzword, a cliche. You know, uh, you can only tell when you review the methodology. Um, that's what I'm saying, because sometimes you, you see a consistent statement and you think it's the best uh, scientific evidence. It's not. You need to review, or you know, if you're aware that they've, they've done it um, properly, then you're great, that's fine. Otherwise, you can still look at the AGREE uh, instrument, which is a useful instrument to tell you if the guidelines are good quality or poor quality. And here are a couple of... Um, recent articles, recent publications. Here's just the, the quality and it has, it's called, self, I'm not an expert, but it, it gives you several domains, you know, stakeholder involvement, editorial applicability, editorial independence. And if you look at the editorial independence, um, you know, you can see, and with ACE, it's, um, um, yeah, and, it's and this is a published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. And this is not just the only study, but when you see consistent results, you know, and it, it's really obvious. So you can, I want to summarize um, this talk. So which diabetes guidelines should you go for? The choice depends on you. Please get the balance right. Human care plus drug intervention. Not drug intervention, drug intervention, drug intervention. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Please retain your role as a physician. Exercise your privilege, your mission as a doctor. Do not surrender control to algorithm. Consider the background quality and ethics. Don't just look at the glossy part, colors and so on. Look at the visible and invisible authors. P-value stands for patient value, not P under 0 0.05, for all the things I've said. Be practical and conscious of cost, adherence, culture, your own, don't dismiss your own experience. You know, when the patient walks into your clinic, the patient doesn't ask you, I want um, these guidelines, ADA guidelines or NICE guidelines. They trust you to pick the right guidelines. So please shop carefully on behalf of your patient. They trust you to do that. Do not just follow 
the most visible guidelines. In the end, answers to this question will define the type of practice you do, good or bad. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahoz, for uh, around this uh, lecture. And uh, now we're, the panel is there for the questions, if uh, you have any questions. And uh, I would like to start, uh, take the opportunity and start first and ask uh, uh, Professor Skyla, uh, you know, with all these beautiful, Professor Skyla, with all these beautiful studies that you showed about how to prevent uh, type 1 diabetes, uh, do you think that there is a hope for our young uh, uh, diabetes, or we have to still to look for another hope like a stem cell or any other treatment that may give us more, uh, you know, or better uh, treat, a uh, better, uh, you know, outcome. Well, I think the uh, the thing that people can can reach to currently are automated insulin delivery systems. Uh, they're markedly improving uh, glucose control in in people with with type one diabetes and they're available uh, now. Uh, and there are several of them that, that, are, that are out there. Uh, I think that we are seeing evolving the, uh, the immunologic approaches to try to uh, interrupt the disease process. Um, and uh, I'm hopeful that the Food and Drug Administration in the United States and the European Medical Agency, both of whom are considering the potential approval of teplizumab, an anti-CD3 drug that I showed you, uh, to uh, delay the development of type 1 diabetes. We don't have anything yet that is has reached a, a point where it could be a proven method to, uh, to intervene at the time of new onset type 1 diabetes, but I think there's a, a lot of progress being made. And uh, as you mentioned in your question, I think that we're going to see cellular replacement therapies advance. There's clinical trials going on now with uh, both human embryonic stem cells and induced pluripotent stem cells. And I am hopeful that, that these things will come to fruition as well. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, yeah Dr. Mahmoud I please take over. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Abdurazak. Now, uh, Professor Schuyler, uh, in your expectation and your from your experience, if tebulizumab is going to be approved, for how long it's going to be used? Because you know, type one disease is very difficult uh, disease, and even automated insulin delivery is very difficult uh, lifestyle and quality of life. So, for how long, uh, in your expectation, it will be approved to be used in clinical practice? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. The, the clinical trials for, for new onset diabetes, people uh, who, will, uh, who have the disease, one will use it uh, uh, for either one or two courses. And the course is only 12 to 14 days. So they'll use it at the time they develop the disease and then uh, a year later. And then hopefully the effects will persist for five or six or more years. But, um, you know, you can't keep going back and giving a, a course of drug like that over a period of time. I think we're going to need to have better and additional interventions and not just rely on that. Thank you. Uh, my question to Dr. Thamer Laisa, you really touched a very important uh, point in your talk, which is the inertia on the physician, on the patient. on, And this, this has been going on for quite a long time. How we can tackle that? What's the practical approach in your experience or what you suggest to really lessen this inertia? Thank you for the question. I think the most important thing is to mention how, uh, what, what patients can run in through complications if delay of diabetes control is actually happening. Uh, there are several data showing increase in the outcome of MACE in patients who are delaying their uh, intensification of therapy. Uh, plus deterioration of some of their kidney functions. So I think we need to stress in the, on the medical community that, um, that delaying intensification of therapy, keeping patients on the higher levels of HbA1c can put patient at risk of developing complications. Um, the therapies are available uh, the, uh, the, uh, and probably accessible in a lot of uh, areas, and there is no point of waiting and, and, um, and delaying the intensification. Awesome. There is a question from uh, Dr. Ahmed Sajwani. Uh, I believe it is uh, to Dr. Tamra Laisa. Says, how do we explain no all mortality benefits with SGLT2 inhibitors? 
when commonest conditions of death among diabetics were tackled and reduced? Are we missing something? Well, the, the trials of SGL2 is um, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the enrolled patient are different in, in the several of the, uh, of the cardiovascular outcome trials with the SGL2s. Um, um, there are some trials which enrolled patients with very high risk who had cardiovascular events. The DECLARE is actually the, the, the trial which has the least or the more patients with as a primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. It seems like from the, from the meta-analysis of these data is that the worst the, uh, the complications of the patient and the worst cardiovascular status of the patient, the, the improved mortality happens in these patients. But if you are talking about SGL2 in whole population of diabetics, probably that's gonna be challenging to show mortality benefit. Okay, I think now right. things are clear now. now. Uh, for, for Dr. Nasser, this uh, combination like the long acting and fast acting uh, like uh, IDIG plus ASPART, uh, how you, this is, will be different from our previous, uh, like the biphasic insulin, like the 70-30, uh, because they, the, the concept now is they want to come back to 30-70 uh, formulation. And you know, this combination can be really very difficult to titrate. What's your comment on that and how you look at it? Yeah, of course, the flexible insulin, as we know, yeah. I mean, there is no flexibility. You hear me? There is, there is some problem. There is, the voice is interrupted, Dr. Nas. I think there is a problem in the internet. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe. You are okay now or still there is interruption? Anyway, uh, Dr. Abdul Razak, you want to add something? Because I think Dr. Nasser, difficult to communicate, uh, internet. Yeah I, would like, yeah, I would like to ask uh, Professor Skyler another question. You know, it said in stage uh, three, uh, which is the newly uh, diagnosed uh, type one diabetes, how long this stage three will uh, go on? I mean, uh, uh, these young patients uh, to how many years or how many months they can still be considered stage three and they be hope for treating them, you know, by immunotherapy, or this can be done even, you know, years after the diagnosis. Well, that's a, that's a very good question, uh, uh, Dr. Al Alman, Madani. Um, the, uh, the, the whole thing is that immune intervention will only work if there are beta cells that are still surviving. And there is a big decline in, in uh, beta cell function uh, from the time of diagnosis over the first year. Then it slows, and there's a more slow, slow decline over the next several years. And uh, what we don't know, because there have been no studies, is whether intervening out after uh, six months or a year or two years that we could still preserve beta cell function. There are a couple of trials that are planned uh, at the moment that will take people between um, um, six months and, uh, and two years to see whether or not one can intervene at that point in time. But I can't, uh, I, one, one can't be assured of that. And so you, you really get to what should be called stage four where, where you get beyond the, the period of time where, uh, where one can effectively plan to intervene. Uh, but one, if one has preserved beta cell function, one could go ahead and try, but uh, there's, there's not a lot of trials that are enrolling those kinds of people at the moment. Thank you, Professor. I think if there is no more question, I would like here to thank our speakers and to thank my co-chairman, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Zarayi, and thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I'm Hani Sabour. I am a consultant cardiologist at uh, Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, and I'm also a clinical assistant professor of cardiology at uh, Brown University in Rhode Island. It's uh, my pleasure today to be part of your um, outstanding meeting, and our topic will be um, the association of SGLT2 inhibitors uh, with cardiovascular renal outcome in diabetic patients. And we'll talk about heart failure and renal outcomes from the CVOTs with a focus on the um, Virtus CV study.
So I'd just like to start by saying that um, this uh, statement about diabetocardiology was uh, mentioned by Professor Eugene Bromwald in the keynote speech for the American Heart Association in 2018. And a lot of evidence and changes have occurred since then. But I think it's an important starting point to say that it's very important for cardiologists and diabetologists really to come together to learn about cardiology, to learn about diabetes, and a combined specialty where we all put hand in hand to help our patients um, proceed with the treatment of uh, diabetes, particularly informed by the outcome studies that we have um, that we have seen in the last few years. Oh, probably right. this thing. So um, the idea that we wanted to highlight today is that SGLT2 inhibitors affect the spectrum of cardiovascular and renal outcomes, and such efficacy is independent of glycemic control. And at this point, professional cardiology and endocrinology societies and guidelines recommend SGLT2 inhibitors for reduction of stroke, uh, MI and death in patients with type 2 diabetes and prior ASCVD and or albuminuric CKD. In addition, they reduce the risk of incident heart failure hospitalization in patients with type 2 diabetes, either with presence of CKD or multiple risk factors of ASCVD, and also have a significant impact on disease progression in the kidneys and progression of renal disease in those at high risk for CKD. And as you see from this um, diagram, the SGLT2 inhibitor trials have evolved greatly and have multiple categories. So the initial category was RCTs that looked for MACE endpoints, basically triple point MACE, which is CV death, non-fatal MI or non-fatal stroke and type two diabetes, the initial safety studies. Subsequently, we have RCTs that evolved into primary prevention, diabetes with multiple risk factors and no ASCVD. Then secondary prevention, which is established cardiovascular disease, renal um, RCTs, which look at diabetics and non-diabetics, and heart failure um, RCTs, which include diabetics and non-diabetics, both preserved and reduced ejection fraction. So this actually covers the entire spectrum of disease with diabetes. So from CKD as a complication, heart failure, and MACE. Also, we looked at type 2 diabetes and CVD, which is basically seen in the Empereg, Vertus CV, the clear and canvas. Make it as a presenter view, one uh, screen only, because we can see that the next slide. Thank you. Right. And then the um, subsequent studies were type 2 diabetes with CV risk factors, such as the clear and canvas. There were primary prevention groups. And as we've seen recently, DAPA HF, Emperor Reduced, as well as um, Emperor Preserved, have been recently published for heart failure only with diabetes and non diabetes. And now we have dedicated CKD studies with and without diabetes. So we've seen Credence been published, DAPA CKD, and we're waiting for EMPA kidney and scoring. Something's wrong with this setup. So now we've evolved the full spectrum of SGLT2 clinical studies. And in terms of heart failure, the SGLT2s and heart failure have gone from heart failure prevention, which is very robust data from the CANVAS program, Credence, Declare, and Empereg, over the preclinical stages of disease to heart failure studies in diabetes and non-diabetes patients with DAPA-HF, Deliver, Emperor Preserved, and Emperor Reduced. Now, it's also quite obvious that SGLT2 inhibitors are actually heart failure and CKD drugs. These SGLT2 inhibitors have modest glucose lowering, but very beneficial effects on cardiovascular outcomes in different populations. So patient diabetes with type 2 diabetes and heart failure, heart failure and, and kidney disease, heart disease and diabetes, and of course, a combination of all four. So as kind of a summary, I think we can say now in 2021, the SGLT2 inhibitors are essential evidence-based therapies in all of the following groups. 
essentially in all diabetics to reduce cardiovascular disease, heart failure, and CKD. In actually all heart failure patients, HEFREF and HEFPEF and mid-range ejection fraction to reduce hospitalization. In all CKD patients to reduce cardiovascular death. And in addition, all of this, regardless of the presence or absence of diabetes, regardless of the presence of A1C elevated or not, regardless of GFR, and in fact, regardless of EF. So there's really an entire spectrum of patients that really have a tremendous benefit in terms of diabetes and organ complications of that. And this shift has become a central one. So SGLT2 inhibitors are no longer just a drug in patients with diabetes to be compared to others, but rather a central therapy that lowers the risk of cardiovascular events and renal events. And now, since 2019 and going onwards with all of the um, guidelines, preference to the glycemic control agents that reduce cardiovascular disease or heart failure and CKD as well. And the efficacy of the SGLT2 inhibitors is seen even when the GFR is below 30. So the glycemic effect is reduced, but the cardiorenal benefits are still very clearly seen. And we know that the SGLT2 inhibitors are hemodynamically active. They have anti-inflammatory properties. And as George Bacris, the former president of the American Society of Nephrology, SGLT2 inhibitors are cardiorenal risk-reducing agents that have glucose lowering as a beneficial side effect. So with that, we're gonna delve a little bit into the Virtus CD study. So this is the um, cardiovascular outcome study with ertugliflozin. And this is a multi-center randomized perspective, double blind, placebo controlled event driven study where the endpoint was non-inferiority. The composite outcome was triple point maze, CV death, non-fatal MI and non-fatal stroke. And the secondary endpoints was a composite outcome of CV death and heart failure, CV death alone, or renal composite, which was renal death, dialysis, or doubling of stream creatinine. The inclusion criteria were fairly straightforward and quite similar to the other CVOTs. Age over 40, type 2 diabetes with an A1C between 7 and 10.5. Established ASCVD in all the patients, including coronary, cerebral, or peripheral vascular and on background therapy for at least eight weeks, or some of them were actually treatment naive. All ketoacidosis type ones were removed, recent myocardial infarction within the initial screening phase or cardiac surgery, and a GFR less than 30. In addition, market functional class four heart failure was excluded. Now, one important point to remember here is the definition of ASCVD comes from the ESC guideline for definition. So these patients either had to have a myocardial infarction recently, coronary vascularization with PCI and cabbage, or a history of ischemic stroke, non-hemorrhagic or revascularization of the carotid, or carotid um, or peripheral artery disease with a resting ABI of less than 0.5 or a prior amputation, peripheral bypass or peripheral angioplasty. So documentation of peripheral vascular disease. And they took this primary endpoint as the number one endpoint, CV death, MI, or stroke. The second was a composite endpoint of heart failure and CV death. And these were hierarchical. So one had to be met before you could go into the other. And then finally, the renal endpoint, as you're very familiar with. The baseline characteristic is that 99.9% .9 of these patients had established cardiovascular disease. Majority had coronary artery disease, half had an MI or revascularization, Heart failure was 25%. This is much higher than the other two, uh, three randomized clinical studies of uh, SGLT2s. And of course, a distribution of PAD, cerebrovascular, and stroke. The baseline cardiovascular medications were, as you might expect in a group of patients with established ASCVD, almost 85% with platelet inhibitors, high-intensity statin with azitamide, RAS blockers and beta blockers in the majority of patients. So a very robust, background treatment therapy. Now of interest to the diabetes um, uh, information is that the metformin was the commonest baseline uh, drug with insulin and sulfonylurea is coming a close second and the minority DPP4 and GLP-1 receptor agonists. The end point, as you see here, was that the um, ertugliflozin compared to placebo was non-inferior. Not superior, but non-inferior, but CV death trended in the right direction Non-fatal MI was identical and non-fatal stroke was unchanged. However, 
When you looked at the secondary adjudicated endpoint of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization, there was a significant um, reduction, 11%. However, it was the p-value did not mean superiority endpoint. Cardiovascular death was essentially identical to placebo, but it was actually numerically less. But the most incredible benefit, which we have now seen across the board in all SGLT2 studies, was a um, almost a 30% reduction of heart failure hospitalization. And this was statistically very significant. And these curves diverge within months of the enrollment. The renal composite endpoint is, um, as you see here, uh, lesser than placebo by 19%. But remember, the composite endpoint included doubling of serum creatinine, which as you see, is different and a little bit more rigorous than the other clinical studies. However, the renal stabilization, as you see, is quite uh, profound and you have the initial hyperfiltration dip and then a stabilization of the decline in GFR compared to placebo, a very significant difference in terms of renal function stabilization. The secondary endpoints, as you see here, the heart failure hospitalization is of great benefit and great significance, both for inferiority and superiority. Adverse events leading to discontinuation were actually no different than placebo. And the selected adverse events, such as urinary tract infection, genital mycotic infection in um, females uh, was significantly increased, which is not unusual, but symptomatic hypoglycemia, hypovolemia, and pancreatitis were not. Important special interest safety events, which are reported to the FDA and tracked, acute kidney injury was also less than placebo. Amputation was unchanged, no significant difference. Diabetic ketoacidosis, fractures, and fournier gangrene, no different than placebo. So the risk, um, of the amputation, and these are lower extremity amputations, usually small lower extremity amputations, were no significant difference by statistical analysis. Now, acute renal failure, as we just saw, was reduced in the arterial flows in arm. Now, we'll try to focus a little bit on the heart failure related events from the Virtus CV study. So we've been through the um, baseline characteristics, but I'm going to point out to you the percentage of patients who are normal, uh, normal albuminuric versus micro and macro albuminuric. The majority of patients had no micro albuminuria at all. And this is the distribution by ejection fraction. And this is quite unique because this is the study that ejection fraction was not only calculated, but it was specifically reported. And this is also very important because about 25% of these patients actually had heart failure. And the um, utilization of guideline-directed medical therapy in these patients with HEFREF, 90% ACEs and ARBs, and patients with um, all heart failure, 85% ACEs or ARBs and beta blockers. So very robust heart failure therapies. So the cumulative incidence of first and recurrent heart failure events compared to placebo with ertugliflozin was significantly reduced. And recurrent heart failure is very important because as you know, patient with heart failure doesn't just come to the emergency room once, they keep coming back. And really you want to see if it affects incident heart failure, new onset of heart failure or prevalent heart failure as well. In fact, you see the impact is almost identical, 30% here and 30% there with a very early divergence of the curves. The time to first heart failure by dose, no, um, no significant difference, both the five milligrams and a 15 milligram dose and compared to all patients was significant as well. In addition, if you compare to the patients who had a prior history of heart failure versus a patient who did not have a prior history of heart failure, while the impact is greater, it still has an impact in terms of favoring the active treatment arm. Whether the ejection fraction, when it was lower, less than 45%, there was a greater benefit, almost 52%. But even when the EF was slightly higher, what we call HEFPREF or mid-range or unknown, again, significant reductions in heart failure overall. So across the board, but even more effective in the lower ejection fraction patients. And if you looked at the uh, baseline and pretrial ejection fraction, again, this stands true. 
Now, obviously, the patients with lower ejection fraction had a greater magnitude of benefit, but the p-value of interaction was not significant, meaning that all groups benefited as well. Now, did the heart failure have any um, change based on, the U, based on the GFR? So actually, if you looked at the presence of GFR and microalbuminuria, those patients who had a lower GFR actually had a 50% reduction of heart failure. Those patients with micro and macroalbuminuria, again, had an almost 50% reduction of heart failure. The use of diuretics and particularly loop diuretics seems to have an impact because obviously those are patients who have clinical hypervolemia as well. So the augmentation of the effect with the SGLT2 inhibitor was quite robust. And if you combine this with the heart failure and CV death, which was a pre-specified analysis already specified um, prior to the uh, study end, you can see that the combined endpoint is significantly reduced by 17% and heart failure alone is 30%. So, and in fact, it also looks here at initial events in blue, second events in green, and third events um, in the orange arm as well. So the meta-analysis of the SGLT2 inhibitors is also very instructive. And I'm gonna remind you that in the original MPREG outcome study, a canvas and declare the total number of patients in these studies with ejection fraction less than 40% and heart failure was only 10%. In the Virtus CV study, there were actually almost 24% of the patients had clinical heart failure and their ejection fractions were identified. So summarizing the uh, important um, CVOTs, you can see here that in terms of heart failure hospitalization, the MPREG outcome study, CANVAS, DECLARE, and VIRTUS, all of these had a significant and clinically robust reduction of heart failure hospitalization, ranging from 30 to 35%. In terms of MACE, the um, MPREG and CANVAS programs had a 14% reduction of MACE that was significant. Virtus CV had a 3% reduction, not significant. And CV death was um, seen in the Empereg outcome study with a 40% reduction of significant reduction in CV death. Now, it is very important to realize that after the analysis of these studies, it is the MACE reduction is seen only in patients who have had a prior major cardiovascular event. And with that, if a patient only has established CVD but not a prior MI, the expectation of reduction of um, a myocardial event is attenuated. Now, this is sort of a comparator of all of the clinical studies in one slide. So um, the uh, largest, of course, is the um, uh, DECLARE study, and this also included patients who did not have established ASCVD, only 40% had CVD. But you see here the difference I'm trying to highlight is that heart failure in the four initial studies were basically 10 to 14%, vertus CV 24%. The reduced kidney function arms were um, somewhere between 20 to 20% in the three major studies, but the credence being a renally focused study had 60% of patients. Now, if you take all of the studies together, again, the meta-analysis shows very clearly that whatever the agent, heart failure hospitalization was significantly reduced and a very robust 30 to 35%. Now, whether the patient had ASCVD or not, this was very important. This is important to analyze. And in fact, heart failure again is reduced whether they have coronary artery disease or do not. The renal composite endpoint was also markedly attenuated in all of these studies. And that means that you have a cardiac heart failure benefit across the board. You have a renal benefit across the board and the ASCVD benefit is, is limited only to patients who have had a prior myocardial infarction. Now, the renal outcome is very important, and I think it's very important to discuss the definition. In Virtus, they took a very difficult definition. They took renal death, dialysis transplant, or doubling of serum creatinine. And here, while it is numerically less, it appears to be statistically not so, except towards the end of the study by month 36, when the curves diverge. However, the pre-specified endpoint was actually included the other definition, which is called a clinical definition or modified endpoint, the 40% decrease in GFR and progression of microalbuminuria and change of GFR over time. Now, 
Kidney categories are actually quite complicated. And just to remember that in the Virtus CV, the patients that were enrolled were patients with a GFR less than 30 were not included in Virtus CV. However, there was a big range of patients with albuminuria as well as GFR between 60 to 45. So it encompassed a wide range of renal outcomes. And there were patients in CKD stages one to three, normal and microalbuminuric, very high risk and low risk as well. Now, if you took the actual original endpoint, which is doubling of serum creatinine, the um, event rate is reduced by 19%. If you took sustained doubling, so persistent worsening of renal function, there was actually a 35% reduction, which just didn't meet the statistical significance. On the other hand, the commonly used clinical reduction of 40% reduction of GFR, 66% reduction with a significant statistical p-value. And I think this is the important endpoint which we use in the other clinical studies such as DECLARE as well. Because of course, you're not really going to wait for the um, kidney function to become 50% and go to dialysis before you have some clinical impact. So the reality is if you take a more clinically oriented endpoint, there is a clinical difference and you see the separation of the curves at 24 months and continues to do so towards end of study. When you take the 40% decline plus transplant or death, here, whatever the category, if CKD stage one, two, or three, there is a reduction. The greatest reduction, in fact, the greatest number of patients was in CKD two. Whether you took the urine albumin creatinine ratio, a um, normal albuminuric, micro or macro albuminuric, again, there is a sustained improvement in the 40% um, reduction of GFR. And using the Kedigo CKD risk categories, again, all groups of patients benefit as well. Albuminuria becomes very important. There is clearly an attenuation of albuminuria in the overall cohort, and it goes to the pooled group of almost 23% compared to placebo. The progression and worsening of CKD by any kidney function category, either micro or normal albuminuric or normal or CKD risk, again, significantly reduced compared to the placebo arm, clearly. And more patients actually had um, regression of albuminuria with the urtagliflozin as a whole, 21% than with placebo. This is a kind of an important concept. And of course, you've seen this before, that is the flattening of the albuminuric curve is lower with the urtagliflozin than placebo and the time to change of GFR and UACR. So it's clearly nephroprotective. And we've seen this previously that the slope of decline in the placebo is 2.5 ml per minute per meter squared per year. And flattening of this means that there is protection of the kidney over time. So, so summarizing the kidney outcomes of the various definitions of uh, renal function, um, the doubling of the serum creatinine was utilized in the um, DECLARE, uh, sorry, the MPREG outcome study and Virtus CV, and, and the CANVAS and DECLARE programs use a 40% reduction. If you take the doubling, then the, there is, of course, renal benefit, but it doesn't meet statistical significance. If you use the more conventional approach of a 40% decline, then there's actually a 40% reduction across the board for all the studies indicating a significant renal protection. Now, why is a cardiologist talking about renal outcomes? Because we know that renal outcomes are tied to CKD cardiovascular death. By using a conventional standard approach of a 40% reduction of GFR plus the dialysis or death from renal causes, you see here that across the board, all of the SGLT2 inhibitors provide a very robust reduction. But when you have protection from renal worsening, we know that five times death in patients with CKD occurs due to cardiovascular death and not due to renal uh, failure. So I think it's very important for me as a cardiologist to realize that if I have an agent that protects from heart failure and protects from renal failure, I'm getting a double benefit because ultimately these patients will die of cardiovascular death and not due to renal related uh, complications as well. 
So um, in conclusion, I think we can say that the Vertis CV achieved the primary endpoint of non-inferiority for maize compared with placebo in patients with diabetes and established ASCVD. Um, there is significant evidence from the Virtus study that the CV safety of uh, cardiovascular S SGLT2 inhibitors across the board in terms of heart failure and renal endpoints in the class. The agent was associated with a decrease in the sustained 40% decline in GFR and less albuminuria and more GFR preservation over time. The CV safety data do not alter the estimates of risk for any specific safety events. They're basically all identical in terms of amputation and uh, peripheral artery disease. Meta-analyses support the current society recommendations to prioritize the use of SGLT2 inhibitors independent of glucose control in patients with diabetes with or with, um, with high risk or at uh, kidney disease as well. And I thank you for your time and your attention. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, session on the Meet the Expert uh, of the Diabetes uh, Arm of the conference. First, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Mohammed Hassanein. I'm a consultant in the chronologist um, in, in Dubai uh, Health Authority, and I have the pleasure to be in this session of the Meet the Expert with the presence of two good friends. Uh, Dr. Professor Ali Ma'amari and Professor Andrew Bolton. We'll first start with Professor Ali Ma'amari from Oman on the cardiorenal protection in diabetes. Um, uh, professor Ma'amari is a, a professor in uh, Sultan Qaboos University. He graduated from Egypt and he trained in, in UK and then he moved on to uh, Oman where he was uh, instrumental in the development of the Oman Diabetes Association, as well as the development in Sultan Qaboos in the crime department with lots of um, important engagements in uh, the uh, various in the crime and diabetes societies and research in the region. Uh, Professor Mameli will discuss with us today about the cardiorenal protection, a very important topic nowadays in the field of diabetes. Abu Saif, uh, over to you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good evening, colleagues. Happy to be with you today. And I would like uh, to thank uh, the organized committee in the Gulf Association of Endocrinology and Diabetes for their kind invitation. And also, I would like to thank my colleague, Dr. Muhammad Hassanin, for uh, the chairman of this session, for his kind words. And without further ado, I'll start my uh, presentation uh, regarding cardiorena and protection in diabetes. There is no confidence in this uh, lecture. An outline of this lecture, uh, guidelines update, a brief of SGLT1 inhibitor and GLB1 rules in diabetes management, and review of cardiovascular trial with SGL2 and inhibitor and GLB1, and then a statement summary. The guidelines, we know that colleagues' guidelines has changed since 2018 uh, to recognize the result of the, the impressive result of the cardiovascular outcome trials. And uh, according to it, uh, all, nearly all uh, the scientific guidelines uh, recognize the importance of the cardiovascular outcome trial with some molecules. And I will go today uh, initially uh, with the ADA21 guidelines. And we know that the first line therapy is metformin with comprehensive lifestyle, including weight management and physical activity. Then you decide which category is your patient. And if there is in the red side to the left, if there is indicator of high risk or established already atherosclerotic vascular disease or CKD or heart failure, then the choice is for you with two molecules. 
and you need to consider them independently of basal of baseline hemoglobin uh, for example if an hemoglobin is normal you still you need to consider these medication uh, for your patient so if there is atherosclerotic vascular disease already exist or there is indicators of high risk the choices for you to start with GLB-1 receptor agonist with profen CFD benefit. If not available, contraindicated, or there is side effect of this drug, then SGL2 inhibitor with a profen CFD benefit. A new category is in you can another category is heart failure. If the patient has heart failure, has heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and defined by a left ventricular ejection fraction less than 45%, then the choice is SGL2 inhibitor with a profen benefit in this population. The third category, if there is CKD, diabetes, kidney disease, and albuminuria, the preferable choice for in this population is SGL2 inhibitor with the primary evidence of reducing CKD regression or SGL2 with evidence of reducing CKD progression in other cardiovascular outcome trial, if not available or any or there are side effects, then you go to GLB1 receptor agonist. Suppose a patient doesn't have all these and he is in the other categories, which is the category which have three columns. If there is compelling evidence to minimize hypoglycemia, still GLB-1 receptor agonist and SGL2 are two of four choices in addition to DB4 inhibitor and TSD. If there is compelling need to minimize weight gain or promote weight loss, which are common in patients with type 2 diabetes. As we know, most of our patients either overweight or obese, and sometimes actually uh, uh, over obesity, what we call. Uh, so the choice is for you, a GLB receptor agonist with good efficacy for weight loss or SGL2 inhibitor. If the third column is the cause is a major issue, then TSD and sulfonylurea. And of course, to avoid inertia, you assess your patient response in the three, every three months to add another medication till you reach your hemoglobin A1C target. So ADA 2021, very clear statement to uh, the beneficial of Asia, add beneficial agent SGL2 inhibitor or GLB1 receptor agent agonist in high risk patient independent of hemoglobin A1C and metformin use. So, regardless of hemoglobin, even if you are reaching target hemoglobin A7, still according to this recommendation, you need to put the patient in one of these molecules if the patient got atherosclerosis, heart failure, or CKD. There are so many cardiovascular outcome after uh, it's required by all the, uh, medication of uh, lowering glucose agent by the FDA since 2008. And there are the DB4 inhibitors, GL2 inhibitor, GLB1 receptor agonist. And in this uh, session, I will do my best to cover uh, GLB1 and SGL2 inhibitors. So we know that is the glucose is filtered uh, in, in the and then it is reabsorbed again uh, in the glomerulus, then reabsorbed again in the proximal tubule. Nearly 90% will be reabsorbed from the SGL2 segment and another 10 from the SGLT1 segment. So uh, by given SGL2 inhibitor, it will bind to this receptor and will prevent this, uh, this process, leading eventually to uh, glucose and sodium secreted into the urine. Uh, so there will be diuresis, uh, natriuresis, because we are uh, excreting uh, sodium, and glycosuria, because secreting glucose, 
and also a brought decreasing a protein urea a loss of protein so that will lead with the fluid uh, decreasing the flow uh, decreasing the preload in the heart and this will de decrease the stress of the left ventricular wall and eventually will reduce the afterload also at the liver uh, these uh, molecules will stimulate the release or the of ketone bodies uh, synthesis of ketone body mainly the beta hydroxybutyrate will, which will lead to increase atp and that is will increase the myocardial uh, function and energetics in the kidney it will lead uh, to vasoconstriction of the efferent arteriole and vasodilation of uh, the efferent arteriole and that will lead to decrease intraglomerular pressure and also will lead to sodium and glucose secretion in the urine. The first trial is in Barrett trial. In this trial, actually, in Bagliflozin, as EL2 inhibitor, has shown to reduce the primary base by 14%. And we define the primary, uh, the primary outcome as death from CV causes, non-fatal myocardial infarction, or non-fatal stroke. This reduction came by reduction of cardio by 38% reduction of cardiovascular death. In addition, a secondary endpoint, there was a reduction of hospitalization of heart failure by 35%. So, in summary, in Imberg trial, three point mass was reduced by 14%, death from any cause reduced by 32%, and nephropathy was reduced by 39% and renal composite was reduced by four, significantly by 46%. Canvas program, in this program, canagliflozin, canagliflozin also arm, there was a reduction of 14% uh, of three point miss. In addition, there was rejection of hospitalization positive by 33%. In declare study, in, in declare TEMI 85, the uh, dabagliflozin has reduced uh, three, B, uh, three point mass by 7%, but that did not reach significant for superiority, and it was significant for non inferiority, which means there was no significant benefit, but also there, is, there was no harm. Uh, first is cardiovascular uh, uh, trial, which is similar actually uh, to, uh, to the Emberg study, in which ertoglifluosin also did not show a significant reduction in three point mass, and also, but it was also uh, uh, significant for non inferiority, so no uh, significant benefit, but there was no harm. Credence study, the study is specifically in patients with diabetes with chronic kidney disease, and the primary outcome is set as indistinct kidney disease or doubling of the serum creatinine level or death from renal or cardiovascular causes. And in this study, canagliflozin reduced uh, uh, the composite by 30%. In the CKD study, the primary composite out of the more than 50 estimated glomerular filtration decline in the stake in renal or cardiovascular death. And in this study, dabagliflozin reduced 39% uh, redu relative risk reduction of the primary composite outcome. The HF trial, in this trial, this is a fourth patient with reduced ejection fraction. Uh, and they were diabetes and diabetics, and with reduced also estimated glomerular filtration rate. And this study, the primary CV death, heart failure hospitalization, or urgent heart failure visit. And we could see in this trial, there was a 26% relative risk reduction 
in the baglifluzin group as compared to the placebo. The HF uh, also uh, very clearly uh, this improvement was uh, in, uh, in patient with diabetes and in patient without diabetes. So there was 27% relative reduction in no type in patient without type 2 diabetes and with 25% relative reduction in patient with type 2 diabetes. In blood reduced trial, in this was involved also patient with reduced regression fraction and estimated glomerular up from 20 up. And in this study, the composite of cardiovascular death or hospitalization for worsening heart failure. And we see in baglifluzin reduced that by 25% as compared to placebo. So in summary, uh, colleagues, uh, just to know the effect in three different outcomes in MACE, in cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure, in Bereg was positive in the three components. Canvas trial was significant in reducing MACE and reducing hospitalization for heart failure. It wasn't significant for cardiovascular death. Declare Timmy was significant in reducing hospitalization for heart failure. It wasn't significant for cardiovascular death or MACE. And similar to it, Fertis trial in was significant for hospitalization of heart failure. From the kidney composite outcome, there was different definition for the primary uh, endpoint. Uh, however, all the trials, whether Imbarek, Canvas, Declare, and Fertis, reach significant reduction in the composite according uh, composite renal outcome according to the pre-specified definition. Now we go to the GLB-1 agonist rules and evidence, and I'm sorry for this quick because they have so many studies and I need to cover them all. Uh, we know that eating food will lead to stimulation of the GLB-1 hormone from the gut, and this GLB-1 hormone will lead to stimulation of insulin and decreased glucagon from the pancreas, will reduce appetite, and will slow down digestion. However, GLB-1 is inactivated within two minutes by DDB4, uh, by DDB4 enzyme. So GLB-1 receptor agonists mimic the native GLB-1 and will have positive, will improve this outcome. So uh, the potential mechanism for, the, for GLB-1, it goes to the heart to increase the cardiac protection, and mainly work through the pancreas, uh, alpha cell decreasing glucagon secretion, beta cell increasing the insulin, decrease, increasing insulin biosynthesis, decreasing apoptosis, uh, decreasing coagulation uh, in the intestine, decreasing brost branchial lipids in fats, and other decreasing the inflammatory brain, is the decreasing appetite, increasing satiety, in blood vessel, decreasing the blood pressure in the kidney, increasing diuresis and increasing diuresis. Leader study, in this study, actually, uh, liraglutide has shown significant reduction in three mass by 13%. And that uh, benefit came from reduction of cardiovascular death with a uh, 22% reduction. There was non significant for non fatal myocardial infarction or non fatal stroke. Sustained study in which injectable weekly semaglutide has produced a 26% reduction in mass as compared to placebo. And this reduction was mainly due to decreasing non-fatal stroke. Nephropathy also, there was significant reduction in new or worsening nephropathy with hazard ratio 0.64. And this mainly come by decreasing or persistent macroalbuminuria, which is significantly 
which is the only significant in addition to new or worsening nephropathy. Rewind trial, in which this is trial, injectable weekly dulaglutide has significant effect by reducing three uh, point mass by point uh, uh, by 12 percent with b value is 0.26 and this came also like uh, uh, semaglutide by reduction in the stroke incidence for renal outcomes there was significant in the composite and this is may, mainly came from reduction of a new macroalbuminuria with hazard ratio 0.77 and b less than 0.001 no significant for renal replacement and sustained decline in glomerular filtration rate Bioneer study, uh, which is oral semaglutide, have, uh, have lower events in MACE. However, it did not reach significance for superiority, and it reached significant for non inferiority. The other study is called Harmony study, in which LB glutide also have significant reduction of mass by uh, by 22 percent however we should inform you that albiglutide is not anymore in the market and it was withdrawn in 2018. there is some specific as uh, two molecule actually there uh, the significant reduction in mass is due to reduction in stroke which is sustained study, so uh, semaglutide and rewind stud study dulaglutide. The other, they did not. Oh, and in Bionera study, they were often shouting to the right, actually, increase. Uh, there was often. Uh, so the significance is decrease in uh, risk of stroke uh, in sustained study and rewind study. So to summarize for you, my colleagues, in three mass, three point mass, that was positive, significant in leader study, sustained study, harmony, and rewind study. Cardiovascular death or hospital fever that was not significant or not reported in all the studies. Composite kidney output, kidney outcome, there was significant reduction in leader study with liraglutide. Sustain a study with semaglutide and rewind a study with dula glutide. Cardiovascular death was significant only in leader study with lira glutide. There was no significant or not reported hospital hospitalization for heart failure. Dear colleagues, I hope I was able to cover everything related to all cardiovascular outcome trial in relation to SGL2 and GLB1. And in the summary, uh, I report that both SGL2 inhibitor and GLB1 agonist are of proven benefit for patients with type 2 diabetes, and this benefit superpass the glucose control in patients with atherosclerosis cardiovascular disease. The recommendation, liraglutide, semaglutide, dulaglutide, uh, and from SEL2 inhibitor, impagliflozin and canagliflozin. In the CKD, DABA, CANA, IMBA, and all others. For heart failure, DABA, IMBA, CANA, and all other also SEL2 inhibitors. For stroke, there was significant reduction in stroke, where I'm talking about ischemic stroke, in semaglutide and dulaglutide. So I encourage implementation of the recent guideline recommendation in prioritization of this medication for at-risk patient with diabetes, regardless hemoglobin A1C. And with this, my colleague, I, with this view from Sultan Qaboos University, I thank you and best wishes uh, with the remaining part of the Congress and back 
to our chair, Dr. Muhammad Hassanin. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mahmari, for um, um, the comprehensive um, presentation. I encourage everyone to put their, qu their questions into the uh, questions and answers section. And now, as we will have the questions at the end of the session. Now we move with the second part of the Meet the Expert to the, se the section of diabetic neuropathy. And when it comes to the update of diabetic neuropathy, there's no person globally than Professor Andrew Bolton to discuss with us the latest on diabetic neuropathy. Professor uh, Bolton, I had the pleasure uh, to know him very well for many years working nearby in Manchester um, and being an eminent um, diabetologist with huge research in the field of neuropathy and other com diabetes complications, earning lots of awards and uh, uh, being the chair of the ESD and now the chair of the IDF, and as well as the, um, the foot uh, diabetes group. Professor Bolton, we look forward to your uh, discussion on updates of the diabetic neuropathy. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Always good to see you and thank you for your generous words. And it's also good to see Dr. Amamari from Oman, who I know well, and I enjoyed his talk. So you might say like Monty Python, and now for something completely different, we're moving from the kidney and the cardiovascular system down to the lower extremity. And I'll talk to you about diabetic neuropathy, mainly about painful diabetic neuropathy. Now, this is an old slide of a paper review I wrote back in 1986 looking at the classifications of uh, diabetic polyneuropathies and mononeuropathies. But today I'm going to focus almost entirely on chronic sensory motor neuropathy, the commonest variety, as I will show you. I don't have time to talk about autonomic or other neuropathies, but I will start with one case history I uh, published when I was in Miami. The first time I was in Miami when I had black hair, uh, the young assistant professor back in 1983-84. And this was a, a case which emphasizes the importance of good clinical medicine, history and examination. This patient was eventually referred to me in the Diabetes Institute in the University of Miami. And he had been to see his primary care physician a few weeks before. And he said, I woke up one morning and, and I had a bulge in my side. And you can see, looking at this picture, he did. His GP looked at him and said, well, it's probably a hernia. So he sent him to a surgeon and the surgeon examined him and wasn't sure. And he said, look, I really don't think this is a hernia. I think I'd better admit you for a few days for some investigations. So a few days later, after the barium series from the top and the bottom, uh, various endoscopies, IVP, ultrasound, the surgeon said, you know, I really don't know what's going on here, but I see you've got diabetes. So we'll ask the diabetes people to see you. Well, uh, he did, and he came to me, and you know, I said, well, tell me about this. You woke up with a bulge in your side. Did you have any problems the day before or the night? He said, well, now you mention it. When I was turning over in bed, it was a little uncomfortable. The, the, the skin was burning when it touched the sheets. So this rang the bell that this could be a polyneuropathy or a polyridiculoneuropathy. So then I examined him and he did indeed have hyperesthesia and allodynia in this region here, and he had absent abdominal reflexes on the right side. So I thought this is probably an unusual presentation of a truncal polyneuropathy. These are usually prevent, present with very severe neuropathic pain. So the one test that was needed was an EMG, and this showed fibrillations and abnormal patterns in the muscles uh, supplying these muscles here. So this was a diagnosis made by a history and an examination. And yet this patient had had tens of thousands of dollars worth of tests, even many years ago, uh, of uh, four days in hospital, et cetera. So the message here is always take a history and conduct a careful physical exam. So we know that the diabetic polyneuropathies, as you see here, are um, dying back, affecting the longest nerves. So they're dying back with symmetrical length dependent sensory motor neuropathy. And the darker red, the more involved. So this is progressive loss of nerve fibers on a distal proximal gradient. The lower limbs are more affected than the upper limbs because it's length dependent. And as you know, it's the 
uh, strongest risk factors for foot ulcers and amputations in many countries. And about 50% of those with this sensory motor neuropathy will develop some painful symptoms. And it's associated with the, the other microvascular complications. Now, the slides won't seem to move here. Let's try. Right, it's common. This is to show you how common it is. And this is a study from my friend Dan Ziegler in Dusseldorf, the Monica Cora Augsburg survey. And in this study, they showed uh, that the neuropathy was found in up to just under 30% of patients. There was a noise in people with pre-diabetes and even the control population. And you must always take this into account. I'm having trouble with my slides. They weren't. Right. This is a study we published a few years ago, or 10 years ago now. Uh, and the, this is a large study in the community. So this is a community-based study in the northwest of England of a large number of patients, mainly in primary care. And we assessed neuropathy using a modified neuropathy disability score and a neuropathy symptom score. And we found that one in three had painful symptoms and about one in five had really significant symptoms and signs. And we found that neuropathy was more common in type two diabetes, which of course is the most common by far diabetes seen in your region. And the pain was described well by Dr. Pavey in London in 1887 of being of a burning and unremitting character. So it's the clinical picture of the diabetic neuropathies is uh, one of symptoms or no symptoms. So it's a spectrum. At one end of the spectrum, you've got these people who have very painful symptoms, classic neuropathic symptoms, burning, the skin's on fire or it's freezing cold difficult to describe because the pain is different to that that they've experienced by a, a fall or a cut or a minor surgery, et cetera. And there is often allodynia, which is on examination when a non-noxious stimulus such as touch gives rise to a painful experience. Uh, worse at night. Uh, and of course, this causes marked disturbance of quality of life. In the middle, you've got some patients, a majority, who have some symptoms and some signs, but not this very severe pain. And at the other end of the spectrum, we have those at risk of foot ulcers because they've lost completely the gift of pain, but they feel their feet are fine because they have no symptoms. So it should be obvious by now why we have to screen for neuropathy because up to half of patients may have no symptoms at all. And if you don't examine the feet, you will miss the neuropathy. We've shown in several studies that the annual risk of developing a foot ulcer is five to 7% in those with established neuropathy compared to less than 1% in those with no neuropathy. This is the first ulcer. Recurrent ulcers, 30 to 50%. We need to screen for it because it's common. Over 50% of older type two patients will have evidence of neuropathy. We need to screen for it because painful symptoms can be treated. And we've also shown in a study in uh, 20 years ago, that neuropathy is a marker for generalized cardiovascular disease. So this is painful neuropathy. It's a clinical diagnosis with a history of this pain. Symptoms may be present in the absence of signs in very early neuropathy. We need to assess the severity and frequency of pain using such as a, a graphic rating scale, for example, a numeric scale. We need to assess for depression and anxiety. These are common in patients with neuropathy. And it is a diagnosis of exclusion. You know, when I was working in Miami, they all get an EMG. So they come back to see me $250 poorer for paying for this. And then it says, this is a diabetic neuropathy, likely, but I can't exclude other causes. And I said, well, I told you that. The EMG confirmed what I told you. So it's a clinical diagnosis. So what causes neuropathic pain? There are many possibilities especially in neuroma properties, for ectopic impulse generation. The dying back nerve fibers are trying to regenerate, and this gives rise to release of uh, small fiber stimulation going up and ex being expressed as pain. But also we've been interested in glycemic flux. Could something to be to do with the stability or instability of the blood glucose control? And this came when I was a, a very junior doctor in Sheffield with John Ward. And they just started home blood glucose monitoring about 1980. And I saw patients 
the first time with home blood glucose monitoring and I said, can I see your blood sugar results? And several patients said, I don't need to check them regularly because I know if my blood sugar is too high or too low, my neuropathic pain is worse. So this was a clue. Could it be something to do with that? And here is the association between blood glucose flux or instability and neuropathic pain. We know that acute painful neuropathy, acute neuropathy can follow periods of metabolic instability. We know that painful symptoms can improve with stable near normal glycemia and in experimental models, hyperglycemia reduces pain thresholds. So a sudden improvement of blood glucose control can precipitate neuropathic pain such as insulin neuritis, but it's now caused uh, therapy-induced neuropathy. And we've reported acute worsening of painful symptoms after a pancreas transplantation in people with diabetic nephropathy, simultaneous pancreas kidney, and you get sudden improvement of blood uh, glucose control leading to worsening of painful symptoms. And in an early study published nearly 40 years ago and done 40 plus years ago, we showed that periods of Stability of blood glucose control in the early days of continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion was associated with reduction of the uh, neuropathic pain on a graphic scale, 10 being the highest, baseline seven down to two after four months of stable control. But we weren't able to prove that then. So 20 years later, we, in Manchester, we did a study with the advent of continuous glucose monitoring. And we were able to see if blood glucose flux instability swings from high to low was associated with more neuropathic pain. In this study, we took type one diabetic patients, all of them had neuropathy and all of them had a similar deficit on neurologic exam. But half had painful symptoms and the other half had no painful symptoms. And in those days, we had the early 20 years ago, the mini med, um, Medtronic glucose sensor, and we were able to monitor their blood glucose or tissue glucose control. This is, if you remember the early model 20 plus years ago, uh, and this measures tissue glucose levels every three minutes for 72 hours. Here is an example of a sensor report of 24 hours of a patient with pain less neuropathy. And you see, uh, if you're in milligrams, that's 180 milligrams, 90, and that's 360 milligrams per cent. These are millimoles, and the squares are the patient's blood glucose tests. And these correlate very well with the tissue glucose continuous monitoring. But what you see in here is the control is not brilliant, but it's not too bad, and it's pretty stable. As it says in the essays you wrote as medical students, compare and contrast. Here's a patient with painful neuropathy, and you see a completely different pattern with swings from high to low uh, and all over the place and poorer control. So what we showed is in those that painful neuropathy, there were many more uh, fluctuations to hyperglycemia, and not shown here, but also to hypoglycemia. Overall, the mean blood glucose was worse in the 24 hours or 72 hours, and those are painful compared to painless. And the flux, the M value fluctuation from the mean, was more than twice as high uh, in those with painful neuropathy. So it may be that the first step in the management of painful neuropathy is trying to stabilize. It may be the stability that matters more than the actual level you achieve. Don't do it suddenly, improve the blood glucose control because you can make neuropathic symptoms worse. So when I was in Miami again, full time, uh, I had to, well, I didn't have to, <laughs> I was asked to and accepted to write this statement or technical review on diabetic somatic neuropathy uh, with, uh, you'll know Riaz Malik, who used to work with me and did his PhD with me now, Professor, he may be speaking at this meeting in, uh, in Doha uh, and with other colleagues from the United States. I have to say, this was like writing a thesis. It ended up as uh, more than 100 pages or 30 plus printed pages. And this was followed by the first position statement on diabetic neuropathy that uh, I co-chaired with Arthur Vinick. Uh, and the summary here, of this is the summary from the ADA position statement 2005, that diabetic neuropathy is a diagnosis of exclusion of other, other non-diabetic causes of neuropathy, of which there are many, that tight glycemic control, we know from DCCT and UKPDS and other studies, 
is the oven only proven preventative therapy. All patients with type 1 diabetes should be screened for neuropathy after five years and annually thereafter. But remember that type 2 diabetes, because of the asymptomatic hyperglycemic period of many years prior to diagnosis, can present with neuropathy. We were one of the centers in UK PDS. 13% of patients at diagnosis had neuropathy of sufficient severity uh, to lead to risk of foot ulcers. So we need to screen patients with type 2 diabetes annually from diagnosis. And the clinical history and examination of the essential parts, quantitative sensory testing and electrophysiology may be useful in some cases. And that there are a number of evidence-based therapies available for symptomatic neuropathy. Now, the ADA asked me to chair the next position statement published in 2017, uh, but I said we need some, we need some you know somebody younger to take the chair uh, co-chair with me. And Rodica Popbrashuri, originally from Timisoara in Romania, now senior professor and assistant director of research at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, she took the lead and co-chaired that with me. And we had three uh, neurologists and three diabetologists on board, including Riaz, as you see there, looking very young. So this was the position statement of the American Diabetes Association. This is the most recent one. And we looked at various objectives, which I won't go through them all today, but I'll focus mainly on management of pain. But first, to teach simple and sensitive and cost-effective diagnostic steps for patients to diagnose neuropathy. There are all sorts of expensive tests you can do, but we said we don't need any of those for clinical neuropathy management. And our neurologists and diabetologists, we were all in agreement. We need simple clinical tests of vibration, reflexes, of pressure, of pain, et cetera. And then of course, we have different levels of severity. And this is a myelinated fiber density and serial nerve biopsies. Uh, and normal, you can see the progressive loss of myelinated fibers here. So progressive loss of nerve fibers. Uh, and it's shown here in a distal proximal gradient. The large myelinated fibers, uh, are of course, the motor fibers, and also those conducting the um, proprioception and vibration perception and dorsal columns. And the diagnostic tests here, if you need, to confirm would be nerve conductions and quantitative sensory testing, but these are not necessary in day-to-day -day practice. The small fibers, the small unmyelinated fibers you see here, uh, these uh, conduct the sensations of pain and temperature. Historically, this can be invisible. So for clinical trials and research, of course we need more uh, accurate diagnostic tests, but you know, most of these, including vibration, um, quantitative sensory testing. Uh, uh, these are complex psychophysical tests and rely on the patient's concentration. So there is quite a variability. And this is one of the problems we have. And the, the take home message is that diabetic neuropathy can be easily diagnosed using an appropriate history and targeted physical examinations with simple instruments. Now it was Corrigan famous for the Corrigan sign, the collapsing pulse of aortic incompetence, the Irish physician whose bust stands in the Royal College of Surgeons in Dublin. He said these words, the trouble with most doctors is not that they don't know enough, but they do not see enough. They look, but they don't see. And you don't need a lot of tests to tell you that this is a neuropathic high-risk foot. This is moderate to severe neuropathy. You can see here this pays cavus, the high arch here, prominent metatarsal heads, cloying of the toes, dystrophic nails, and you can't quite see here, but small muscle wasting. So the clinical exam is so important. So we assess for neuropathy using monofilaments, vibration, pinprick, ankle reflexes, and you can use a composite score, occasionally QST and electrophysiology. The last objective of the position statement was to discuss evidence-based recommendations for pain management. Treating neuropathic pain. The FDA approved drugs are pregabalin and duloxetine. Tepentadol has come under suspicion. It didn't do very well in the recent systematic review. And of course it is an opioid and I'll come back to that. So both duloxetine and pregabalin have level A evidence, multiple randomized controlled trials and meta-analyses 
to support their use in the treatment of neuropathic pain. They're both licensed, FDA and the European Medicines Association, and they're both recommended as first-line treatments by the European Federal of, uh, Federation of Neurological Societies, and they're both recommended by NICE in the UK. The results of the COMBO trial combining the two were really not very conclusive. Look, you might be interested to see this paper just published uh, a few months ago. This naltroxone is a competitive opioid receptor antagonist. It was compared with amitriptyline in a randomized RCT, and it actually showed uh, it was equally good with fewer side effects. Now, to use an opioid uh, receptor antagonist is interesting, but of course, I just show you this for interest. It needs further confirmation in larger studies. Opioids have come into uh, a bad press recently, and as you know, there are major lawsuits going on in the United States against the manufacturers of these drugs uh, for their side effects and deaths in people with painful neuropathy and other conditions. So I think we need to be very careful and we don't advocate the use of opioids routinely and probably should only be used by a pain specialist. More recently, we've had the capsaicin uh, patch. And here is a, a, a meta-analysis, a post hoc analysis rather of two large studies by Rainer Freinigen from Germany, who is well known in this area, and to see if these patches work. And they do work, but some people may need recurrent applications of these patches, which are long acting. And most recently in a paper just published this year again, is high frequency, that's 10 kilohertz, spinal cord stimulation. And this is a study, a randomized controlled trial published in JAMA Neurology, uh, suggesting in 216 patients that this is a highly efficacious treatment. Now it is of course invasive, only for severe painful neuropathy, not responding to the other agents. But I think this is something, and there are other studies ongoing that we need to be looking at. It may well be safer than opioids. Uh, and in this study, there were only really very minor side effects, despite the invasive nature of this. And this has to be done, of course, by a specialist, usually a, a pain specialist, an anesthetist or anesthesiologist, whatever you want to call them, uh, or even a, a neuro neurosurgeon. So here's the algorithm from the most recent physician statement. Is this pain due to diabetic neuropathy exclude other causes? If it is, assess comorbidities, potential for adverse events and adverse uh, events with the drugs we might use, especially considering that many of these patients are elderly. So be careful what you choose. First choices can be the voltage-gated uh, alpha-2 delta ligands, such as pregabalin and gabapentin. Gabapentin, remember, you need three times a day in a high dose. But be stepwise up, up, up titration, not sudden. You might use the SNRI inhibitors such as duloxetine, or I think there's still a place in some people for drugs such as amitriptyline, but not in older patients or those with a cardiac history. If patients can tolerate these, they're still effective drugs. If there is no clinically meaningful effect, we might switch to another agent, try combining, or be very careful with drugs such as tramadol or tepentadol or other drugs uh, which have been proven in neuropathy but are opioids. Don't hesitate for severe cases to refer to a pain clinic. So this, let's end uh, with this um, the Chinese quotation, superior doctors prevent the disease. We can prevent neuropathy by good glycemic control from diagnosis, especially in type one. Mediocre doctors treat the disease before it is evident. Uh, inferior doctors treat the full blown disease. Let's try and move at least from mediocre to be superior doctors. And finally, let me remind you that our IDF Virtual Congress is focusing on uh, diabetes complications. It's open for registration. We have three parallel streams, one of which is on neuropathy and foot problems. We have a dedicated stream on COVID-19 and diabetes, and we will be launching the IDF Atlas, which is the up-to-date data on the prevalence of diabetes globally uh, on the first day of the conference, when we will have a special centenary insulin celebration symposium. So we look forward to, uh, in quotes, seeing you. And the last real big meeting I went to was actually in Dubai.
uh, I remember last February, and perhaps it was an ominous sign that I was lecturing on February the 29th, which only occurs every four years. But I do sincerely hope I meet many of my friends in the Middle East before uh, two or three years from now, and I'm sure we will next year. Uh, thank you very much, Shukran, and nice to see you, Mohammed. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, if I would ask Dr. Uh, Mamari to join us for the Q&A session, uh, let me start with questions to um, uh, uh, Professor Bolton. I know that you need to go to another meeting soon. So um, uh, one of the questions coming through is asking about the role of uh, pregabalin and uh, duloxetine. Are they only for controlling pain or do, you, do, or do they prevent future pain? Do they uh, affect the outcome, um, long-term outcome of yeah. neuropathy? Unfortunately, these, these are effective agents, but they are purely symptomatic treatments. They have no effect whatsoever on the natural history of the disease. And of course, no drug is without a side effect. So we always start at a low dose, for example, 75. Or if there's renal dysfunction, be very careful with pregabalin, even lower dose. And up titrate very gradually. Most okay, people okay. need 150 or 300 BD. Seven, and the same seven, with duloxetine, start low and build up. Seven. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Uh, another question to you. Um, one of the attendees is uh, asking about the old um, policy of four different drugs, starting with um, uh, Tegritol, Trental for, for vasodilatation, uh, uh, vitamin B complex, and amitriptyline. Uh, is that what you would do, or would, how would you start um, the, the, the therapy for a painful neuropathy? Well, first of all, uh, let's dismiss vasodilators. Uh, I was at my x-ray conference yesterday looking at neuropathic feet, and virtually every patient has vascular calcification or thickening. So we know that vasodilators don't work in diabetic neuropathy. There's no good evidence to support their use. That's the first thing. Tegretol, one uh, trial many years ago uh, showed some benefit. But again, these drugs have side effects. Amitriptyline, a useful drug. Uh, and the other one you mentioned was, uh, what was the other one? You can't um, remember either. <laughs> vitamin B and uh, amitriptyline. Yeah. You see, okay, if you're living in sub-Saharan Africa, you have a number of people who are malnourished. But I think in our countries, people are not malnourished, they're the opposite. And we rarely have bit vitamin B deficiencies. Okay, if you're on long-term metformin, worth checking the, the B12, but we rarely see B12-induced neuropathy on metformin. On my phone. <clears throat> uh, you've hinted, Andrew, to the glucose variability, and uh, we sometimes specifically, I don't know whether how frequent you've seen this, newly diagnosed diabetics where they are significantly hyperglycemia and then they suddenly start to complain of pain, insulin neuritis. Yeah. Um, how, how should you treat this? Is it just a matter of time and it will settle? or should they start also uh, treatment for painful neuropathy? Yeah, I mean, painful neuropathy due to therapy, it's been reported by Max Allenberg in the 1950s with sulfonylureas as well. So it's not the insulin, it may well be the insulin, but it may be endogenous, stimulated by sulfonylurea, it may be insulin. And the same with pancreas transplantation, but you can't do much about it in those, you're not gonna take the pancreas out once you've had a transplantation. So this is usually very severe, pain, worse at night, disturbed quality of life. But the natural history is that it usually the symptoms resolve within a year. What I would do in someone who you've suddenly improved the control, what I've done, and there'll never be proof that I'm right or that I'm wrong, is actually reduce the insulin, let the blood sugar let it run a bit higher, and then gradually reduce it. It's the speed of reduction. And we believe that it's sudden improvement leads to reduction of nerve blood flow, which is increased in hypoglycemia and leads to localized ischemia, which brings on the pain. So gradually reduce the sugar. And if I've seen a lady, she came in, you know, she'd been, blood sugars were running and I don't know if you're in millimoles or milli, millimoles, say 20 or something. And they suddenly improved and they're all suddenly around four to seven or below 100 milligrams per cent. And she got this most terrible neuropathic pain. I halved the insulin dose gave us some pregabalin, you do need to treat the symptoms, but it's usually transient. The danger in our country, as you saw, Mohammed, is people get started on a drug, you get a repeat prescription, and 10 years later, they're still on it. Yeah. You review it after six months. 
Yes. Polypharmacy, the best doctor is he that reduces therapy, not increases it. I cannot see Dr. Ayan Mamari with us, so I'll move to... I, 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 I'm with you. Oh, great. So, Dr. You? Ali... Um, you were just agreeing uh, with that. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to see you and to listen to you, actually. I'm Thank pleased you. to be with you, actually, with Dr. Mohammed Hassan in this session. Happy. Thank you very much. Um, um, yes, so there's a question to you, Dr. Ali, about SDL2 inhibitors, specifically about canagliflozin. Um, from the evidence, I've, I know that you've presented the information, but the, this, the person asking the question perhaps missed this. Does canagliflozin have evidence for cardiac protection as well or not? Oh, yes, 14% result. It is the second one after imbagliflozin. Very clear cut, actually. And uh, the only issue with the uh, canagliflozin, actually, when it came, that issue of uh, amputation and that really reflected for this drug. And it was removed now from, uh, from uh, that box regarding the, the foot amputation uh, exceeding in, in patient with canagliflozin. But canagliflozin, one of the strong drugs, and credence also to, to prove again to say, it's not only reduced the albuminuria, it's also reduced the uh, hospitalization for heart failure. And so uh, to just reiterate what you presented, DAPA, EMPA, and CANA, the three are yeah. uh, with very good evidence. Yeah. So at least we have three in this in same category. So another question to you is regarding to the GLP-1. If someone is asking if the patient is not losing weight, and we know these drugs are expensive, would you switch to another drug or what would you do? Not losing weight. Uh, it depends what what is the hemoglobin in what C level. I would like to know also if this is improved or not improved. If both, because in diabetes we don't look only to to one one category, which is the weight, but also we look to the hemoglobin in one C and the other factors and and whether the patient has ischemic heart disease risk or doesn't have because this uh, the category in which you prescribe this uh, it's not only for weight reduction now if it's not their weight is remaining the same and he doesn't have ischemic heart disease and he is uh, not controlled in uh, hemoglobin one c i probably i look for other other molecules and probably i go for a cl2 inhibitor um, andrew if i if i were to ask you about two quick drugs um, uh, what, one, one of the attendees is asking about alpha lipoic acid. I just replied to that in the chat box. Um, oh, it's, we, it's not available in this country, but there is evidence that it may be helpful and it's an uh, antioxidant and there is logic for using it. It also may have some protective effect on progression of neuropathy if given in the early stages. The other question was gabapentin. We know pregabalin preceded yeah. gabapentin, but if pregabalin is not available, um, I suppose that would be good is, enough. Is, is equally good as amitriptyline with fewer side effects. But uh, the problem is that the average dose in the trials was around 1.8 to 2.2 grams a day. And I see, I used to see patients in Miami, you know, 300 twice a day. I mean, you might as well give them a placebo. You need a good dose. And it's three times daily dosing. That's the problem. But it's still a useful drug if you can tolerate it. I've noted in your presentation, Andrew, that you've mentioned several times the, the pain specialists, uh, which unfortunately are not in abundance in our region. Um, do you want to uh, comment on the role of the pain specialists in the, in the severe painful neuropathy yeah. cases? I think that we, we have a pain service in our teaching hospital and that's run by an anesthetist who has an, an interest in pain management. And the, this guy does the, for example, the spinal cord stimulation insertion of the leads. And these, uh, they have a team with a psychologist. And you no, know, I think they're very useful because complex assessment of these people with very severe neuropathic pain is absolutely essential. But, you know, in some regions such as yours, it may be a neurologist with an interest in peripheral neuropathy might be a specialist on pain that might be helpful if you're really stuck as a diabetologist. Um, I think we've covered all the questions. It's been a very interesting, um, session on Meet the Experts. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Andrew Bolton very much and uh, my very good friend, uh, Professor Alin Mamari as well uh, for their uh, excellent session. And um, to stick to time, we we'll close the session now. We'll and see you we'll all tomorrow. To close it. <laughs> the next thank you very much. Bye. A pleasure. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Very much. Thank you.
We are online. Can we start? Yes, please. Okay. Good evening, all, and welcome to the last plenary lecture of the day, and that's entitled Targeted Therapy in Advanced Thyroid Cancer. My name is Abdul Rauf Al Mahfoud, and I'm a consultant endocrinologist at King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center in Riyadh. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight's plenary lecture, who is Dr. Ali Zahrani, somebody I know for over 30 years and who I worked with for over 20 years. Dr. Ali Zahrani does not need further introduction. He is very well known locally and regionally in the field of thyroid cancer. He's currently consultant endocrinologist at uh, King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center and a professor at Al Faisal University. He's also an executive director of our research center, and he has a very active 20 years in the field of thyroid cancer. He published over 50, 150 peer review articles and has given over 200 lectures regionally and internationally. His interests are in academic interests are clinical and molecular research in the areas of thyroid cancer and endocrine genetics. Uh, not to forget to mention that he was editor in chief in our, of our journal, uh, Annals of Saudi Medicine, and was in the editorial board of the Thyroid Journal and the academic editor in the Plus One Journal. Today, he's going to talk to us about an important topic, which is targeted therapy in advanced thyroid cancer, an important topic for our thyroid cancer patients who, who for a few years ago, had nothing to turn to when the, the, when the time comes to RAI refractory stage. So without further ado, the virtual floor is yours, Ali. Thank you very much, Adar uh, Do you hear me well first? All right, uh, so thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you today about uh, targeted therapy in thyroid cancer. I'm very pleased to be here and I would like to thank the organizing committee for um, choosing me to give this uh, topic. So I have nothing to disclose and uh, the outline of my talk tonight will be uh, a little bit of epidemiology and background and uh, briefly describe the standard management of thyroid cancer but we will focus on the genetic underpinning of uh, thyroid cancer that has led to major advances in the targeted therapy. And if we have time, we'll look at some future projections. So we, you all know that thyroid cancer has been increasing in its incidence over the last three to four decades. And there is no question that this is uh, related uh, in, in part at least to the widespread use of imaging techniques but there is some data suggesting that there is a genuine increase in thyroid cancer. Now, the good news, as you can see on the top of this slide, is that the, the five-year survival and the 10-year survival is excellent. This, this data is from uh, SEER data in the United States, and you can see that the five-year survival is 98 points percent. And the mortality has been always uh, low and consistently low, despite the increasing rate of uh, thyroid cancer. So we all know that differentiated thyroid carcinoma comprises around 90% of thyroid cancer. The other 10% is divided between um, anaplastic thyroid carcinoma and medullary thyroid carcinoma, and sometimes some other rare cancers. The overall 10-year disease-specific survival is excellent, as we just mentioned, more than 95%. And we know that the modern uh, management for thyroid cancer these days is actually uh, lobectomy or uh, total thyroidectomy, depending on the risk of the patient, uh, and uh, selective use, more selective use these days of iodine-131 in the intermediate to high-risk patients. So with this management, we achieve around 98% five-year survival. However, somewhere between 10 to 15% of patients have metastases, and a good percentage of them, they have progressive metastases. Here is a patient that uh, I'm talking about, where you see on the left side, iodine whole body scan, and there is nothing there. But you can see clearly in the middle, extensive lung metastases. And you can see this clearly on the CT scan on the right side. 
this is the subject of today. I'm not going to discuss the management of the usual patients that we uh, usually cure them with, uh, with surgery and plus minus radioactive iodine. We're talking about, uh, about 10 to 15% of patients who have very aggressive disease that leads to uh, major morbidity and uh, not uncommonly morbid mortality. So talking about the distant metastasis, as I mentioned, about 10% have distant metastasis at, uh, at presentation. In our series, 13% of our patients present with distant metastasis. 6 to 20% recur at distant sites. And the overall disease-specific survival for patients with distant metastasis is only 50%. So the 90% uh, or 98% that we see in, uh, in, in overall patients is not seen in patients with distant metastasis. Only 50% overall disease-specific survive. And actually, two-thirds of those patients with distant metastasis, they de-differentiate. De in other words, they lose the ability to take up iodine. And this subgroup uh, is really uh, the highest risk group, those patients that 10 year disease specific survival is only 10 to 20%. This data is coming from France, from uh, the Institute uh, Gustave Rossi uh, of 444 patients with distant metastases. And as you can see in this Kaplan Meier curves, uh, patients who retain the ability to take up iodine on the upper, uh, upper curve they do much better than those who lose the ability to take up iodine. Those who lost uh, iodine affinity, they don't do well at all. You can see that their five-year survival is in the range of 15 to 20%. So this is one of the major uh, uh, flags when we see patients with distant metastasis uh, telling us that they will not do well and we have frequently to look for other options for them because we lost one of the most important tools to treat those patients, i.e. I-131. And that brings us to this term that was introduced in the ATA guidelines in uh, 2015, radioactive iodine, refractory, progressive thyroid cancer, abbreviated sometimes as RARE, R-A-I-R. Uh, previously, this was called uh, generally TG positive scan negative disease, but now the term is radioactive iodine refractory progressive thyroid cancer. And this is the type of thyroid cancer that needs usually targeted therapy. So what is rare or radioactive iodine refractory differentiated thyroid cancer? Again, this was defined in the guidelines as structurally evident differentiated thyroid cancer. Uh, that is seen in patients with appropriate TSH stimulation and a pro uh, uh, proper iodine preparation in four basic ways. Either the disease uh, never concentrate radioactive iodine from the beginning, or it has lost the ability to concentrate radioactive iodine, or you see some lesions taking up iodine and others do not, or finally, you see a good uptake on the scan, but the disease is progressing structurally and anatomically. So those four criteria, at least by the guidelines, are the definition of radioactive iodine refractory differentiated thyroid carcinoma. So what is the recommendation for this type of disease? The recommendation that you should not uh, continue to give those patients radioactive iodine uh, because uh, essentially it's ineffective and this is, as you can see at the bottom, a strong recommendation. So what are the options for those patients? Uh, there are many options. However, one of the options is targeted therapy, uh, but uh, targeted therapy is not without risks and with, without side effects, major side effects. And therefore, the recommendation to treat those patients with rare or radioactive iodine refractory uh, thyroid cancer is if they have oligometastatic uh, distant uh, disease and it can be resected, surgery is still an option for those patients, even with distant metastasis, if it can be resected. TSH suppression is very important in this group of patients if they have differentiated thyroid carcinoma. Uh, if, there are, uh, if there is an uptake of radioactive iodine, then radioactive iodine remains an option for differentiated thyroid carcinoma. If they are stable, despite the fact that they have distant metastasis, observation is a good option for those patients. 
Again, if there is a, a lesion that is causing trouble and it can be resected or irradiated or uh, destructed in some way, permal ablation or immobilization, that's also uh, a good option for those patients. For patients with uh, skeletal metastases, esfisphenate or donosumab are good option for those patients to maintain their skeleton. And there is some soft data suggesting that they even lead to some regression of the tumor or at least stabilization of the tumor. If all of these fail or are not feasible options and the patient is having progressive disease, this is when we start to think about kinase inhibitor or multi-kinase inhibitors. And you can see here on the right side, uh, the indication to use uh, tyrosine uh, kinase inhibitors include failure of alternatives to systemic therapy and acceptable performance status. The patient should be in good shape to tolerate those toxic drugs. And one of the following, symptomatic disease or disease that's threatening vital structures like the spine or the brain or major fissile or clinically significant disease which is rapidly progressive or in the case of medullary thyroid carcinoma particularly, they tend to have paraneoplastic uh, features, including sometimes uncontrolled diarrhea or Cushing syndrome, and that's also an indication. So you can see from this pyramid that, uh, is, that was published in a very important review article in endocrine revision just two, two years ago, that the decision to use tyrosine kinase inhibitors should not be taken lightly and uh, should only be used in patients that are more likely to benefit than to be harmed of, by those drugs. And this comes, of course, with experience and, uh, and with assessment of patients uh, uh, case by case. So here is a patient who has widespread metastasis to the skeleton, lung, brain, and uh, uh, the question, what could we have uh, provided this patient with 10 years ago in 2010? And the answer is nothing more than thyroid hormone suppression. But today, 10 years later, in relatively short period of time, we have so many options for this patients. On the top of them is tyrosine kinase inhibitors that we will discuss in a minute. So the field has, uh, has gone through dramatic changes in the last uh, uh, 10 years and um, uh, is likely to continue to show um, major advances in, in the treatment of this, such patients. So uh, what can we offer this patient? So you can see on this, uh, in this diagram, several multi-kinase inhibitors that were not there 10 years ago. None of this was familiar to any of uh, the people treating patients with thyroid cancer. Now you can see that we cannot keep up with the, with the, with the number or the, or the names of those drugs. And uh, that's, that is related to our understanding of the molecular pathogenesis of thyroid cancer. So in this diagram uh, from, again, a very important review article that was published early in the course of this uh, advancement in 2013 by Brian Hogan and Stephen Sherman, uh, two prominent thyroidologists, you can see that in the left side, this is a tumor cell. On the right side, you have vascular endothelial cell. And what you see inside the tumor cell is two important pathways. On the right side, you have the MAP kinase that start with tyrosine receptor kinase, uh, which stimulates RAS and RAS activate BRAF, BRAF activate MEC, and MEC activate ERK and ERK activate number of transcription factors inside the nucleus, okay. leading to proliferation, invasion, tumor formation, a metastasis, and so on and so forth. The same thing on the left side here, you have the BI3K AKT mTOR pathway, and it has basically, uh, it shares actually with the MAP kinase, the RAS, and the tyrosine kinase receptors on the cell surface. You can see also other uh, uh, drivers, including many tyrosine kinase receptors, RET, whether it's mutated with single point mutation or with fusion protein. You can see epidermal growth factor, MET, on the, on the vascular endothelial cell, which is thought to also play a major role in the pathogenesis. You have multiple tyrosine kinase receptors, PEGFR, vascular endothelial growth factor, epidermal growth factor. More important than all of this, you can see that we have now several inhibitors to essentially any of those mediators. 
Some of them are very specific, like deprafenib and fumarafenib, which specifically inhibit BRAF, silumatinib, tramatinib, are specific inhibitor of MEK, but some of them are multi-kinase inhibitors. They block more than one target. For example, you can see sorafenib here, and here, and here, and lymphatinib, the same thing. So we actually have two groups of kinases, specific kinases, sometimes referred to as monokinases, uh, and multi-kinases, which inhibit more than one target. Now, uh, thanks to uh, people who were working for the last two decades to define the molecular uh, genetics of thyroid cancer. This is a very important study that uh, was published in Cell in 2014. This is part of the Cancer Genome Atlas that defined actually the genomic landscape of well-differentiated, well-differentiated papillary thyroid cancer and included around 498 cases of well-differentiated. And as you can see here, we have many, many mutations. Uh, I will summarize them in a minute for the sake of time, but you can see BRAF is the prominent player here. RAS mutation, RIT rearrangement, third promoter mutation, and B53 is only uh, less than 1%. We have also in the lower panel, down here, fusion protein, red PTC, uh, NTRK fusion protein, BRAF uh, fusion protein, and so on and so forth. The story is complicated and uh, that this needs a lecture by itself, but I'm just showing you the highlights. So the question uh, is that we have now known uh, to a great extent the molecular genetics of well-differentiated papillary thyroid cancer. So what about poorly differentiated thyroid cancer and anaplastic thyroid carcinoma? And this came only two years later in 2016 in this uh, article that was published by the group in New York led by Jim Spagan. What you see on the left side here is the poorly differentiated thyroid cancer, around 85 cases. And on the right side, anaplastic thyroid carcinoma, around 30 plus cases. And uh, the, the molecular genetics are different from the well differentiated. You can see TERT promoter mutation and B53 are the main players. TERT around 40% in the poorly differentiated and 73%, 73% in anaplastic. B53, which is a very bad mutation, occurs in around 8% of poorly um, uh, differentiated and 73% of anaplastic. We have also BRAF and NRAS. We have red PTC and BAX8 PAPR gamma rearrangement. We have some histone modifiers and epigenetic uh, uh, players. Uh, the story is again very complicated and I don't have time to explain everything, but I want to summarize the main, um, again, players of uh, pathogenesis in, in thyroid cancer in general. So on the left side, you see the mutations in papillary thyroid cancer. The main thing, the main one is BRAF and red PTC. Uh, small per percentage, they have RAS mutation and then the others are very rare, except third mutation around 10%, 11%. In follicular thyroid cancer, RAS mutations and BAX8 PPR gamma are the main players. In poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma, we start to see a lot of TERT promoter mutation, B53 around 24%, and then RAS mutations. In the anaplastic thyroid carcinoma, the most aggressive one, B53 uh, stands up as a prominent player here, uh, and then beta catenin and TERT promoter mutation. Now, medullary thyroid car carcinoma is a different story. As you know, uh, red uh, point mutations are the main players, occurring anywhere between 60 to 90% of the sporadic and familial type. And around 30 to 40% of patients with medullary will have somatic mutation in RAS uh, gene. So again, this understanding of the molecular genetics of thyroid cancer in general led to uh, understanding of, uh, of, the, of the therapeutics, how to handle all of this. And this is another uh, representation of, uh, of the molecular genetics and the, the, the uh, 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 drugs that we can use for this. So this is again a tumor cell. On the left side, you have immune cell, the T lymphocyte. On the right side, you have vascular endothelial cell. So again, the MAP kinase and the BI3 AKT pathway and the multiple uh, kinase inhibitors that we can use, either a specific one like the and fimorafenib, tramatinib, and selumatinib for MEK, 
or multi-kinase inhibitors, including sorafenib, fendatinib, cabozantinib, bazobinib, sonatinib, lymphatinib, and so on and so forth. We have also some specific inhibitors of RET, like LOTSU-292 and BLUE-667, we will discuss them. Specific inhibitors of NTRK, larotrectinib and intractinib. What happened in the last three, four years is exploitation of additional targets. And one of them is actually the immune system, immunotherapy. And as you can see in this diagram, you can see interaction between the tumor cell and the T lymphocyte. And this interaction happens through cell surface receptor, BD1, BDL1, uh, which inhibits actually the T lymphocyte. So this interaction leads to basically inhibition of the immune system. If we interfere here using immunoglobulin like this, then we release the T cell from this um, uh, tumor immunosuppression, and that leads to basically activation of the immune system, killing of the tumor cell, and uh, basically immunotherapy, one form of Im immunotherapy. You can see also additional things that we can, can do. We can reactivate again uh, NES, which is the sodium iodine symporter, to change this tumor from radioactive iodine refractory to radioactive aphid. Uh, we are, there are some studies now that are basically exploring the possibility of using the somatostatin receptors, which are present actually even in differentiated thyroid carcinoma and utilizing BRRT therapy, lutetium-177 or yttrium-90. So I think the field is expanding in a very fascinating way, and we are likely to see uh, uh, tremendous uh, uh, progress in the next uh, five years. Let's now uh, focus on the, on the uh, drugs that are in uh, use and approved by FDA. So what are the available drugs for metastatic thyroid cancer? We have two drugs for, uh, from 2013-2015, sorafenib and lymphatinib for radioactive iodine refractory differentiated thyroid cancer and bully differentiated thyroid cancer. And most recently, this is around two weeks ago, uh, cabozantinib was added to this list. So now for DTC or uh, bully differentiated thyroid cancer, which is rapid progressive and radioactive iodine refractory, we have the luxury of using sorafenib, lymphatinib, and if they fail, we use cabozantinib as a second line therapy. For medullary thyroid cancer, we have also two FDA-approved uh, drugs, fendatinib and cabozantinib. And in the last year, we had four new drugs, actually, and they are monokinases targeting a specific target. Two of them uh, target RET oncogene when it is mutated, and that's silvercatinib and braslatinib. And two of them actually target NTRK fusion positive tumors, and that include larotrectinib and intrectinib. And I will discuss this in details. Uh, more, most maybe uh, uh, important and, and really breakthrough in the treatment of anaplastic thyroid carcinoma, which is, as you know, is the most fatal human cancer and used to be deadly within a few weeks to a couple of months, is actually uh, the introduction of BRAF inhibitor, MEK inhibitor com combination for anaplastic thyroid carcinoma that harbors BRAF P600E mutation. And this is this happens actually in around 40% of anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. So patients with anaplastic thyroid carcinoma who has this mutation now can enjoy long-term survival and, and regression of the tumor. And we'll discuss this. As I mentioned, there are many other ways to treat thyroid cancer. Most of them are still in trials and, uh, and uh, experimentation, but they are likely to be in, uh, in practice in the next few years. So let me uh, discuss uh, the first four drugs that uh, were approved, sorafenib, lymphatinib, amphendatinib, cabozantinib for differentiated thyroid cancer and medullary. I'm showing you this because this is the general scheme for uh, those trials. All of them are phase three trials. This is for Zeta study, which actually tested fendatinib against placebo. It's a phase three trial for uh, unresectable, locally advanced or metastatic uh, uh, MTC, and the randomization most of the time is two to one ratio. And this is the active drug against placebo and people look for progression-free survival. So this is the general scheme for all of those phase three trials that tested those drugs. And on the basis of this testing, FDA, FDA approved it. 
So let's look at sorafenib, limfatinib, and then cobazentinib. So this is decision trial for sorafenib. And you can see in this Kaplan-Meier curve that uh, patients who received sorafenib had much better um, survival of 11 months versus only six months for uh, a placebo. And on the basis of this, this was approved in 2013 by FDA. You can see a reduction of 40% in the risk of disease progression and death. This is selected trial for lymphatinib, the same design. The result is even more impressive. The medium progression free survival for lymphatinib is, uh, is uh, uh, 18.3 months and for placebo, 3.6 months. Uh, what about medullary thyroid cancer? We have two drugs, fendatinib, cabozentinib, the same design. This is Zeta trial for fendatinib. The progression-free survival is 22.6 months versus only 16.4 uh, uh, months. And uh, 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 on the basis of this, uh, fendatinib was approved by FDA in 2011. This is exam trial for cabozentinib. Again, you can see that um, uh, cabozentinib improved the progression-free survival from four months in the placebo to 11 months. And again, cabozentinib was approved by FDA for progressive medullary thyroid cancer. This is just a summary of what I have said, and maybe we can skip this slide. Basically, we have two drugs, sorafenib and lymphatinib for differentiated thyroid cancer, approved by FDA based on phase three trials. And medullary thyroid cancer, we have fendatinib and cabozentinib again approved by FDA for medullary progressive thyroid cancer. Then the, the, the uh, recent uh, addition is actually this drug, cabozentinib, which is used in medullary thyroid cancer since 2012, but now it is approved for use, be used, uh, for, to be used in differentiated thyroid cancer that is radioactive iodine refractory. And this was just approved in 17th of September, so around two, three weeks ago. And this is uh, uh, as a result of, again, phase three trial that is uh, randomized, double-blinded, for patients more than 16 years who were progressing on sorafenib or lymphatinib. So this is a second-line therapy. If a patient progresses on sorafenib or lymphatinib, then cabozentinib now is a second-line therapy. This is a two to one ratio uh, randomization. The primary endpoint is overall response rate and progression free survival. You can see they recruited 187 patients from 25 countries, and the overall response rate was 15% in cabozentinib and 0% in placebo. You may, you may say this is not very impressive. It is very impressive for patients who already failed two drugs and ha have no other options. The medium progression free survival is unreached in cabozentinib arm, which means it's, it's, it's working very well. And it was only two months in patients with placebo. Of course, adverse effects are common like any other tyrosine kinase inhibitors and serious side effects were even present in around 16% in cabozentinib. The again, uh, interesting addition that happened in the last year is those four drugs that we call them tumor agnostic drugs. And what does that mean? That means basically it does not matter what the histology is. What matters is what, what is the molecular uh, 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 pathogenesis? What is the underlying mutation? So if we have RIT uh, uh, gene mutation, whether it is point mutation or RIT fusion, whether it is in thyroid cancer or lung cancer or any other cancer, those drugs target that RIT and they are very effective. So most of the trials actually included number of uh, tumors and they, call, they are called basket trial because they include different uh, tumors with the same genetic alteration. And we have silvercatinib and braslatinib for RIT altered tumors. And we have for NTRK fusion protein, two drugs, larotrectinib and entrectinib. So this is the silvercatinib trial. It is phase two trial, actually. It's not placebo controlled, but it is very impressive that FDA approved the drug in November 2020. You can see that this is a New England Journal article in August 2020. I just want to again emphasize that uh, RET is altered in two ways, either rearrangement, which means basically part of RET is chopped out and replaced by uh, another segment from another gene, or point mutation, which means basically a single nucleotide in the sequence of RET is changed. 
This is common in medullary. The, the point mutation is, is classic for medullary and uh, red fusion is a classic for uh, differentiated thyroid cancer and lung cancer and other types of cancer. So this is uh, the silver catenib again, uh, a trial, and you can see here three groups. On the top here, we have uh, patients, 55 patients with medullary thyroid cancer that uh, they were treated previously with pendatinib and cabozentinib. And you can see the waterfall blot is showing you impressive result in essentially everybody except three patients on the left side. In the middle, you have 88 patients with medullary thyroid cancer progressive, but they are treatment naive. They did not receive pendatinib or cobazentinib in the past. And you can see that all of them responded beautifully. Some of them actually achieved complete response, 100% uh, disappearance actually of the tumor. And down in there, you have 19 patients with um, uh, uh, differentiated thyroid cancer. Uh, that carry red fusion protein. And again, the overall response rate is around 80%. Progression-free survival at one year is 64%. And I just want to, again, remind you where's the, the, the site of action of those uh, drugs. So the site of action, as you can see on this diagram, red is, you, is on the cell surface. So when it, is, it has a point mutation, that's where it is. When there's fusion, uh, red PTC, it is usually in the cytoplasm. So those drugs, the silpercatinib, inhibit the red oncogene, and therefore it inhibits basically all the MAP kinase and BI3 kinase and halts the whole pathogenesis of thyroid cancer. And you can see here, the results are impressive. Almost mirror image in the pralsatinib, the blue 667, Again, three groups, uh, differentiated thyroid cancer with the fusion protein 11 patients, and you can see that the overall response rate is 90%. At six months, 100% of them are responding, and everybody is showing a response on the left side here. On the right side, you have the upper panel with patients treated previously with cabozantinib or fendatinib, 53 patients, and down you have treatment naive patients, 19 patients. And again, the overall response rate is anywhere between 60% and 74%. NTRK fusion protein is another type of fusion protein. And NTRK is a, is a gene that is involved in the central and peripheral nervous system uh, function. But when it is mutated, when it is fused with another gene, it becomes an oncogene. So it, it drives the cell basically for tumorogenesis, as you can see on this diagram. And again, to show you where NTRK is, it is here, it's in the cytoplasm. When it is activated, it activates RAS, and RAS activates the MAP kinase and BI3 kinase leading to tumorogenesis, et cetera, et cetera. So what are the drugs for NTRK fusion uh, tumors? Again, uh, uh, these are number of tumor. NTRK is not specific to thyroid cancer. It occurs in multiple cancers, but for thyroid cancer, that is the subject of today, you can see it occurs in adults up to 36% and in pediatric up to 26% of patients. And if they have this fusion protein, they are lucky. They can respond nicely to those drugs. Darotrectinib is one of them. And you can see the overall response in this trial, basket trial again, 83%. And you can see down here in the waterfall plots, soft tissue sarcoma, infantile fibrosarcoma, and then thyroid, salivary, lung, and so on and so forth. And all of them show consistent response, reduction in the size of the tumor, regression of the tumors, sometimes complete uh, responses. Uh, let's just review briefly the, the, the uh, data on thyroid cancer when they have TRK fusion. Again, this is for larotrectinib. Uh, we have 28 cases, including seven patients with anaplastic thyroid carcinoma, which is, as we just mentioned, is a fatal disease. We have 19 patients with papillary and two patients with follicular. And you can see here, again, beautiful response in essentially all patients except three. All of them showed excellent response, including patients with anaplastic thyroid cancer and poorly differentiated. Some of them achieved complete re response, which means basically 100% response. Uh, let's talk about anaplastic thyroid carcinoma, which uh, used to be fatal uniformly until 2018, when uh, it was found that if it carries BRAF mutation, then patients respond nicely. This is, a, a, again, a landmark study that uh, was published in JCO uh, and is basically only 16 patients. Probably this is the smallest study in the history of FDA 
on the on the basis of which a drug is approved or or uh, two drugs in this case. So the brafenib, which is a specific inhibitor for BRAF mutation, and tramatinib, which is a specific inhibitor for MYC, were combined together to treat number of tumor that have BRAF. P600 mutation. And this is the data on anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. As you can see in the plot on the right side, everybody responded beautifully, significant response. Only one patient did not respond. And you can see one of those patients down here at baseline, large tumors. And when you go down after eight weeks of tramatinib, the brafinib, almost complete disappearance of the, of the, the tumors. Not only this, the response is durable. It starts at around two months, but you can see many patients enjoy very good response after 100 weeks. And uh, the, the latest data is actually three, four years. Uh, uh, some patients are taking the drug for three, four years and showing a consistent response. Now, we uh, mentioned earlier that uh, to start those drugs, you have to be careful. You should not uh, start them uh, lightly because of their side effects. And you can see the side effects are shared by many of them, much less common in the selective monokinases on the right side, the silvercatinib, ralsatinib, larotrectinib, and intrectinib, much less common and less risky than the multi-kinase inhibitor, the lymphatinib, sorapinib, pendatinib, and cabozantinib. But they all share those side effects of hypertension, diarrhea, skin rashes, anorexia, fatigue, weight loss, QT prolongation, hand food syndrome, uh, increased uh, 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 liver enzymes, and uh, even fiscus perforation, death, uh, hemorrhages. Uh, this is a part of a, a long list on the clinicaltrial.gov, uh, which lists uh, all the trials in, uh, in, uh, in thyroid cancer. And this is probably representing less than 20% of the trial listed there. What I want to show you is there are so many kinase inhibitors on the left side here. They are in phase one, two, three trials. There are combination of drug, a combination of therapies, including tyrosine kinases, immunotherapy. So the field is evolving at a very rapid rate and we are likely to see uh, very good uh, uh, results. In the last part of this talk, I'll just talk about additional, uh, additional opportunities to help those patients. We talked for the most part about tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and we have covered them to a great extent. But as, as there are other areas that we can use, and one of them is resensitization. Again, trying to get those tumors to take up iodine and treat with this uh, old uh, treatment med modality. We talked about uh, somatostatin receptor and using uh, uh, PRRT, and we talk about immunotherapy. So let's briefly look at the data on this. So resensitization to radioactive iodine, BRRT and immunotherapy. So the first attempt or proof of principle was uh, this article in 2013 using silumatinib, which is a MEK inhibitor to resensitize advanced thyroid cancer. This came again from uh, Jim Spagan's group where they gave patients silumatinib for four weeks 20 patients were included and they had scan before and it was negative. After four weeks, they did scan and 12 out of those 20 had positive scan. Eight of them were actually uh, had significant uptake to the extent that they were treatable with, again, with radioactive iodine and they were treated. And many of them showed stable disease or even partial response. So this was like proof of, uh, of principle. And you can see some of those images from that study, negative scan after silumatinib, very frank positivity. You can see here on the right side, again, at baseline, and then after silumatinib in the bilfus and in the skull. Uh, this is a study that came from uh, uh, Dana-Farber uh, Cancer Center in Boston, where they treated with another drug, the brafinib, which is a BRAF inhibitor. And they treated 10 patients for 28 days and then they scanned them, uh, uh, six out of 10 became positive, and then they were treated. And as you can see here, the resist uh, response was very favorable in many of them, around five of them showed partial or uh, stable disease, partial response or stable disease. This is an experience at MD Anderson of 13 patients treated either with BRAF inhibitor or MEK inhibitor, and then they were scanned out of the 13 patients, nine uh, showed positivity and were treated with radioactive iodine. And at eight months, three had partial response and six had a stable disease. 
And you can see here on the left side that um, negative scan before, positive scan after, some of them showed frank and impressive uptake. You see this patient, for example, was negative and after treatment with BRAP uh, uh, inhibitor, extensive uptake in the lungs and so on and so forth. Finally, there are case reports uh, published even in New England Journal of Medicine of patients using silpercatinib or larotrectinib for a few weeks and then changing from negative scan to positive scan. You can see this is silpercatinib, this is larotrectinib, and both of them showed excellent uptake after a few weeks. What about PRRT, the somatostatin-based therapy? Again, this is the largest study from Germany. 41 patients with rare type of tumor underwent gallium-68 dutatate PET whole body scan, and 11 patients were treatable, and they were treated with yttrium-90 dutatoc, and two of them showed partial response, five stable disease. Remember, those patients were pro having progressive disease, so seven out of 10 had stabilization or even partial response. The final thing and the most actually active area in cancer therapy in general, not only in thyroid cancer, is the immunotherapy. And there are different ways to do immunotherapy, but the checkpoint inhibitors is the most successful. And again, in simple terms, if you look, uh, look at the right upper panel, you have a tumor cell in the middle interacting with, uh, uh, sorry, you have a tumor cell on the right and left and a T cell in the middle. And there is an interaction between the tumor cell and the T cell. What the tumor cells are doing, they are inhibiting the T cell. And there are, through those mediators, you see on the lower side here, stimulatory and inhibitory. Most of the time they're using the inhibitory uh, signals. And two of the inhibitory signals are well characterized. The CTLA4, CD86 interaction and the BD1, BDL1, BDL2 interaction. And um, if we use immunoglobulin to break this cycle, the T cell becomes so active and it really uh, 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 kills the, the tumor cells. And many times it results in excellent response. And this is very advanced actually in hematological malignancy in breast cancer, colon cancer, and uh, renal cell carcinoma and some CNS. It is still in early stage in, in, uh, in thyroid cancer, but it is showing very promising results. These two scientists won a uh, Nobel Prize in 2018 for their discovery of those molecules, the CTLA4, uh, CD86, and BD1, BDL1 uh, molecules, because this has changed the field of cancer therapy. Uh, on the left side, James Addison from MD Anderson. On the right side, Hasuku Hanju from Japan. The, the, uh, the Japanese scientist uh, discovered DDL1 and the American scientists uh, uh, discovered CTLA4 and they won Nobel Prize uh, for their discovery. So some of the trials in uh, thyroid cancer, CTLA4 inhibitors, we have this study of 49 patients with aggressive types of tumors, including DTC or ATC or MTC and treating them with uh, nifilumumab or ibilimumab uh, led to actually a partial response in three, and complete response in one, including three uh, partial response in anaplastic thyroid cancer, complete response at 13 and 26 months. This is another uh, uh, anti-BD1 inhibitor, uh, sorry, bimbrolizumab, which is widely used in breast cancer and renal cell carcinoma. This is um, uh, 22 patients treated uh, in England. Uh, and as you can see, the water for blood here again is showing you that large percentage of them showed excellent response, uh, including even uh, uh, partial response in two and stable disease in 13. So significant number of them showed a stabilization or regression of their disease. Uh, another anti-BD1 uh, uh, receptor in 42 anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. And again, the waterfall plot on the right side showing you that around 40% of them showed excellent response. Finally, combination of immunotherapy with chemoradiotherapy was tried. This is an attempt in a Mayo Clinic of three patients with ATC. Initially, they showed excellent response. However, they all died. So this was like a fa failure. Uh, so to conclude, uh, uh, the field of uh, target therapy in thyroid cancer and other types of cancer uh, is progressing at a very fast rate and amazing results. The multikinase and monokinase inhibitors have uh, revolutionized the management of patients with progressive metastatic thyroid cancer.
Currently, we have sorafenib and lymphatinib for differentiated thyroid cancer and poly differentiated thyroid cancer. And most recently, cabozantinib was added to them as a second line therapy for uh, differentiated thyroid cancer that fails sorafenib and lymphatinib. For medullary thyroid cancer, we have pendatinib and cabozantinib. And for BRAF positive uh, anaplastic thyroid carcinoma, we have the combination of BRAF inhibitor dabrafenib and MEK inhibitor tramatinib. These drugs uh, definitely made major change in the quality of life and uh, progression-free survival and probably overall survival. New specific target therapy, the monokinase inhibitors are more likely to take the place of the multi-kinase inhibitors because they are even more effective and with less side effects. And we are, more, we, we are likely to see more and more of this. Many drugs and a combination of drugs, including immunotherapy, uh, including resensitization technique, including somatostatic receptor utilization, and including CAR T cells that I didn't have time to talk about it, are in the pipeline and are uh, likely to change the whole scene, not only for thyroid cancer, but for many other cancers. And with this, I'll stop. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ali, for a very uh, informative and comprehensive coverage of this subject. Um, and that brings us to the end of this plenary session. And thank you, uh, our uh, audience, for, uh, uh, for staying uh, till this uh, late hour and wish you a very uh, enjoyable and, uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, productive meeting. Thank you and good night. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you very much for staying so late to uh, share uh, with us this session about uh, the role of the adult endocrinologist in the management of x linked hypophosphatemia. And uh, I'm Salim Shia. I'm one of the endocrinologists and the YAS Clinic Khalifa City in Abu Dhabi. And I'm also a general professor in uh, Dubai Medical College for Girls. And I am also had the pleasure of and the honor of being the editor in chief of the Journal of Diabetes and Endocrine Practice, which is the official journal of the uh, association. Okay, so these are my disclosures. The session is, as you know, a sponsored session. I have no personal uh, financial interest in the company. The contents are based on peer reviewed literature and guidelines and widely accepted expert opinion. And I'll try in the coming 20 minutes or so to give a balanced review of the subject. And uh, the opinions uh, described here are based on literature and do not represent those of the employers or any affiliations. To uh, give a concise presentation, focusing particularly for the role of the adult endocrinologist, I thought uh, splitting it into four sections would be very valuable. We'll get start to start with, we'll give a reminder on the XLH as a disease, discuss the therapeutic management, and touch on practical clinical use of the active medications, and visit and finish with uh, some MENA-based uh, professional perspectives. So let us start with, as an example of a, a rare uh, condition, uh, the rare endocrine metabolic disorders represent an important area in the fields of uh, pharmacology and medicine. And in the area of endocrinology, both for adult and pediatric endocrinologists, uh, there are several rare conditions that come across or they come across it in the clinical practice. These may involve the uh, classical uh, to, uh, endocrine organs, such as pituitary gland, thyroid, adrenals, and ovaries. They may involve the paraganglia. They may actually represent a disorder of bone and mineral disease. They can be energy and lipid metabolism problems. They can be homeostasis of water metabolism. 
and also they can involve multiple organs and uh, neuroendocrine tumors. For instance, the subject of tonight, the XLH, is a chronic progressive uh, condition. It's based on the renal phosphate wasting, and it is probably the most common form of heritable hypophosphatemic rickets. Uh, classically used to be called the vitamin D resistant rickets, and this name has actually uh, attached it more to the pediatric practice rather than to the adult practice. As we'll be discussing throughout the presentation, this is a lifelong condition and is not limited to pediatric practice. The prevalence is estimated to be around 1 in 20,000 to 1 in 25,000. And if you compare it with other conditions that are more uh, near to our mind, our memories, such as uh, the classical example of osteogenesis imperfecta uh, and hypophosphatase, you can see on the right side of the slide that actually it is half the way between, uh, between the uh, osteogenesis imperfecta and hypophosphatase. So what is the mechanism of the, this disease or this disorder? There is a mutation in the phosphate regulating endopeptidase uh, homolog, which is uh, for the remainder of this presentation would be called FEX gene. This results in the increased expression of fibroblastic growth factor 23. Again, for short, we'll be calling it FGF23. This results in renal phosphate wasting and also associated low levels of the active form of vitamin D 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. Together, this will result in low levels of serum phosphorus, and these will lead to the clinical manifestations of XLH. The XLH is caused by a loss of mutation, a uh, loss of function mutation in the FEX gene, and this leads to increased circulating levels. And although the mechanism has not been fully elucidated, uh, there are uh, calculated or estimated 300 fixed mutations that have been identified in XLS patients. And about 20 to 30 percent of uh, cases of XLH are caused by spontaneous mutations. There are no known correlation between the type of the fixed mutation and the severity of the, uh, XL, uh, uh, the XLH itself. Here is the illustration of the pathophysiology of the condition. If we start, I hope you can see my mouse here. We start by the mutation. It results in increased production of the FGF23 in the bones. And this has two lines of action. Firstly, it was the intestine, whereby the decreased absorption of phosphate will occur because of the effective hydroxylation of vitamin D. And on the right side, you can see the effect on the kidneys, illustrated in more detail here in the right side of the slide, but we don't have time to discuss it in full detail. And this will increase the phosphate excretion. Together, these two lines will reduce the serum phosphate, and this will result in defective mineralization and delayed acidification of the bone. So it starts in the bone and ends up in the bone. We commonly think of excellent uh, conditions as uh, recessive conditions. However, this particular condition is actually X-linked dominant inheritance. Just a quick reminder, uh, if the father is affected, in this case, then you'll find all daughters are affected and no sons are affected. And on the right side of the slide, it illustrates if the mother is affected, then you find 50% chance of the child being affected regardless of their sex. So how we diagnose XLH? The diagnosis is typically based on clinical and biochemical findings in addition to presence of family history. However, there are variations and these variations are the root cause for the delay or the miss of, uh, missing of the diagnosis. The molecular genetics in a typical case is not required However, it has value in, in the way that if you are not sure to have the genetic uh, testing done. And also some uh, providers would request that you have a genetically confirmed condition for special treatment. 
The differential diagnosis is based on biochemical markers. I will focus only on the XLH here. The differential diagnosis naturally is the nutritional rickets or tumor induced osteomalacia. If I take this uh, from top to bottom, the serum phosphate is low. The uh, transport maximum phosphate also uh, is low. Urine phosphorus is increased. Alkaline phosphate is increased. Serum calcium is normal. PTH is normal or increased. And 125 hydroxy vitamin D is low or inappropriately normal. 25 hydroxy vitamin D is normal. And the classical biochemical diagnostic test is the FGF23 is either increased or inappropriately normal. And you can compare these with the other uh, differential diagnosis to make uh, a biochemical diagnosis. In adults, which is the subject of uh, tonight's presentation, the clinical ma manifestations may arise from the combination of unresolved uh, problems uh, that has occurred during childhood or the ongoing uh, active disease, i.e. either structural or functional uh, aspects of the disease. If you want to classify them, you can think in terms of dental problems. For instance, frequent dental abscesses, frequent uh, loss, premature loss of what we normally count uh, uh, usual loss for uh, dental uh, for, for teeth. Also, there is uh, problems with auditory uh, and early uh, hearing loss. Uh, connective tissue can be because of the extra osseous calcification leading to osteophytes and to surgery, uh, nephrocalcinosis and spinal stenosis. All of these will present with specific symptoms according to them. Uh, in adults, the experts will tell us that actually most of the presentations are related to the, this uh, square here, the musculoskeletal presentations. So the fractures, osteoarthritis, osteomalacia, uh, bone pain and joint pain and stiffness, uh, muscle pain and muscle weakness. So these are normally the presenting features in an adult population. Uh, as the title of the presentation is Lifelong Impact of X-Linked uh, uh, Hypophosphatemia, I picked this paper to just to show as an example. This is a burden of disease survey that involved over 230 adults with XLH, average age around 45, and 90 parents or caregivers with, uh, of XLH children. And they have actually showed a clear concordance of the presence of these symptoms uh, in adults and in children. And the conclusion of this uh, panel of experts that despite the common use of oral phosphate and active vitamin D established in the early 80s, children with XLH demonstrate a substantial disease burden, including persistence of pain, impaired physical functioning, uh, and that persists throughout the adult life as shown by the survey. There is also a systematic literature review looking specifically at the burden of disease associated with excellent type of phosphatemia in adults, which also uh, coincides in its findings with the previous specific study. So now we'll turn to the uh, therapeutic uh, management. First, we would like to address the current management strategies and treatment goals for adult XLH population. It is controversial whether uh, conventional therapy uh, continuation into adult life uh, is effective uh, because efficacy is not well studied. It is also a burdensome and potentially toxic. The goals of management in adults is to promote healing of osteomalacia and pseudofractures and also facilitate recovery from surgery that these patients will need uh, throughout their adult life, and also uh, reduce the suffering and pain. Treatment in adulthood may not prevent or uh, uh, promote uh, prevention of antisipathy. However, it may be associated with a lower risk of uh, dental problems. Over uh, only a minority of patients regularly do take their prescribed analgesics and anti inflammatory medications because many of them actually, they think it is not effective. 
This is an example of the adverse effects seen with conventional therapy. You can see uh, on the left-hand side, all the hypers here, hypercalcemia, hypercalciuria, uh, nephrolithiasis and nephrocalcinosis, and also hyperparathyroidism. Here's the, on the right side, an example of the proportion of nephrocalcinosis in a cohort of adults. Uh, is around more than a quarter of these patients they will have this problem. Uh, also, from a quality of life point of view, frequent dosing, the unpleasant taste of the medication, and the need for regular monitoring decreases the adherence to conventional therapy and leads to reduced therapeutic benefit. Here is the only, uh, the first in the class and the only uh, uh, authorized or registered uh, um, specific medication, which is uh, Puracimab. It's a fully human anti-FGF23 uh, immunoglobulin monoclonal antibody. Here is the, uh, the protein itself, and here's the uh, graphic representation of the Puracimab. It had gone through a, a quite a, a, a journey from being a murine, 100% mouse, to a fully human one. The value of being a fully human one uh, is actually it reduces the uh, immunogenicity, uh, in addition to being more specific and more uh, fully designed to undertake that role. I already less, uh, shown this uh, before, but I think here I'm adding the presence of the antibodies to the FGF23, and you can see that by antagonizing that, you can improve the vitamin D status, improve the phosphate absorption, improve the phosphate excretion in the kidneys, correct the serum phosphate, and improve mineralization and bone uh, disease. I will go, just go through examples of the outcome measures that have been shown with this particular uh, agent. Uh, this I only picked the, this study to uh, have information from it. And these are adults between 18 to 65, uh, and they have compared them with a the placebo around 66 to 68 in each limb. And they have uh, crossed over them later on after the week 24. The primary endpoint was to achieve an improvement in the phosphate. However, quality of life, particularly physical pain, stiffness, uh, were also secondary uh, endpoints. Here's the, an illustration. I will actually just concentrate on the placebo uh, against the, the uh, purus map. Here's the serum uh, phosphate concentration. The amber or the orange is the uh, map, and the gray is actually the placebo. And you can see a clear difference between the two. Here's the stiffness uh, index. The gray is the for the placebo, and for and the orange is for the prosumab, and you can see there's a significant uh, improvement uh, in the stiffness uh, index. Also, self-reported uh, pain uh, is uh, improved in uh, on the specific treatment in comparison with the placebo, although did not achieve a statistical significance in the first part, but this actually. Uh, 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 later on, it was very significant. Uh, the fracture healing, which is very important in adults, is also uh, clearly uh, different between the placebo and the active uh, treatment, both clearly numerically and also statistically. This is illustration for the fracture healing here. You can see on the baseline and the week 24, here is the, uh, the pseudo fracture in a 38 year old woman treated with prosumab. And here is the, uh, the pseudo fracture. And here is the healing uh, process, as you can see clearly, the very smooth and very fully healed. There are clear guidelines for the management, both international by the experts in the field from all over the world. And also, we have regional uh, guidelines, consensus statement. Uh, focusing on diagnosis and management of excellence uh, uh, in children and adolescents in the Gulf Cooperative Council, which also considers the issues uh, in, uh, in adult uh, patients. This is the, an illustration from the, our own paper. I had the pleasure of being uh, amongst the uh, Gulf group uh, uh, the author uh, writing group. 
and it illustrates how to start from the diagnosis all the way how to monitor the treatment and adjust it. The uh, regulatory approvals are available from both the US and from Europe. And these are the specific uh, indications here from the FDA, treatment for XLH in adult and pediatric patients six months or above. European indicated for treatment of X-linked hypophosphatemia in children and adolescents one to 17 years with radiographic evidence of bone disease and also in, in adults. Uh, this is the, uh, the preparation comes at 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams, and 30 milligrams per ml. And this is the dose recommendation for adults, uh, 18 years and above. The recommended dose is one milligram per kilogram given every four weeks. All doses should be rounded to the nearest 10 milligrams. And the maximum dose is 90 milligrams, i.e. three uh, of the green vials. Oral phosphate and conventional treatment with active vitamin D should be stopped one week before we start the active treatment. For an audience like tonight, I think they are very familiar with the roots of subcutaneous administration. It's exactly the same as insulin. So you can upper arm, abdomen, or buttocks, uh, avoiding the usual places and uh, raw skin, infected skin, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And rotation is recommended. The monitoring, once you start the treatment, you need the serum phosphate to be assessed on a monthly basis, measure two weeks post dose for the first three months, and then thereafter as appropriate. I personally feel uh, measuring it every three months is not actually a, a, a very high burden. Uh, the phosphate should be measured two weeks after any dose adjustment. And if the serum phosphorus is above the normal range, to a recommendation is to withhold the next dose and reassess the serum phosphorus level after four weeks. And the patients must have a serum phosphorus below normal range to be able to reinitiate the treatment. The contraindications are concomitant to use of conventional treatment when serum phosphorus is within or above the normal range and patients with severe renal impairment or end stage renal disease. There are special recommendations uh, for those involved in the management involving pregnancy, lactation, and in the elderly. The, the professional issues uh, we have been uh, increasingly interested in this part of the world in the uh, condition. Uh, the reason driving this is the fact that actually we are a region of the world where there's a lot of intermarriages. Uh, and we think that as genetic, genetic diseases do occur more often than other parts of the world. To try and see the professionals' uh, perception and practices concerning this condition, as Madiba and colleagues uh, studied the uh, knowledge and practices of pediatric endocrinologists in Arab uh, countries. Uh, and in this uh, very meeting, you can see one of our posters here on the e-posters uh, e on the awareness of adult and pediatric physicians of the burden presentation and management of X-linked hypophosphatemia, which were included both uh, adult and pediatric physicians. And our uh, re region was slightly wider than that of uh, asthma deep and colleagues, uh, whereby we uh, included uh, more countries from the Middle East and Africa. The conclusion from both, there is some awareness about the excellent uh, hypophosphatemic rickets. However, the depth of the knowledge is variable. Uh, our own uh, conclusion from our own uh, poster that actually we feel that the practical information uh, held by pediatric physicians is more solid, as more uh, in depth. Uh, than those of adults. And therefore, it's important that we uh, highlight this point uh, where patients move from the pediatric to the adult uh, physician practices. So I think this is going to be my last slide. I think the management of rare conditions in medicine in general represent a challenge and demands physicians extra effort, more collaborations, and more organization of time and uh, pra practice beyond the usual uh, practice restrictions imposed uh, uh, time, insurance, as we know currently, and any other administrative limitations. However, in the 
context of adult endocrine tracts in particular, XLH may be seen uh, from patients transferred from pediatric practice or in undiagnosed or lost adults, and also in adults who are coming with their own families, but they have not been picked before. Uh, naturally, understanding the essentials of pathophysiology, diagnosis, and management is essential to uh, build the database for information uh, on how to diagnose and treat these uh, conditions. Uh, concerning therapeutic management, patients uh, and professionals are increasingly getting dissatisfied with conventional treatment, as we have shown in both uh, 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 surveys. And uh, we hope that actually in the future, the specific treatment, uh, uh, which is licensed now, should be the standard of care. Uh, to close, I think advocacy, education, and research are three complementary components for optimal care and management of rare conditions, such as XLH uh, hypophosphatemia is a classical example for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Salem. And would you like to check the questions, if any? Yes, let me see here, chat. Uh, no, this is for Ali Zahrani, but still there. Uh, I don't see any questions, can you see? Or comments? No, then thank you, Dr. Salem, very much for uh for your session. Right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Bye.